People v. Jennifer Crumbly, case number 22279990, FH. Karen McDonald on behalf of the People. Thank you, Mark Keyes on behalf of the People. And good morning, Your Honor. I'm Shannon Smith on behalf of Jennifer Crumbly. Good morning, Your Honor. Sean Godwin on behalf of Jennifer Crumbly. Good morning. We did get a note from the jury this morning, just for your edification, that telling me that the media is describing who they are. Someone is a radiation or veterinary oncologist or radiation oncologist or something and has two children or whatever it is. I think that they are having a belief that I have more control over the media than I do. But anyway, I plan to do nothing about it. So I think they were letting me know. Okay. Thank you, Judge. Okay. Thank you. They don't use anyone's names or what city they live in. Okay. Who is the first witness? Edward Rogowski. Okay. And, Your Honor, we're not ready. You're not ready? No, no, no. We're ready. But before Mr. Rogowski comes in, there are exhibits that I have previously objected to. Okay. Who is he? Who is he? Computer Crimes, Oakland Sheriff's Office. Okay. It's my understanding or belief that he's going to testify to some of the messages that were sent from the shooter to his friend, who we're not going to name, B. And I previously filed a motion and asked that they were excluded. I understand the court's ruling and that they're included. Yeah, that was a year and a half ago, right? Yep. But since that time, I have received further documents that show information that is critical to the defense from the psychiatrist who evaluated the shooter. And it appears that we have an issue that the shooter will not waive privilege. Okay. Let me ask you something. When we left yesterday, I asked whether there was any issues. I really do not like to use a juror's time talking about these things. I'm aware of this issue. I'm frankly irritated because I feel like the court has been very timely in responding to the attorneys. And I don't – the scheduling order had a motion cut off date in December, and I don't appreciate the deferring of trial homework assignments for the court. That being said, I'm aware of this issue. That's why I asked about it last night. I do plan to make a ruling on that. We've done some of our own research. I've gotten motions from those two psychologists. But I'm not going back a year and a half and changing my ruling that could have been appealed at that time. I know that things have happened since then, but those things are subject to appeal. The motion to quash the denial was appealed. All kinds of things were appealed. This case went to the Supreme Court for a year. I'm pretty sure it was coming back, which it did. And I know that I was staying, so you couldn't file anything then. But these rulings were made a year and a half ago, and there's reliance on those. And the Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court have not told me that that was error, that I shouldn't do that, or anything like that. And I think there was opportunity to appeal. Your Honor, there was opportunity. We did appeal. We appealed to the Michigan Supreme Court. The court is absolutely right. The problem is, even after the motion cut off, my office received records from jail psychiatrists that have important information. Okay, let me tell you this. We're not arguing that motion right now. I understand. So I'm just placing my objection on the record because part of what I've asked for is that the evidence I am not going to be able to contradict that's going to come in through this witness is leaving me absolutely hamstrung. If the court rules that these psychiatrists cannot testify and the shooter is not going to testify, I'm left with this evidence coming in when I now know things I didn't know at the time, and I just learned these things, and we just got the objections to these people testifying, and from Sato this week about Ethan testifying. That is not true. That is not true. The shooter's attorney, Ms. Lofton, 
asserted that privilege at the time that I provided the records. The records were provided under a protective order. The records um, are subject to an absolute privilege that we have been researching for the past week. Uh, there, uh, there's an absolute privilege, as far as I can tell. If you, you can find me a case that says there isn't one, I would be happy to read that. We have spent a lot of time on our, the homework assignment we were given while the, while the trial uh, is in full swing. I have found nothing that says those records aren't privileged. The, the privilege was asserted by Ms. Lofton at the time that you requested the records. I know it was asserted again by Sato, their new attorney, but it was asserted back in November. I could give you that date if you want. At the time that I provided, I, I provided those records under protective order uh, because they could protect, the prosecution had the records and because they were, could potentially lead uh, to exculpatory evidence on uh, behalf of your client. Um, I didn't plan on ruling about, about this today, um, but I, I guess I would direct you to the Stainaway case that, that talks about review of records, but that's of a victim witness's records, and, there had, and in that instance, there was an in-camera review, but there has to be a, a threshold showing um, that, they, that there would be relevance. I don't have that either. So, uh, I, you know, I, I'm working as hard as you guys are right now, so at the moment, I'm not going to go back and change my ruling from a, a year and a half ago. I think everybody has had ample time when something is filed, I respond to it in a very timely way, despite the fact that I have one or two other cases. And I, I'm not changing my ruling from a year and a half ago. You, you could have appealed it to the Court of Appeals, the Michigan Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court, you know, whoever. So, Your Honor, I'm not asking the court to change its ruling from a year and a half ago. I'm asking the court to make a new ruling based on new information that I literally got this week. I literally got this week that Ethan Crumbly will not testify pleading the fifth and that... I'm sorry, there's, I have to interject. We brought this to the court's attention November of 2022. We've discussed this. Are you talking about the 803 statement? All of it. Okay. All of it. And, the, and I, don't, I don't mean to interrupt the court, but just to supplement what the court indicated, counsel for, for the shooter filed an objection in November of 22 and then filed another objection regarding privilege in October of 23. And at the, one of the very first hearings in this case, we talked about how it would be near impossible for this attorney to call somebody with a Fifth Amendment privilege. We have Fifth Amendment privilege. We have the privilege in the mental health code. And there's also the issues of hearsay, Judge, and there's nothing inconsistent in any of this. And counsel had all this information. Well, and Your Honor, I subpoenaed those three doctors. Those three doctors coordinated with my office to find time to come in and testify. Those... Okay, I and, How did they testify? and then, then they had attorneys file motions this week while we've been in trial, and I filed a motion while we were in trial asking for alternative relief. I'm not asking the court to change its prior ruling. Okay, I'm so asking the there, court. No, I have not, I have found no legal basis for the alternative relief, and I have tried mightily. Well, the the, the alternative the relief is absolute. I'm, and if, if I you, agree with you. I'm not talking about the privilege, but I'm saying when the privilege is absolute. It's the, if the privilege holder will not waive it, the court rule says, and it doesn't have to be a complainant, it doesn't have to be a victim, it says if the privilege holder will not waive it, their testimony cannot come in. And what this court is going to allow to come in through the this privilege, next... The privilege holder is not testifying. I understand that, but the problem is the evidence coming in are statements this privilege holder made, and I have no way to cross-examine to show the inconsistencies and the important information. I received no offer of proof about that. I don't know if there's inconsistencies or anything. There's, there's not. This argument isn't based on a false premise. And this okay. is something we've been saying for months. I know that. There's, there's been no supplemental filing saying that uh, uh, <coughs> there should be an in-camera review for some reason. This person is not testifying. The shooter is is not testifying. He's So how is he uh, someone who's providing testimony, he's not. Those are statements that were provided under 803. I was not pre uh, prepared to have this discussion today, uh, this morning. That's why I said last night, anything. Uh, the the uh, jury is waiting. Um, I would say that uh, I also asked that in the Zoom, uh, Zoom we had last week. Um, I, I, think it's, I think it's disingenuous um, for the defense to say that they're surprised that the shooter um, would be uh, taking the fifth. 
you're you're a very smart, very experienced attorney, and I you know all this stuff is sitting on my desk. There's a case of Jack Maloney, right? You you can't put someone on the stand knowing that they're going to take the fifth. And aside from uh, shooter, what's your favorite color? What question could you ask him that would not uh, implicate his Fifth Amendment rights? Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. I this has to be a clear record. No, I it's not going to be a clear well, record now because the jury is sitting there. This I is not asked. I asked to have the shooter brought in after the issue of privilege was wait was brought up by the shooter's attorneys and by the attorneys for the doctors. I was not planning to call the shooter until this privilege issue came up this week. No, the privilege issue came up in November. On the on the actual record, yes. not on the testimony. The testimony is all impeachment. What testimony? The testimony that I anticipate these doctors will give is straight impeachment of things the shooter Judge, said. I need to correct the record. It is not. And Dr. Anneker informed me that she had a conversation with defense counsel last week when counsel tried to subpoena her, and Dr. Anneker explained that to counsel that it is not inconsistent. She, she actually said true. that to counsel. I don't know, that's if, I don't know if it's inconsistent or not. I have not read the records. I have, I have not read these records, but uh, the privilege was asserted at a minimum last November uh, by the shooter's uh, lawyer, and try as I might, I cannot find an um, exception to that privilege. That privilege is absolute except in limited purposes. The privilege belongs to the shooter, and it's been asserted several times. Uh, I have personally, and my staff attorney, been looking for something that would s support your position. The closest I've gotten is Stanaway, and that is a victim witness, and there was a threshold offer of proof um, by the defense uh, regarding what should be searched for in an in-camera review. I am obviously not in a position to do an in-camera review of those records right now, nor, nor have I been provided with um, some, some glaring thing that the shooter said. I, I lied when I said, when I wrote X in my journal, whatever it is. So. Your Honor, I, I am going to put together an offer of proof of exactly what these doctors would testify to. I understand the court has not ruled yet about these doctors, aside from the fact that the I'm privilege is absolute. I, I understand that. I cannot file that because I of the protective order. No, you can't file it. So I'm going to put it together. I'm mm -hmm. going to get it to everyone. And, and obviously, we'll go from there. But I also want to state the privilege. Obviously, we all know the Fifth Amendment. This shooter has pled guilty. He's been sentenced. It's our position that at this point, he does not have the same Fifth Amendment rights as, for example, James Crumbly. It's just not the law. Trial is not okay, su support it because. Every lawyer in this room knows that that sentence is going to be appealed until well after I retire. Well, and the other thing is the, the evidence I intend to put in front of this jury, quite frankly, is evidence that the entire world knows about because it came out at the Miller hearing. That's okay. not so, the test okay. for the law. You're, you're the telling evidence. me why it's relevant and why it would be fair to you to admit it. I understand why you want it. I understand why you want it. I haven't seen it. I understand why you want it. But I have to follow the rules. Believe me, I have been researching this issue. Well, and, and, I'm, and I'm sorry, that's why I'm pointing to the rule about when the privilege holder won't waive it and when, when the privilege holder won't testify and can't testify, I'm going to the third option, which is that that evidence just can't be used. If I okay, have I'm no sorry, this is non-testimonial evidence that's being admitted today. Not testimony. Non-testimonial evidence. I'm not finished. Testimony. Not testimonial evidence. And that's the basis of this court's ruling. There's no Crawford issue. There's no confrontation issue. It's non-testimonial. If it were, we'd have an issue. We don't. And I believe the Crawford issue is preserved. And this is testimonial because this is information that is tantamount to testimony in this case. Um, the, the rules of evidence, um, 8033 specifically, um, I'm sorry, 8031, talk about present sense impression. I, I did a thorough evaluation of uh, some of those statements at, at that time, which was, what, a year and a half ago? What, what month was it? Maybe I've been blocking it out. Um, and um, I evaluated all of those statements, and I made a ruling um, based on a, hear, a hearsay exception where the declarant of, uh, is, whether the declarant is available or not is immaterial. So whether he testifies or not is, is immaterial. Um, 
which says to me it's separate. Those statements are separate from any testimony of the person who made those uh, present sense impression statements, whether they testify or not. That, that's what 803 says. The, 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 the theory behind it is that it's um, uh, done in a contemporaneous way. So I made those rulings a year and a half ago, and I, you know, I invited anyone to appeal anything that you wanted to appeal. There was a motion to quash. There, there was a lot of things appealed, and that could have been appealed as well. So it, it's not that people haven't, that either side hasn't had the opportunity. So I will read any case you provide. I have been researching whether or not those records could be um, admitted, and I have found nothing that would, that would direct me to, it, to allow doctors to testify about privileged records uh, that have not been waived by the person who holds the privilege, and that person is the shooter. And that, that privilege has been asserted repeatedly by Ms. Lofton and by Sato. I will read any case you give me, and I've been frankly trying to help you. I, I, can't, I, I can't find a case that, that allows for that. So, Your Honor, the only cases I can find, and I think it's because this is a unique issue, and there has probably never been a case like this, with parents who are also charged with murder-type crimes, and the shooter is charged with a murder crime that he pled to. So this is a very unique situation. I, Unfortunately, it's a case of first impression. I know the court knows this. And so when I look at the cases, I agree with the court that most of the cases deal with a complaining witness or an alleged victim and their rights. But the court rule says privilege holder. It does not limit it to complaint. <coughs> and I agree with this court. There's not case law. And that's why I'm asking this court to make, to make a decision to not allow these statements pursuant to the court rule um, because I have no way to defend them. But I, if the court's ruled, the court's ruled. Okay, well, I didn't plan on ruling that on that this morning. I mean, I'll yeah. still, I will it's still file an offer of proof, and I will still file a list of what the evidence would have shown, and I understand the court will make a decision about the doctors testifying. That's the best I can do. Okay, well, I'm doing the best I can do. So I know you are. And anything else? Just really quickly, what the court rule says is that if the privilege is absolute and the privilege holder refuses to waive the privilege to permit disclosure, the trial court shall suppress or strike the privilege holder's testimony. Testimony. I'm not done. Testimony, and this is non-testimonial evidence, what we just said. If the, there's nothing more. This isn't a case of first impression. This is the law. It's been the law for a very long time. Well, okay. the problem well, is okay, I that's... want the testimony, and I'm being told I can't okay, wait, get wait, the wait, testimony. Wait, wait. That, that is directed at a person who puts... Uh, like someone who is in a car accident and they're suing an insurance company and they're putting an issue, they say that I've been depressed, I can't leave my house since this accident, whatever it is. If they testify to that and then they object to having their mental health records admitted, it, it's problematic because that person, the witness, put their mental health issue in that case at issue. They put their mental health at issue. And so you can't use your shield as a sword. That's what that is about. Correct. So if you uh, um, are a witness who's alleging damage to your mental health, yet you will not waive the privilege with regard to your psychological records uh, from mental health treaters, then that testimony is stricken. There's a reason for that. You can't use your shield as a sword. That is the reason for that. That, that is wholly separate from this issue. Uh, with regard to uh, asking the shooter to, to testify, um, it's not that I'm saying you can't uh, call him as a witness, but two of his attorneys have said in no uncertain terms that he's taking the fifth. Both sides, not just the prosecu prosecutor, again, I think that's Dr. Loney, I don't know, all, all of this stuff is sitting in my desk. Um, you are not allowed to put someone on, on the stand knowing that they're going to take the fifth. And I, I cannot think of a single question beyond what is your name that would not implicate his Fifth Amendment rights. So, I, you know, I don't know what you could even ask him that he would answer or that his lawyers would let him answer. So it's not, I, I am going to prohibit you from putting any witness on the stand who takes the Fifth in front of the jury. That is strictly prohibited. So are there other questions that you could ask him? I, I can't even imagine that would not implicate his Fifth Amendment rights. That's the problem. 
I understand your problem. I understand the difficulties. I do. And if you knew how much time I have spent and my staff attorney have spent on this, it, it's mind-boggling. But at the moment, I have nothing that lets me say, uh, I, have, I have to rule in a way that is the most fair for the defendant, but goes against the law as I know it. I, I don't have something that lets me do that. If, you, if someone has something that lets me do that, I would be happy to hear about it. Okay, I'm going to end your hand. Okay. Thank you, Judge. Good morning, you may be seated. Thank you for being kind. Good morning, Robert. Who's the next witness? Edward Ruffy. Could you raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm the testimony about to give as a true self? Yes, ma'am. Right. Um, could you take your seat there? Can you just go ahead and have a seat? Edward Wagrowski, E D W A R D, last name W A G R O W S K I. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Sir, how are you employed? I am employed with the U.S. Secret Service. And how long have you been with the Secret Service? Uh, just a couple weeks. Now, prior to this current job, where did you work? The Open County Sheriff's Office. How long were you with the Sheriff's Office? 28 years. Okay, in those 28 years, where did you work? Um, I started out in dispatch and went to corrections after that, the road patrol, and then eventually to computer crimes. Okay. And tell me, when you say computer crimes, what does that mean? Do anything that has to do with the computer, uh, cell phones, um, forensic examinations of computers, uh, DVR equipment, call detail records. Okay. How, and how long were you in computer crimes? Ten years. In your time in computer crimes, did you receive specialized training with forensic analysis of electronic devices? Yes, sir. May I approach the witness? Sure. This is Exhibit 422. Sir, just confirm for us that that's your CV. Oh, no, I'm sorry. No objection is admission. Yes. And also no objection right. to disqualifications CV. So you would, you would stipulate his qualifications. You would stipulate he's an expert in Forensic examination of computer. Yes, yes, right. Cellular cell phone forensics, historical cell site analysis. Yes, the defense stipulates to, to both of those, the CV and the qual that he's qualified as an expert. Historic CV. Cell site analysis and cell phone forensics. Historic cell site and cell phone. Okay. You may consider uh, him as an expert in the area of historic cell site analysis. Analysis and cell phone analysis. Is that right? yeah. okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Well, sir, now we don't have to go through the entire CV, but let's just talk a little bit about your training as it pertains to cell phone downloads and forensic analysis. Okay. Okay. So, is it fair to say that this field is evolving? Always. So, you said you spent ten years there. Yes, sir. What sort of things did you do in computer crimes ten years ago? <clears throat> well, things were a lot different. It was it was actually a lot easier to do forensics back then, um, because with updates of how the phones operate, how Apple or whoever Android operating system, they just make it more difficult. And now we have to figure, out, figure that out. What do you mean more difficult? With encryption, file-based encryption on a hard drive, you know, so data that you hold personal can't just be taken off the phone and given out to whoever. So talk to me about what a detective in computer crimes, or first of all, 
What, your current role in Secret <laughs> Service, what exactly do you do there? I'm a network intrusion um, forensic analyst. Okay. So would that be the same sort of duties you had in computer crime? Yeah, the same thing that I did, uh, cell phone analysis, computers, um, just with more network intrusion, uh, like someone hacks into a bank or something like that. Okay. So walk me through, what is, what is a typical day for a expert in the area of cell phone forensics? Um, typical day is you come into work, you just see what work needs to be done. Um, really the case, depending on the case, how important it might be to get that to uh, either examine those phones or contact the detective that brought that stuff in to see exactly what they're looking for on those devices. So you'd be somebody to receive the cell phone, seize an investigation, and then conduct an investigation into that device? Correct. Okay, so what does that entail? Uh, that entails, uh, depending on, on the device, uh, we have tools that are able to um, obtain the data from the phones. And then we then take that data because it, it could be voluminous, thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of pages, and then put it into uh, an, easeable, an easy readable format um, called uh, Celebrate is the company. They make a forensic analyzer uh, reader, which makes it easy to look at. So that reader, that's one of the tools, forensic tools you mentioned? That, that's not the tool that we use. That's what we give out to investigators. Um, the tool that we use is a little bit more than, than that reader tool, uh, the, what the functionality that it gives us. Um, but the reader uh, tool makes it easier for uh, the average investigator to look at. Okay, so let's help me understand this. So a phone is taken as part of that, as part of the evidence, a search warrant is obtained for that phone, and then you're given the phone itself. Is that right? Correct. Okay, so tell the jury, please, what do you do with the phone? Walk us through that step by step. Um, depending on the phone, again, if it's if it's passcode protected, if it's not passcode protected, there's different steps that we have to do. Um, we hook it up to the tool. Uh, in this case, it would have been uh, Celebrate again as a company, and the tool is their Celebrate Premium platform, and that's able to obtain what's called a full file system, which is which is everything on the phone, every, everything you can get off of it, as long as there's not encryption on it. What is encryption? Encryption is um, how do I describe it? I don't make it easy. It just jumbles up the the information. It makes the word the look like absolutely nothing that you can understand. Okay, so. As an investigator in the area of, of uh, digital information, you don't confine yourself just to a cell phone. Would that be right? Oh, that's correct. Okay. So what other sources of information would you draw upon as an investigator? Uh, someone's social media accounts, uh, Facebook Messenger, uh, Snapchat, all that stuff, anything you would download to your phone. And um, obviously the phones are cell phones, so you'd want to get the cell phone records from the carrier. Okay. <clears throat> now, talk to us about how you obtain the information from other sources other than just the device itself? Uh, via search warrant. Okay. And before a search warrant is sent, do you send something else? Yeah, there's something called a preservation letter. Uh, what that does is it, in order for us to, if, to get a search warrant, you have to have probable cause, a reason, a judge to believe that the information you're looking for is going to be there. So while we're trying to gather that probable cause, we tell AT&T, don't destroy these records under any circumstances for 90 days until you hear back from us. Okay. Now, as an investigator, why is it important to not confine yourself to just the device itself? When I say device, I'm talking about cell phone. So why would you not confine yourself just to that cell phone? Because sometimes uh, the stuff isn't always stored on the phone. It could be stored on a server, and the, the computer system, like, the, again, Facebook, for example, or Instagram, that information isn't always stored directly on your device. It's stored on a server that your phone just accesses. Okay. So... Is it your goal then as an investigator in computer forensics to gather as much information as possible? Always. And then when you gather the information, what do you do with it? Start talking to the investi the, the OIC, as it's called, the officer in charge of the case. What are you guys looking for? What do you need? How can we help you, basically? Okay. Now, is every cell phone the same in how they store and transmit data? No, sir. Okay. Tell me the differences. Uh, the difference is, like, to, to put it plainly, uh, the more advanced the phone, uh, Apple, for example, or uh, a higher-end Android device like a Samsung, um, could have file-based encryption, where a lower-end phone doesn't necessarily have that file-based encryption. Do you know why that is? It's just whatever the manufacturer wants to put on the phone. To, to keep the cost down, to not have as many developers and all that stuff, you just keep the cost down by not having that as part of your platform. So if the user of a phone is, is spending more money for the device, from a certain manufacturer, they can expect to have a higher level of encryption. Would that be right? Yeah, and features, yes. And features, okay. yes. So then, is it possible to recover deleted content from a phone? Potentially. And why is it, why is it potential? Potentially because, again, you go back to that file-based encryption that I've said over and over. Is if it's, once you delete something on your phone, it's not necessarily always deleted on the phone, it's just encrypted. 
you telling it to delete it just erases the path to get to that encrypted data. And so we, we can't find it. So it has nothing to do with the forensic tools at your disposal. It's regarding the manufacturer of the device itself. That's correct. Okay. Now, you talked about how some information can be stored on a server as opposed to a device. If something is deleted from a phone by the user, are you still able to recover it from the server? Potentially, yes. Okay. And tell me in what circumstances. Um, but for this situation in particular, I did some research. Um, Facebook Messenger, for example, two people are having a conversation. I delete it on my phone. All I do is I tell my phone I don't want to see it anymore. Where Facebook, as the other person wants to see that conversation, won't delete it so that person can still read the conversation on their end of the phone. Okay, so let's say you and I have a Facebook Messenger chat with each other, and I delete that from my phone. If the investigator wanted to, to recover that information, it wouldn't be on my phone. Is that correct? Possibly, yes. Correct. Okay. But then you could send a search warrant to Facebook to the server and obtain that information. Correct. Okay. Now, what if you and I both deleted it from our phones? What would happen then? According to what I looked up and, and looked at Facebook's uh, website, that it won't be available. Okay. So then it's deleted completely if both, both users of the chat delete it. Correct. Okay. Now, what about deleted text messages on the device itself? Tell me how that works. Yeah, that, it, it just comes back to um, possibly be able to delete or retrieve deleted text messages on uh, how they're stored in the phone, if the database is still available, or um, if the, the app's totally deleted from the phone, um, and all that data is stored in the phone, and I tell it to delete that app, and it could possibly be totally gone. So if you were to review, let's say, um, screenshots from one person's phone, and then a forensic analysis of somebody else's phone, if the screenshots didn't match up with the forensic analysis, what would that tell you? That was possibly deleted. Okay. Now, during the course of your, this investigation, People versus Jennifer Crumley, did you uncover evidence of deleted content from Jennifer Crumley's phone? That's correct, yes. Okay, and we're going to get into that later. Um, but before we do, could you tell us just in general terms, what, is, what does a cell phone do that maybe a layperson wouldn't know? Uh, it, it's, it's continually working in the background, talking to a cell tower, one, so your carrier knows where you're at, so it can give you the phone that some, the phone call that someone's trying to get a hold of you or the text message, or it uh, is updating your email account without you telling it to do it because the application is just constantly looking for the signal, so you open it and there's most updated information. So that's when the phone's powered on, right? Correct. Okay, so when the phone's powered on, it's, it's constantly doing things, would that be right? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, what about when the phone's powered off? It's doing nothing. It's just off. Okay, so it can't update? Correct. Okay, so when a phone's powered on, is it possible to obtain the location of that device? Yes. How so? Um, because uh, there's uh, a feature, whether you have an Apple product or an Android product, uh, each one of them has what they call location services, and it's actually to benefit the user of the phone, so um, because that information is sold to McDonald's or whatever, and next, you know, you're near McDonald's and your device says, hey, I'm near McDonald's, oh, cool, I'll send you an ad for McDonald's or a coupon for McDonald's. So that's... Okay. Yeah. So you have, as an investigator, a fair amount of reliability in that because of the, the uh, capability for uh, somebody's phone to sell the device, basically, to an advertiser. Correct, yes. Okay. And are you able to obtain someone's location from their phone based upon other data as well? That's correct, yes. And how so? Uh, through the, the, the carrier themselves, AT&T or T-Mobile, whoever you may have. Again, you're constantly, uh, your cell phone's constantly talking to a cell tower. And they try to triangulate your position on where you are based on the signal back and forth from each tower. Okay. Now, on an Android phone, for example, it autom automatically comes with a, a Gmail account. Is that right? The, no, you have to make a Gmail account. Okay, you make a Gmail account. Yes. Okay. So if someone were to have a Gmail account, would that also help an investigator determine a location of that device? Absolutely, yes. Why is that? Because, again, those, that information at location services is stored within that particular Gmail account that someone might have. So if we would... If we would search warrant Google for your particular email, the Gmail, they would have, if that's turned on, the location services would be given to us. Okay. So I want to talk about the evidence in this particular case. Um, there were a total of seven phones recovered, and, and I'm going to go step by step with you. So I'm going to review with you, I'll show you a slide here, of some of the um, sources of available information. So you see that is a school shooter, his initials. Yes, um, now, is it true that you reviewed a T-Mobile phone, last four digits, the phone number 1551? That's a correct. Facebook account? That's correct. 
and an Instagram account. Correct. And you were able to determine, and we heard testimony yesterday, that both James and Jennifer Crumley followed that particular account. That's correct, they did. Okay. So you were able to review not only the shooter's phone, but also social media, Facebook, and Instagram for that individual. Correct. Okay. Now, regarding Jennifer Crumley's electronic information, you reviewed information from three phones. Correct. Okay, so we have one listed as an original phone. Do you, are you aware that her original phone was seized on November the 30th in the evening? Yes, sir. Okay. And then you're aware that she purchased what we refer to as a burner phone or a track phone that night? Correct. Okay. And then that's that's the number, the 947 phone, phone number? Correct, that's right. Okay. Yep. And you're also aware that um, prior, subsequent to turning over her original phone and prior to arrest, she obtained another phone? Correct. And that was with her same original phone number? Correct. Okay, so you reviewed that device as well? Exactly, yes, sir. Okay. So just so we're clear, when I say you review the device, we're talking about forensically analyzing the data on that cell phone? Correct, that was, yeah, exactly. Okay. You were also able to obtain information from Facebook, from two different Facebook accounts? Correct. Okay. And information from a search warrant served on Google regarding her Gmail account? Correct. Okay. And that Gmail account and that Yahoo account, that in, does that include location data? The Gmail account? Yes, I, uh, for, yes it does. Gmail account did? Yes. Okay. Now, regarding James Crumley, again, three cell phones. Is that right? Correct. Okay. His Instagram account? Correct. His Yahoo account? Correct. His Gmail account? Correct. An email through Charter Communications? Correct, yes. And then a search warrant was served on DoorDash to obtain his uh, DoorDash driving uh, location history. Correct. Okay. Now, your goal with obtaining all of this information as an investigator into uh, digital evidence is to obtain the who, the what, the where, the why, and turn that information over to the officer in charge and ultimately the prosecutors in the court. Would that be right? Correct. Everything we can get. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to show you People's Exhibit 76. I don't believe we have an objection to any of the evidence coming in through Officer or um, Investigator Wilgraf. Do we? No, we have several objections. Um, okay. And I believe many of them are based on the record already, but let me open up 76. This is, this is 76? Okay. <coughs> we have no objection to 76. Okay, 76. And I'm sorry, I'm, with this witness, we're going to have to go exhibit by exhibit. That's all right. Um, 76 is in the way. Okay, so what are we looking at? Uh, that is what it would look like, uh, um, a printout from the Celebrate Reader or Celebrate Physical Analyzer program of someone's um, uh, information that was obtained from their phone. And it's Jennifer Crumbly's uh, followed her son's Instagram account. Okay, so just to give us an idea of what we're looking at here, um, this is a snippet from a PDF export from that forensic tool they use. Correct, yes. Okay, so tell me how that digital information comes to you and how it ends up looking like this? Uh, the the reports, the information that we have, you can put it in any number of formats. You can put it in a PDF like this is, in a Word document or Excel spreadsheet. And you just tell, <coughs> tell the software what you want it to show you and export the software and this is what it produces. Okay. So moving on to Exhibit 77, this is a portion of James and Jennifer's Facebook messages. And Judge, I did want to place on the record that we do have an additional exhibit of 423 that will be introduced to this officer, too. That's the entire Facebook message thread between James and Jennifer Crumbly. Council placed an objection on the record yesterday regarding that, so we're introducing the entire 2,000-page thread. And, Your Honor, I, I, until I look at that 2,000-page thread, I object to it. My objection, I need to look through it. I might not object to it. Okay. My objection yesterday was about... The exhibits the prosecution was showing, those individual exhibits, they deleted parts of those. Hold on, hold on. No. Nobody deleted anything. Okay. This is well, demonstrative. The exhibits are the same, okay. and okay. we're giving the whole thing. Okay. Okay. And you, you okay. Can, you can, they're admitting an exhibit and showing the jury portions of it. They're permitted to do that. Right. right. So, but I, I'm just saying my question yesterday about the parts missing did not mean I'm asking for all thousands and thousands of texts to be 
introduced. Okay. So I'm going to take a look at them and see if we do have an objection, and we may not. Okay. The other... You've had uh, them for a while. What's that? You've had them for a while. Yeah. I, okay. I, I, uh, January of 22. I, I guess, I guess, the, I guess the difficulty is that the, the, the prosecution does uh, not want the jury to get the impression that they are sometimes some, in some way hiding something or not presenting something to them. So they're presenting the portions uh, of that exhibit that they think are relevant um, for purposes of this witness's testimony. In the event that you want the entire, entire exhibit in, the prosecution is saying we don't object to that. Right. So, so it's up to you. You can let us know. Right. And I, I believe the only problem is this court's made other rulings where things are discussed in those texts that are not are not a part of this. Okay. So when I reviewed their exhibits, I reviewed their exhibits as a whole. They're allowed to show different pieces of the exhibits, right. but that didn't mean I was suggesting we just admit the whole thing because okay. you've made other rulings about, okay? Right. Okay, okay. They, they, and, they, do, they don't want the jury to think that they're not willing to provide the boxes and boxes of evidence I'm sure that there are in both of these cases. But um, I'll, I'll leave it to you. They, they want to ask this witness questions about specific right. portions of those 2,000 pages. They don't want to show the, the jury 2,000 pages and then ask questions about it. So. I, I completely understand okay. that. I get right. that. The other thing I would ask the court is until the exhibit is admitted, I would ask that the exhibits are not being published to the jury. Yeah. Yes. That's, fine. Yeah, Correct. that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Well, Correct. Agreed. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, I'm sorry, we're on exhibit 78. 78. Okay, and I, okay. Just, let me just find my list really quick. Okay, so 75 submitted. In 78, we have no objection to. Okay, yeah. Tell us what the 76 was admitted as well. Yeah, just try to put the, uh, tell us what the exhibit is prior to, so that she knows which one. I, I have that 76 was admitted, 78 was admitted. The prosecution indicated they are skipping what was proposed exhibit 77. Correct. Okay. So, so Although we have no objection to 77. Okay, so you don't object to 76 or 78, so they're admitted. Okay. All right, go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Do you remember my question? <laughs> no, sir. I don't either. I don't either. Okay. All right. So this is exhibit 78. It's been admitted. This is from the James and Jennifer Facebook message thread. Okay, so before we get into the content, you talked for... Um, a, little, a little bit before about deleted content, specifically a Facebook Messenger thread between two people. Correct. Okay. Now, in the course of your investigation, you came to learn that Jennifer Kremley had a Facebook account. That's correct. And that uh, James Kremley also had one. That's correct. Okay. Uh, <coughs> did you uncover this particular chat thread on Jennifer Kremley's phone? No. Okay. How did you obtain it? Through a search warrant of, uh, to James Kremley's account. Okay, so if there is an actual chat history, in this case a 2,000 page chat history between two people, but it's not found on a device, but it's found on the server, what does that indicate to you? That one person deleted it. Okay. And in fact, Jennifer Crumbly had the Facebook Messenger um, app on her phone. That's correct, she did. Just this was deleted. The chat thread, correct. All right. Now 78 is a few slides, so we'll go through it together. Okay, we have the date and time up there. We're going to start with March the 9th of 2021. We're going to backtrack a day to give it context, and then we're going to go through late winter, early spring of 2021. Okay. So before we get into this, is it fair to say that as an investigator who analyzes all this electronic and digital information, you're able to provide a digital footprint for the individuals you're investigating? That's correct. Okay, and that's, that's the goal of your investigation, generally speaking? Yes, sir. All right. Blue is who? That is Jennifer. That's Jennifer, okay. So she wrote, leaving at 4 today, what time you done? And that was March 9th at 2.55 p.m. Correct. Okay, now it says UTC minus 5. What does that mean? The UTC is, uh, that people might know as GMT. It's where all time starts in Greenwich, and then it goes plus or minus, depending on which way you go from that line. Um, at that time of the year in March, we were minus 5 hours from start the start of time. So it's, if you add five hours, it would give you what the UTC actual time is on the Earth. So when you see UTC minus a number, that indicates to us that that's real time. That's correct. It, it's already been factored in. The software did that. Perfect. Okay. So March the 9th, you able to get an idea what James and Jennifer were, were doing and talking about this conversation? Yes, sir. Okay. So 
She wrote Leaving at Four today. What time you done? James wrote five. He's in green. Correct. And we know that because that's his Facebook ID as well as his name that, that came with the sub right reader. Correct. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and she wrote, okay, see you at 530. Correct. Sir, um, in all the information that you recovered, is it fair to say that James and Jennifer Crumbly communicated quite a bit through Facebook Messenger? Yes, sir. They did. And so the Facebook Messenger thread is substantially um, more so in volume and data than a, any text message thread you found between the two of them. That's correct. Okay. All right. Um, 346, March 9th, Jennifer wrote, bring me socks or in a drink, LOL. Um, what did James write? A drink, nah. Okay, Jennifer got myself a drink at, at 4.31 p.m. And James's response? Uh, okay, uh, you grabbed smokes too? Almost out, I think. Okay. And she writes, yes. Did you check the front porch? And what did James write? Not a, nothing on the porch. What were you expecting? Um, and she wrote their new blankets. Now, are you able to determine um, where they go later that day? Yes, sir. Okay, so... Need hoodie, um, N O L socks. I believe that was supposed to be wool. He wrote hoodie check. Um, what are no socks on my way? Okay, now this is exhibit 79. Actually, I'm going to approach. Unless there's an objection to the photograph found on her phone. I have no objection, but again, I would ask. No, that's, that's fine. That's fine. Before yeah. they. Yeah, I agree with you. Thank I you. Agree. I agree with you. Okay. But no objection to 79. Thank okay. you. Okay. There are two exhibits in one side, so I'm going to okay. This is 79, and underneath it is 80. Have you seen those items before? Yes, sir. And how have you seen them? Uh, there were pictures on uh, Jennifer's phone. Okay. So I'm going to move to um, admit 79, I believe, stipulation, as well as 80. I'm sorry. Can I have a moment, please? Sure. I have no objection to... Uh, 79 or 80. That's yes. correct. 79 is submitted Now, as an investigator, are you able to tell when you look at a photograph that's saved on a phone where the, pho the photograph was taken and when it was taken? Potentially, yes, sir. Potentially. Okay. And what circumstances? Uh, if the camera is set to record that you wanted to tell you the date and time that it was taken and the GPS location of where you're at on the earth. Okay. So 79 and 80 on the screen. 79 is the picture itself, and then in the text box on the right, that's the metadata? Correct. What's metadata? Uh, metadata is, we call it, it's the data within the data. The main data here is the picture of the horse. The metadata inside that data is all the stuff, you, the camera make, the camera model, that's captured that you just don't usually ever know what happens. You know, I think before we get into your investigation into the phones itself, I want us to back up a little bit and, and talk about your involvement, how you got involved in this case. Um, so November 30, 2021, you were a detective in computer crimes. Yes, sir. Okay. And do you remember that day? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, were you working? Yes, sir. Okay. Where were you at? At 12.51 p.m. on November the 30th. At 12.51 p.m., I was sitting in my office, I believe, um, at the Oak County Sheriff's Office. Okay. Did you learn of the school shooting in Oxford? Yes, sir. Tell me how you learned that and what you did next. Um, our captain came in, and well, prior to that, our sergeant, who was off that day, had said uh, that there was a shooter at the high school. And we thought in the office, like it was just somebody near the area that fired a long gun or something like that, you know, from a house and, you know, the cops, are, the police are going to show up and do their job. Um, and then probably a few minutes after that, our captain came in and said that there was a shooting at Oxford High School and the phrase used was all hands on deck. Okay. So what did you do? Uh, being uh, what is referred to in the business as a computer nerd. Um, you just grab your stuff, you know, your computer, your laptop, you know, your laptop, 
what you think you might need, what we had no idea what we were getting into. Um, and I knew Oxford was a long ways away from the Pontiac area. Um, I figured by the time I got there, it was going to be long over, and me and my partners were just going to do what we do. Okay, so do you have a, did you get in a, a squad car? Did you get in an unmarked car? No, I have an unmarked, uh, at the time I had an unmarked uh, white minivan um, with emergency lights and siren in it. Okay. So did you start heading north then? Yes, sir. All right, tell me about that. Um, well, at first it didn't seem real. It's, uh, I remember pulling out of the parking lot, and I looked to my left, and there was uh, some patrol cars coming around the corner. There's the medical examiner's office down there. And I'm like, then it like really came real. Like, holy crap! Like they they know about it. It was the state police. I'm like, they know about it. Like this is this is serious. I it's, it's bigger than I could ever have imagined. Um, so I flipped my lights on at that point and just drove north. Okay. How fast were you? As fast as the van will let me. How long did it take you to get there? I have no idea. It was. It seemed like eternity. I can tell you that much. So. Oxford High School, it's, it's a large school, it's, it's, it's one level, it's one story, rather. Yes, sir. Um, as far as area, it's got a pretty big footprint. Okay, so where did you go when you pulled up? Um, when I was driving there, um, there was a lot of radio traffic, a lot. I remember I was actually at 24 and uh, uh, Lapeer Road, um, M24 Lapeer Road and Updike, and they called that uh, S1 was in custody, um, and I was still, I know, a ways off from there. Um, but that, you, you know, we didn't know what was going on. We didn't know if there was a second shooter, a third shooter, a bomb planted somewhere. So, you know, it just didn't stop. Um, and uh, I drove, drove north on 24. Um, God, it's, again, it seemed like eternity. And with every, every half mile I drove, it seemed like there was another emergency vehicle falling in behind me. Yesterday was described as a caravan. Would that be accurate? Oh, it was definitely a caravan. I, there was one time we got into, I remember we were approaching a light, we were getting closer, and there was, uh, the light had just turned red, so cross traffic was going to start, which obviously a dangerous situation, being in a car, actually the white minivan that no one believes is a police car. Um, and so as I approached, I, I got um, up into the intersection, I inched my way in there to stop traffic and hold the intersection, and I counted every vehicle that went past me, and there were 18, um, or SWAT trucks, ambulance patrol cars from agencies that were nowhere even near our our area. So tell me what you see when you pull up on the scene. Uh, like I said, there's there's a lot of chatter on the radio. I, I wasn't familiar, I'm not familiar with the area of Oxford at the time. I had no idea where the school was. Um, all I could hear was uh, the staging area and Ray Road. And so um, I'm just thinking, I'm just going to drive north, I'm going to follow this caravan, we're going to go up there and as soon as I see the mire, I'm going to stop there because I have no idea where the heck I'm going. Um, I didn't bother putting in my GPS, of course. And uh, I turn onto Ray Road, and all I see is I see uh, I see kids that look like my kids. They were girls wearing real, sm you know, small clothing, and. Uh, I, one kid, I didn't have a shoe on. Um, they were coming down the road, coming towards the mire, um, and just like walking across the snow. And I remember I had, it, God, it was cold that day. I had two coats on, and I was shaking when I got out of my car. And there's kids just walking past me, dressed like anybody in this courtroom is right now, with no, they're not ready for the for the weather. So you said you went to the the mire on Ray Road. Yes. Did you learn that's, that was the reunification point for parents and children? Uh, at the time, I didn't know that was a reunification point. I just, I just saw that there were a ton of kids going there. Um, I got out of my car, walked down there. Um, they were sending everybody down to the garden area to try to get you know the names of people that had, had gotten to that point. Um, and once I got, that was at the, that would be at the south end of the Myers. Once I got to the garden area, um, there were kids just everywhere, just. Just staying in the cold or making their way into the. I'm sorry. It's okay. It's okay. What did you do when you arrived? Where did you go? Uh, like I said, I went to the garden area. I picked up on what they were trying to do. They they were passing out notebooks um, just to write down everybody's names and phone number, all the students that were coming in. Um, so I was I, I first started just collecting that, um, and then um, they started 
um, telling everybody, you know, we got to go outside and get all the kids inside because, again, it was, it was freezing out there. And um, so I go back outside, and uh, I start, like, trying to direct people, like, to go inside. And I know the, the trauma they just experienced, so I'm not going to force them in the building. I'm not going to grab them and drag them in there. And I remember putting my arm on a couple of the kids' shoulders, and, like, they didn't, they didn't move. They didn't nudge. They didn't do anything. Um, there were parents there just standing there. There were some parents that had, had made it uh, reunified with their kids. Um, I remember seeing school buses pull up. School buses with who? No, uh, students on it okay. for that had made it out of the school. Did you go to the school? Yes. Um, I was probably at the Meyer for like 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes maybe. Um, and then Detective uh, Jeff Enger had called me and said that he was uh, attempting to obtain the security footage from the school. Where does uh, Jeff Enger work? He's also a detective in the computer crimes unit. Works with me. Worked with me. So you were asked to go to the school? Yes, sir. Why were you asked to go there? Uh, at that time, I was, I was a little more versed in DVR systems. Jeff had told me, Detective Enger had told me that he was looking to try to get that off of there, and he just didn't, you know, he wanted to get it right, of course. And so he asked me to come up there and help him. Okay. So... You drove to the high school from Meyer, or did you walk? I drove. Okay. And where did you go when you got there? Um, I drove to what uh, would have been the, the north the north entrance of the school. The main entrance? Yes, the main okay. entrance. And tell me what you saw when you walked in. Um, when I first walked in, um, well, there's vehicles every. I mean, people walking in and coming in. I went in crazy uh, chaos. And um, I walk in, and uh, Detective or Sean Wilson, Sergeant Sean Wilson, was standing at the door, um, keeping security, so to speak. You know, at the time, make, not making sure or making sure people aren't coming in that shouldn't be there. Okay. And, and where did you go? I, I asked where this security office was because that's where Detective Anger told me he was, and people pointed me. Eventually, it was back behind the, the main office. Okay. So tell me what you did when you arrived and who was there. Um, Jim Work was there, who was a school security at the time. Um, he was trying to get the video footage. Detective Jeff Enger was in the room. Um, Sergeant Marsband, Lieutenant Marsband was in the room. Uh, Deputy Lewert, who was a school resource officer, was in the room. And uh, uh, ATF agent um, was also in the room. That was Mr. Brandon? Yes, here? exactly, yes. Special agent, not Mr., I'm sorry. Um, yes. Did you know him at the time? I had no idea who he was. Okay. <clears throat> and you said you had a familiarity with DVR systems. That's why you were called. Correct, yes, sir. Okay, so what was your specific role at this part of the investigation? Um, I, I'll be honest, I wasn't given a, a direct mission or anything at that time because, they were, again, they were looking for a second bad guy or a third bad guy. Um, and so I just, I knew that people would want to know, the, the bosses would want to know what happened, like how did, you know, where did it start, who, who was it if they didn't know that, or, or were there more people or whatever. So we just started attempt, starting to look for uh, the shooter in, in the hallway that it started. Was this, the school made safe at that point? They were still clearing the school. They, yeah, they were, yeah, no, it was not. Okay. So the officers were still conducting their searches. Like you said, they weren't, they weren't sure if it was one shooter, two shooter, three yeah. shooters. Yeah, it, okay. it, it might have been, I'm sorry. Um, it might have been 130, 145 at this time, maybe a little bit later than that. Okay. That's the time you arrived at the school? And got to the office, correct? Got to the office. Okay. Thank you. Um, did you learn how many surveillance cameras were active in Oxford High School on November the 30th of 21? Yes, there's well over 90 of them. Okay. And so it was your job at that point, or your role as you saw, to identify who the shooter was? Correct. Okay, so how did you go about doing that? Um, we started in the hallway, the 200 hallway where it all started, um, in the bathroom that the shooter came out. And we just, we attempted to, to backtrack him going in there. Um, I remember it, it took us it took us like 15 minutes to try to figure out because um, he had actually changed his clothes. We didn't know who the shooter was. We didn't know his name in the office at that time. He was in custody at the time, but we didn't know. And I remember someone in the office, I, someone saying, um, eventually giving us his name and then saying that he was in the school counselor's office earlier that day. So we, we went back to that time of day when he was going in out of the school counseling office to find out what he was actually wearing at that time. And we were able to follow him into the bathroom then. How long did that process take you? Well, because we didn't know what he was wearing. It took us 20 minutes to try to figure that out. Okay. <clears throat> now, are you the person, so 
you you backtrack to the, sh the point where the shooter walked into the bathroom that he emerged from to begin the shooting. Is that right? Correct. Yes, sir. Okay. So are you the person, the investigator, who actually put together the footage of the shooting itself? Yes, sir. So you're familiar with the path the shooter took in the school? Very much so, yes. I'm going to ask you to walk us through that. So he said, you told us that he went into a bathroom. Is That's the bathroom adjacent to room 258? Correct, yes. Okay, tell us what happens next. He, uh, <clears throat> he comes out of the bathroom... Um, what I, what I envision is he comes out of the bathroom with, with a proud chest, with his, almost like his shoulders were back, like he's, he looked excited. Um, he comes out of the bathroom and immediately to his left, um, is a, uh, uh, a, a victim and he shoots the, her in her, in her neck and then, um, her boyfriend was there and shot her. Shot him in his. Uh, he put his hand up and shot him in his mouth. And that's right outside 258. Yes, sir. What happened next? Um, he then uh, uh, quickly turned his gun to uh, a group of four girls that were just standing there. Um, uh, they he shot uh, Hannah Saint Julian, um, and uh, she she immediately fell to the ground. And then he continued shooting in the area that those girls were. Um, and they sort of just, sort of just like fell on top of each other, uh, you know, because they were they were hit as well. May I first witness? Sure. This is a map that's already been admitted. You can use this to describe. What, what exhibit? That's five, Judge. Thank you. Judge five. Okay. Exhibit five. Exhibit five. Thank you. Um, at this point, it's 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 under a minute that all all that shooting happened, um, and then so at that point, obviously, it it, it must have really, again, kicked in for lack of a better phrase to. <coughs> to the victims in the hallway, and they started running. Um, then the shooter, uh, with just a one-arm grab, just started just firing rounds down the hallway um, with no regard for, obviously, anything. And bullets are flying, and um, he, uh, there was, there was one girl who was, uh, you see at the end of the hallway, um, she just as the shooting starts, she she drops down into the fetal position uh, in an attempt to protect herself, and uh, the uh, the shooter runs up to her and just puts the gun right to her head, and uh, you, uh, that was Madison. And you see her fall over. He then uh, goes around the hallway. And there's, at this time, all, all the kids have gotten out of the area, most of the kids. Um, you see uh, two girls. Um, one stops at a classroom that, obviously, the, the victims inside have already um, locked the door, so you can't pull it open. You see her trying to talk on that door. And there's another girl um, with dark hair uh, that comes running up behind her and, like, grabs her while the shooter is just shooting down the hallway. Um, and then they, they just take off running further down the hallway. Um, then uh, the now he's 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 rounded the corner um, from where it all started. Um, continues going down the hallway. Um, I, I think he at that point he might have reloaded his gun um, and continued down the hallway. I'm sorry. And then um, he stops as he gets to like there's a courtyard, what they call the. The cubby. Uh, Jim worked on they call this area the cubby, uh, where the cameras are. And you see uh, Tate near. He comes in the door, um, and then just takes a left. He not. He must not have known what was going on. Um, and that's when the shooter um, leveled the gun, um, like if you were at a gun range and practicing. Leveled the gun. Um, appeared to look down the sights of the gun um, and fired around uh, Tate just fell instantly. Um, uh, he continues on down the hallway, walks past Tate, doesn't care to acknowledge the fact that that even happened. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, 
prior to walking down the hallway, that's right, he, uh, while Tate's body was laying there, um, you see uh, the shooter with the gun still level fires another round, and it causes Tate's body to jerk. Um, I don't know if you hit him in the hip or the, the backside or whatever. Uh, Tate's body jerks. And uh, then the shooter walks past him. You see his feet at the top of the camera frame. You can, there's not a camera that picks him up because they don't, if there's not enough movement, they don't start recording. But you see his feet stop in what I later found out to be um, a teacher's classroom. And he turns um, and then he fires into that classroom. Um, he continues on down the hallway looking into classrooms and stuff like that. There was one, as he gets so far down the hallway, he had fired a couple rounds down the hallway. Um, once he gets to a certain point, all the, all the children are gone at this point. The teachers had gotten them out of there. They had ran you know, out, out of the building and um, out through the door, wherever the heck they could get out of there. Um, as he's coming back, you see him stop because the way that that classroom was, if, if you're walking away from it, it's on your right-hand side, you don't see the classroom because it's actually behind you at this point. But as he's coming back, he's, he must have seen people hiding in a corner because he can now see through the window. And he fires off a few rounds through that window. Um, he, uh, he, he, he keeps coming down. He's coming back down the hallway now at this point. Um, and then uh, the, the assistant principal, uh, Gibson Marshall, I didn't know her at the time, um, he walks right past her. Um, and sort of, I, I, I don't know what she said to him, um, but uh, if she said anything. But you see, you see a, like the shooter as he's walking by and the gun's in his hand. And he sort of just turns his head and just, I don't know, I don't know why, but he turns his head and looks away from her, doesn't even look at her as an acknowledger after as he's walking past. Um, and then he continues on down the hallway um, and stops at the bathroom where uh, Justin was killed. Um, and just as a, just like an abrupt stop, like, okay, well, and he just turned right and went to the bathroom. So, <clears throat> I didn't ask you, I didn't tell you I was going to ask you that. You obviously have this committed to memory. Oh, yes. How many times have you uh, seen this footage? Like I said before, it's, it's, I don't know, it's burned in my brain. And it was your responsibility to obtain that footage to get the information to officials at the sheriff's office and federal law enforcement as well? Yes, sir. <clears throat> So you were the person that had to watch, rewind, watch, rewind over and over again? Countless times, yes. <clears throat> Judge, this might be a good time for a short break. Okay. Uh, your, your Honor, my client could use a second if we could please. She's like, I'm trying to like, okay, we could. Okay, I understand. We understand. Thank you. I understand. Okay, so um, we're going to take um, a 10 minute break. So if you can be ready to come to the doctor, I would like Sergeant, I'm, I, I'm in the habit of demoting and promoting people while I understand. You're a sergeant? No, ma'am. I'm, I'm an analyst now. Yeah, analyst. I'm a civilian employee. Oh, I'm sorry. You're a civilian. Okay. I'm sorry, ma'am. You're just Mr. Okay. Yes, um, sir. Ma'am. You, you um, are. Uh, still a witness and still under oath, so you can't discuss your testimony with anyone um, during the break. Yes, okay. ma'am. Yes, ma'am. All right, you can step down. All rise for the jury.
Yes, Judge. Yes, Judge, thank you. May I proceed, Jeff? Sure. Thank you. <coughs> okay. Now, just one more question about, about November the 30th. When you arrived at the Meyer and Ray Road, were there just a few parents there or a lot of parents there? Uh, there are dozens, dozens of parents just standing there just waiting. Okay. Now, I want to direct your attention now to the late winter of 2021, and the early spring of 2021, specifically how you came to know about information regarding that time period in your review of the defendant's device. So I had already introduced this exhibit. Exhibit 79 is the uh, photograph, 80 is the metadata. Okay, and I'm, if you could tell us, did you recover evidence around this time frame that was of note to you of an investigator in this case? Yes. Okay. So like I said, we're going to start with March the 9th and move backwards from there. May I approach the witness? Sure. This is People Proposed 81. Sir, I've just handed you a map. We were talking about metadata and how it can occasionally give an investigator an idea of where and when a photograph was taken. Correct. Okay, and if we look at the, the screen here on Exhibit 80, we have coordinates at the bottom of that metadata, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, and so 81, I've just handed you, that's the coordinates plugged into a map? Yeah, in a good, yes, correct. Uh, people move to admit 81. No objection. 81. I'm sorry, 80. Uh, it's a Google map of metadata. Yep, no objection. 81. So this is 81 on the screen here. And that tells you, in addition to the metadata, where the picture was taken, where that device was when the picture was taken. Correct. Okay. And again, this is March 9th of 2021. Correct. Okay. Okay. Now I'm going to ask you about what Jennifer's son was texting Jennifer about on March 9, 2021. May I approach the witness? Sure. This is People's Proposed Exhibit 82. Sir, those are text messages exported from Jennifer Crumley's phone. Have you found, have you seen that in the past? Yes, sir, I have. Okay, and how did you come to see that? Uh, from the phone extraction. Okay, and you extracted the information and reviewed those messages? Correct, yes. People moved to admit 82. Remember. 82 is the text message between Shooter and Jennifer Pages 105 to 106 dated March 9, 2021. Yeah, I, um, I believe that the court, I've previously said that. Thank the you. That I had ruled on. Correct, it's preserved. Um, 82 is the Thank you. Sir, I'm going to publish that because there's multiple slides and then you can look at the screen. So this information is from um, Jennifer's original phone, is that right? Correct. Okay. 
And so People's 82, we have multiple slides here. The blue is the defendant's son, is that correct? Correct. Okay. And what is he writing at March 9th, 2021 at 7.50 in the evening? Uh, he's asking uh, if Jennifer could come home. Uh, there's someone in the house, I think. Okay. And what's the, the next uh, text he uh, It's The third one says, someone walked into the bathroom and flushed the toilet and left the light on. Okay. That's March 9th, 2021 at 7.50? Correct. Yes, sir. Okay. And then March 9th, 7.50, 52 seconds. What is he read? And I thought it was you, but when I came out, no one was home. And then he writes, there's no one in the house, though? Correct. Dude, my door just slammed. That's at 8 p.m.? Yes. Maybe it's just my paranoia. That's at 8.01 p.m., March the 9th. Yes. Okay. And then this is 8.01 p.m. Text to his mother, the defendant, but when are you going to get home? And when was the next text response in the uh, phone download that you recovered? The next response was the following day on March 10th, where she said, where's your dad? At 10 a.m., 10.21 a.m. May I approach with it? Sure. This is People's Proposed Exhibit 83. Sir, take a look at that and tell me if you recognize that this handed you. Yes, sir. And how do you recognize that? It's uh, an extraction report uh, in a PDF format of a call log from a, a cell phone. Okay, and that call log specifically was recovered on the shooter's phone? Correct. Okay, and this is from March of 9th, 2021 to March of 20th, 2021. That's on the last page. Yes, correct. Okay, thank you. People move to admit 83. And I have no objection to that 83 is admitted. Okay. So the slide I'm going to show you is it's a snippet of that. We're going to go back to Exhibit 83 throughout your testimony. Okay. Specifically, because we're talking about March the 9th right now. March the 9th, 2021, the phone call to either his mom or dad <laughs> to his father, James Crumbly, was a missed call at 7.31 a.m., is that right? That's correct, yes. And um, his mom called him at 8.38 p.m., March the 9th. I'm sorry, March the 10th. Correct, on the 10th. Okay, so the time those text messages were being sent to his mother, there were no phone calls or texts back in that relevant time period. Correct. Now... I'm going to back up a day to March the 8th to give this context. May I approach some minutes? Sure. This is People's Proposed Exhibit 84. <clears throat> Sir, 84 is a, the portion of the Facebook thread between James and Jennifer Crumley, pages 386 and 388 from March the 8th of 21. Is that right? Correct. And you've seen this before? Yes, sir. People move to admit 84. Uh, no objection, Your Honor. 84 is admitted. Okay. So I'll direct your attention to the screen. This is blue again is Jennifer, green is James, is that right? Correct. Okay, and that's because this chat specifically was deleted from Jennifer's phone. That's correct, it was. Okay. So Jennifer's words, Ethan going to bowling. And what is James write? IDK. I I don't know. Okay. And she writes, What do you mean, IDK? His response. I don't know exactly what I said. We'll know after he gets home. Okay. And Jennifer wrote, does he have his phone? Why isn't he home yet? He should be home by, by now. That's March 8, 21 at 3.12 p.m.? That's correct. Okay. Then she writes, freaking out. And James's response. He does not get home until 3.16. Okay. And then Jennifer wrote, I told you to pick him up because he's upset, and I don't want him to do anything stupid, goddammit. Correct. That's March 8, 21 3.13 p.m.? That's correct. Okay. And James writes, dude, chill, he is fine, I'm trying to fucking work. That's correct, he did. Okay. So for context, this is the day before those text messages were sent by the defendant's son to the defendant. Correct. Now I want to move on to March the 17th of 2021. May I approach the witness? Sure. This is People's Proposed 85. <laughs> Sir, 85 is the Facebook thread between James and Jennifer Crumbly, pages 432 to 435 from March 17th. Do you recognize that? Yes, sir. And how do you recognize it? Again, it's a printout of a um, Facebook chat. Okay. And you've, of course, seen that before? Yes, sir. Because you were the one that pulled the information? Correct, yes, sir. 
Thank you, Judge. Your Honor, um, I do object to 80, 84 because there's portions of it that, that don't need, are not admissible, in my opinion. 84, there I'm sorry, 85. Point. I'm sorry, 85. There are portions of 85 that the defense objects to, and they have not been previously ruled upon by the court. May we approach? Um, yes. Do you, want, do you want to go in the hallway? I don't know. Because... Right, I think you first need to find what the actual objection is. The because objection. we have a foundation to chain. We have a foundation to found. I'm sorry, we have a stipulation okay. to chain mm -hmm. and the foundation. Okay. He's already testified to a number of portions of this very same Facebook thread. It's, it's hard for me to know if I've seen this one before or if I know what it is. This has not been the subject of a prior ruling. Okay. I object to portions of page 432. It does discuss a topic that has been ruled to be inadmissible. So I am asking that those portions of 85 be struck. They're irrelevant. Okay, can, can I see it? May I approach? Yes, I may, help. may I approach? That, that, that may or may not help. Okay. You have
or it can use it. You can start down if you want to. It's up to you. Is it okay if I stay up? Yeah, you can start. Okay. Yeah, it's up to you. Most people don't want to stay seated there. So. Oh, I'm fine then. Thank you. All right. Um, so an issue came up. I, you know, I'm hoping that we're not going to have to exclude the jury with, uh, with every exhibit. So some of this I'm um, relying on memory. So a year and a half ago, some evidentiary rulings were made. Um, this might be an overgeneralization, indicating that the fact that there was alcohol in the, the home in and of itself was not uh, relevant, right? And then there was a ruling about... I'm the same judge. Okay, what, yeah, what's your, okay, He's what, just bringing me up to speed. There wasn't room for me to turn. Okay, all right. So um, there was a ruling about the meat. Council moved to exclude certain pieces of evidence, okay. and this court made a record that was June the 27th of 22. Okay. And in that record, actually it was page 40 of the transcript, the court specifically okay. said, the court said that it was, the court indicated that it was based upon a preliminary examination transcript, as the court recalls, neither party stipulated to exam transcript for the factual basis, and the court indicated that more evidence is being found even as we speak. I think I don't want to paraphrase because that's not a verbatim quote. Okay. And in defense counsel's opening, so to bring the court up to speed on the record, counsel asked to approach and object to any reference of alcohol. There's one text in this text message thread or Facebook thread between James and Jennifer. Jennifer. On uh, March 17th, says, going to get drunk and ride my horse. James responds, well, don't get drunk. They have uh, a couple of more text messages in the midst of a conversation that is pertinent to our proofs. And that's because the next exhibit will be text messages from the school shooter to Jennifer Crumbly about seeing demons. And then there will be evidence of a lack of phone calls, okay. lack of text messages back. And, and to get back to the court's ruling, the court said no evidence of alcohol or substance use unless it does show some type of, type of parental neglect. Okay. So these particular messages are the same time, the same date, where the defendant's son is experiencing or, or stating that he's experiencing hallucinating. So okay. this is all relevant. And, Your Honor, my point is they, on Exhibit 85... There are texts that do not need to be included to make the point that Mr. and Mrs. Crumbly were at the barn and not with their son. We're objecting to the texts that include buying beer, being drunk on a horse. They are irrelevant. They are also irrelevant to someone being a hypervigilant parent. I would consider myself a hypervigilant parent, and I have some cocktails once in a while. That, that, that issue is not relevant the alcohol is not relevant. It's just an unnecessary part of this text to make them look like they're out drinking um, when the whole point is that they're out with their horses and not with their son. So it's not counsel's idea of what the point is. No, no, no. It's not just, it's not, well, it's not just that they're out with their um, horses and not with their son. And there's um, no crime. Um, there's obviously no crime committed by people with uh, children having cocktails. Or, in fact, this room would probably be in jail, but... Um, that being said, the, the issue is whether or not uh, the shooter's texts are being ignored. That's the point of it. Right, Judge. And there is, is an offer of proof. There is substantial evidence that has been excluded that shows the substance use of James and Jennifer Crumley. Substantial. We're not introducing any of that because of the court's ruling. Mm -hmm. But directly on point to this, in the midst of a conversation, it is relevant. It's material, it's probative, it's under 401 if people be known. Okay, well, you know, I, am I able to see a specific uh, picture of, because some of it might be, some of it might not be. So I, I don't want to do this while the jury is waiting. Are, is there more things like this that, it, it's, if the uh, shooter is having um, some trauma, feeling some trauma and reaching out to the parents and they're ignoring them, um, that evidence to me is obviously relevant. Correct, so, yes. I'm not objecting to all of 85. I'm objecting to the portions about alcohol. Okay. Because so the door has been open. Counsel specifically said, I think more than once, that her client is a hyper vigilant mother. That Nobody's, is hang on. Nobody says anything about having a cocktail. But when there's evidence to show that they are drinking when the son is texting things to the mother, no callback. 
That's important, and it's important to show the jury what they actually did and spent their time on. Okay, can I can I see the text right again? And is that the only one because the, the jury is pulling their heels in? Is there any more like this? There are more like this. Okay, and well, maybe we need to do this at 6 o'clock tonight. I, I should have been raised last night. Okay. So these exhibits were turned over a long time ago. I know. No, no, no. I got all these text messages a long time ago. Okay. I found out what they were planning to use from the boxes and boxes of information. I found that it's out. It's ridiculous. On, okay. you, excuse me, on Tuesday okay. night. Yeah, I've had this discovery, but I can't file a motion to exclude every single line of these things. I filed many motions. Okay. I, I filed a motion about the alcohol. This part of the text that they told me two days ago they're going to use includes alcohol. I'm just asking that the alcohol portion be struck. Okay, um, I, I understand that, but there's been we had. I know that there's a lot of exhibits, and I know there's a lot of documents, but we could have had a massive motion in limine fest um, a while ago, right? So I am loath to make the jury sit there while we're going line. I line through uh, evidence. I, that's very problematic to me. I didn't intend for this issue to take a long time. I thought this would be a simple objection to just take out the text about drinking, and that's it. Okay, but, but okay, so she says, I'm going to get drunk and ride my horse. Okay, so that, that might not be specifically uh, relevant, but it, at what time is he? When she's on her horse, that's when he's texting her. Okay. And just because she's on her horse and he's texting her, doesn't mean she's looking at the text, text and ignoring him and saying, I'm going to have a drink instead of a, I mean. Okay, my understanding was there was a, a large period of time where he was texting her and she was with her horse. And then maybe sent a picture of the horse. I, I don't Correct. know. Correct. Tell, tell me. Right, yes, she's on, she, you're going to hear testimony from other witnesses that the cell phone signal doesn't work out where the horse place is. Well, then that's an argument for counsel to make. It, it is. Right, but the fact that they're having beers out there with the horses is, is not is not relevant to the point the prosecution's even trying to make about the fact that they're unavailable and not responding to their son. Okay, there's a, a text from beers coming. This, this is not when I like to do this. Okay, she says, "Gonna get drunk and ride my horse." That's at one thirty in the afternoon. When do you, when do you say he's trying to contact her? That was a day during the week when she was at work. After work, she went to the barn. The text being around five fifty p.m. when she's at the barn. We know that from pictures and metadata. Okay, this okay then. So the court is aware there are no other, we took all of our other reference out prior to trial of alcohol use in accordance with this court's order. Of course, that's subject to the door being opened. The door was not opened by me saying that she's a vigilant mother. Okay, so they go to the barn after. Is that correct? Do we, do we know what time approximately they go to the barn? Is it, this text is at, at, at 1.30, right? Those texts are from during the day when they're making plans to go to the barn after work. Right. And then wait, I, believe, wait, that's I, I believe the text says something about leaving now at... Okay, so what, when are they at the barn in relation to his texts about demons? At the same time. Okay, but is that... At 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock. The first text, the house, the house is on at 6.03 p.m. Okay. There's a picture of James on a horse taken by Jennifer. There's a picture of Jennifer on a horse at the same time. Okay. All right. 
So she says, I'm going to get drunk and ride my horse, that she's expressing her intention for that evening. Correct. Um, I'm going to allow that text, but not the next one about, well, don't get drunk, we are definitely going to have some drinks, I need to stop and get me a 12 pack of Budweiser bottles, please, and keep that out. Right? And, all right, let me keep that out. That, it's, she is indicating her intention to go later and ride her horse and get drunk. And, when she's riding her horse, when she's at the barn later, um, is when he is texting and getting no response. So I, I think that could be uh, relevant to her uh, ignoring her son. All right? May I approach? Sure. Um, but this text from James Crumley, I'm going to exclude. Is there anything else in there that needs okay, so to be excluded? Just there? for the record, page 432. Yeah. The second text, the message yeah, back from James Kremlin. Is there anything else in there? I'm looking up. Yeah. Because I, I don't want to... No. We were making good headway yesterday, but now we're, we're moving to the stairs pace. So. Well, Your Honor, there's, there's a, also a, um, a text <coughs> responding to the one about buying gears. Jennifer just says, okay, but glass is not a good idea. I mean, yeah, we, that, we can strike that too, because it's referring to the text above. It's, it, it, it's, it's not relevant. So it would just be those two portions. Okay. Yeah, can you strike that? I, I don't know how easy it is to do it up here. Right? It'll just take a minute. Okay. All right. This one's are, are there any other issues such as this? I'm. I'm looking right now, Your Honor. Okay, well, we, should, we shouldn't be looking right now. Yeah. Your Honor, I mean, the next exhibit is, has been the subject of a prior ruling. Okay. I'm good. That sounds good. That's a good way to do it. Okay. Exhibit 87, 88, 89, 90, 91, 92. I mean, we're trying on the fly. To, okay. to edit an exhibit okay, go or an objection we just got, and, and now there's like. Okay, I want to find out if there's any looming issues because that. I, we do too. They're going to get their 10,000 steps here. I, we do too. Your Honor, I, I did not think this objection would be such a process. I, I simply was asking for like one little part of this to be struck, and okay. objections during trial are common. This okay. is just a very simple. All right, but is there, is there anything else coming up that would require the jury to uh, step out of? I, there's photos. Well, I, I don't know what objections to such photos. There, photos. I have I have objections to many photos that are going to be brought in through a different witness. But what are they planning to use? Because I have 450 right now. If I know what's coming, I can tell the court. Okay. Well, there's a list of, of exhibits, and there's um, coming after that. Um, after the text messages are pictures. It looks like there's pictures of James and Jennifer. And we have no objection to those. Okay. I, I just want to know if, you know. Your Honor, if I could just say, there's yeah. there's a lot of inquiry as to exactly who we're calling next, yeah. which exhibit we're in. You know, we this isn't this isn't a, a, a math formula. We, we really are changing this organically because I, we're I working. Know. I get it. So I, we're trying to be cooperative, but things okay. do change. I know. I know. And you're not required to divulge your trial strategy and order and all that. I just am I'm, I'm moving a lot of people around and I um, just want to know if there's anything else that needs to be handled that needs to be handled right now on the record. The only other objections I believe with respect to um, this witness, at least for the next very long time, are objections the courts already ruled on. So Okay, thank you. Okay, so at least we can get through, I mean, this whole page of exhibits with okay. no problem. All right. Okay. Perhaps counsel can meet with us after court today to go over the next proposed exhibits, and then we can see what's, what objections. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. I just it's just because I don't want to change your time. That sounds great. All right. Thank okay. you. All right. So, um, so eighty five is modified, and we're yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, are we ready for the jury? I think so. Okay. <laughs> are you Yeah, no, okay. The 
these ones. Just tell me how far you want to go, because I, I do agree with all those. Up through 100. All right, for the jury? Right, which is already in the room. That'll be easy. And then I don't have any objections. I mean, yeah. Exhibit 84, I think. All right. <clears throat> this is between James and Jennifer Crumbly. Again, Jennifer is in blue, James is in green. Um, we'll start at the top because I don't recall where we left off. Does he have his phone from Jennifer, Marcy 8? I'm sorry, you said you're on exhibit 84, but I believe it's 85. 84 was admitted. 84 was admitted. Yes, because we 85 is March 17. The 84 was on March 8th. Okay, so and you're on 80, 80, I'm on 84. Okay, but 84 mine was on March 8th, and this one is on March. Yeah, this, yes. is, this is 84 on the screen. That's 84, yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. There are, it's it's, it's, it's scrolled down, so I didn't, <coughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. and, um, okay. James responds with, yes, but he won't answer while he is walking. I will let you know the minute he walks in. Okay. Jennifer's response, I'm serious freaking out. Is he home yet? And then, okay, now we're moving on to 85. So, James and Jennifer uh, Facebook messages. This is from March 17th of 2021. And you've seen this before? Yes, sir. And this is admitted um, pursuant the order that we just had on the record, correct, Judge? Right. Thank you. Okay, March 17th, 2021, 1.23 p.m. Jennifer writes, cool, leaving at 4 today. Fuck this place. James's response is what? LOL, you have your stuff for the barn. Okay. And then Jennifer's response, yes, going to get drunk and ride my horse. That's March 17th, 2021, 1.30 p.m. Correct. There's a response back. And then what does James say? James says, okay, then cans, you have the debit card. And Jennifer's response, I know, hate my job. Can you bring out last, please? He says, yes. Correct. Correct, yes, I'm sorry. Okay. Right. okay. Now, on that same day, did you find any text messages from Jennifer's son to her of a concerning nature? This is March 17, 2021. Yes, sir. Okay. This is People's Proposed 86. I don't believe we have an objection to this. Uh, no objection. Thank you. This is 86. 86. 86 in the room. Okay. All right. What does Jennifer's son write to her on March 17th, 2021 at 6.03 p.m.? He says, okay, the house is ha now haunted. And then what? Some weird shit just happens and now I'm scared. Then it follows with, I got some videos. Okay. Okay, Your Honor, I, I apologize. This was previously the subject of a motion. I do object, however, the court has already ruled it's admissible. I'm sorry, I misspoke. Yes, I, okay. yes, I have already ruled on this. Okay, yeah. sorry yes. about that. No, that's right. Okay, please, at the top. And then Ethan says, continues with, and a picture of the demon. It's throwing bowls. Uh, the word bowls is in all caps. He then says, I am not joking, it fucked up the kitchen. And the next message after that? He says, I'm just going to be outsider for a while. Can you at least text back? Okay, so that's from 6.03 to 6.29. The last text, can you at least text back at 6.29 p.m.? Correct, yes. Okay. And the next response from the defendant to her son is when? Uh, two days later, uh, at 4.11 in the afternoon, where's your dad? Now, this is people's 87 and 88. I don't believe there's an objection to either of these two exhibits. No objection. Okay, 87 is the picture. 88 is the metadata with the picture. So, could you please tell us when and where this picture was taken? Uh, it was taken, the GPS is similar to the previous ones at a horse barn. 
Um, it, he's on a horse. It was taken on March 17th at 6.03 p.m. Okay, 6.03, that's the same time that the text messages regarding the house being haunted and saw a demon? Correct. Okay. And this was actually found on Jennifer Scrumley's phone? That's correct, it was. And who was a, um, who was that a picture of? That's James Scrumley. And that's St. Patrick's Day, correct? Correct. All right. This is Exhibit 88 and, I'm sorry, 89 and 90. 89 is the photograph, 90 is the metadata. And we have no objection to 88, 89, or 90. Thank you. And this is also St. Patrick's Day. Can you move for their admission before you put them on the screen? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Um, this is also St. Patrick's Day 2021, is that correct? Correct, same day. And this is an image also on Jennifer Crumley's phone? Correct. Okay. And when was this taken? On March 17th at 6.03 p.m. Okay. Same location? It appears so, yes. Now I'm going to move you on to Exhibit 91 and Exhibit 92. I don't believe there's an objection to either of these pieces of evidence. There is no objection. 91 and 92 are admitted. Thank you, Judge. Again, we're still talking about St. Patrick's Day 2021. What time was this picture taken? This was taken at 628 in the evening. Okay. And again, is that time and date significant to you as an investigator in this case? Yes, it is. Why? Because it was the time of Ethan was sending, the shooter was sending the text messages. Okay. And this is also on Jennifer Crumley's phone? Correct. 91 and 92. We have no objection to 93 and 94. 93 and 94. Thank you, Judge. Exhibit 93, also a picture captured on Jennifer Crumley's phone. This is also St. Patrick's Day, 2021, and this is at 6.30 p.m. Correct. Okay. Same location as the other photographs we've been sure, Yes, sir. Okay. back to Exhibit 83. This has already been admitted. This is the phone log found on the shooter's phone. So the, the time we're speaking of, those text messages that where he sent his mother, indication that he was seeing bowls fly off the shelf from the demon, that was between 6.03 p.m. and 6.29 p.m. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. So we already saw that there was not a text back from Jennifer Crumbly, but tell us about the phone log. What did he show? It shows a phone call uh, from his, from Jennifer Crumbly at 7.24 p.m. Okay. So that's about an hour and a half after he texted about the house being haunted. That's correct. And that was a 19-second call? Correct. Okay. Now I'm going to move on to March the 19th, 2021. This is a Facebook conversation between James and Jennifer regarding that son, their son that day. This is people's 95. I don't believe we have an objection to this. No, there is no objection. 95 is admitted. Thank you. Okay. Again, Jennifer in blue, James in green. Correct. Okay. She said, is he awake? And what did James respond? James responds with, um, yeah. Jennifer wrote, how is he? James then responds with, he woke up looking like he had way, in all caps, W-A-Y, too much to drink last night, complaining about a headache. Okay. And then um, her response as well, he was really worked up and out of control, so I can see why. That's March 19th, 21, at 9.41 a.m. Correct. About 48 seconds later, she wrote, all I know is he needs to eat, <coughs> go to work, and work hard and not complain, and he can get his stuff back. Correct. And then March 19th, later on, he responded and didn't get it. That's Jennifer Crumley's words? That's correct, yes. Does you have Mark 95 down for admission, correct? Yes, that's Thank you. Okay. Now, the next day, March the 20th, did you find text messages from the school shooter to his mother, the defendant, of a concerning nature from that day? Yes. Okay. This is Exhibit 96. I believe this was subject to a previous ruling. Any objection, aside from what was already admitted? No. 96 is admitted. Thank you. Well, we're still on... I'm sorry, we're still on 95 on the slide. 
James wrote, um, Jesus, yes, he said, referring to their son, let me ask you a question. Why am I in your guy's room, LOL? And Jennifer's response is what? OMG. Oh, my God. I have to back up just a little bit, okay. Judge. Sorry, thank you. So just to give, make sure everybody's on the same page. This is Exhibit 95. This is from March 19th, 2021. We've already gone through these. Um, at 9.41 a.m. When, when Jennifer wrote, he was really worked up and out of control. In the same text message conversation, there's no breaks in this exhibit. And the conversation continued. James wrote what? I totally thought you were giving him a Xanax last night. Dot, dot, dot. And Jennifer's response was, Does he seem better? And then? No, melatonin. And James wrote what? I know. And Jennifer wrote, But he hasn't had one before, so I should have only given him half. And then James' response is, He's doing his school, says his head hurts. He took so Tylenol. Correct. Okay. And Jennifer's response was, Is he okay to work? That's at March 19th at 11 a.m.? Correct. And James' response was yeah, and that's yeah. also it's eleven thirteen a.m. Correct. Okay. And then Jennifer wrote eleven thirty eight a.m. on March nineteenth. Does he remember what he did? Correct. Okay. And what what was James's response? Uh, James responds with, "Dude, I am working on a demo right now. I have not talked to him, and he is doing school." Okay. And then her response is, "Okay, then, Jeesh." Okay, thank you. Now, this is ninety six that we just admitted. This is from March the 20th of 2021. And again, did you find text messages from the school shooter to the defendant of a concerning nature? Correct. Okay. In the blue, that's all the school shooter's words? Correct. Okay. What did he write to her? He starts with, I finished picking up the room. At, that was at 2.38 on the 20th. 2.33? 2.33, I'm sorry, okay. yes. He then says, I cleaned until the clothes started flying off the shelf. And then what? Uh, this stuff only happens when I'm home alone. Okay, it's March 20th, 2021 at 2.34 p.m.? Correct. And this is the same date and time? Yes, it is. And what did he write? I picked the clothes back up, though. Okay. That's March 20th at 2.34? Correct. And when was the next response to that? Uh, by Jennifer was uh, on the 22nd of March at 8.17 p.m. Okay. So I'm going back to Exhibit 83, which is the phone log found, recovered off of the school shooter's phone, specific to these days. Okay. So, we just went through March the 20th, and those messages were sent about 2.30 in the afternoon, if you recall. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. And were there any phone calls in that time period? No, there was not. Okay. In fact, the next call was 6.37 p.m. on March the 20th. Correct. Uh, 97 and 98, Judge, I believe would be admitted. We have no objection. 97 and 98. Thank you. So, um, sir, were you able to tell where James and Jennifer Crumley were yet again on that day? Yes, sir. Okay. This is 97 and 98. 97 is the photograph, 98 the metadata. This is March 20th, 2021, at 1.51 p.m. Correct. Okay, and if you recall, the text messages from the school shooter were sent to his mother about 2.30 in the afternoon? Correct. Okay, so tell us where, where Jennifer and James Crumley were at this date and time. Uh, they were riding the horses again. Okay. 99 and 100. No objection. Yeah. Is it 99? And 100. No objection to either one? No objection to either one. 99 and 100 are admitted. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, now this was taken off of the last picture. Um, it was taken off of James Crumley's phone, 9798. That's correct. 99 and 100 were taken off of Jennifer's Crumley, Jennifer Crumley's phone. Correct. Okay, so the capture time here, March 20th, 2021, 11.58 a.m. That's correct. Okay, so then that would indicate to you that they were at the barn at least from that period of time until at least 1.51 p.m. Correct. Okay. 
Sir, during the course of your investigation, did you come to learn that the school shooter had only one friend? Yes. And did you also learn that that individual was abruptly taken from the state of Michigan about a month before the shooting occurred? Yes, he was. And did you review the text message thread between the school shooter and that other individual? Yes. You've looked at the entirety of the phone and the school shooter as well as James and Jennifer Crumbly's phone, is that right? That's correct. If you could give us an idea, the, um, the volume of the data found in the text message thread between the school shooter and his friend. There was, there was over, over 20,000 text messages just between the two people. Um, I've done exams on phones where the combined number of text messages isn't that much. So what's the relative... Uh, size and data between that particular text message thread and any other thread between the school shooter and anybody else? I think the most text between any other person <coughs> might have been near 500, an individual, an individual person. Okay. I'm going to show you a portion that's been previously admitted by this court of that text message thread from April the 4th of 2021, April the 5th of 2021. That's Exhibit 101. And the court's previously ruled on this. All right. This is one Thank you, Judge. So we have we have names redacted. Um, 101 was found on the shooter's phone. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. So in this instance, then the green would be his words, the shooter's words. Correct. Yes. Okay. Tell us what he wrote to his friend on April the fourth of twenty one. Well, the shooter wrote. Like I hear people talking to me and see someone in the distance okay. and then corrected the spelling of the word distance. It's April 4th, 11.56? Correct. Okay. Yeah. What else? The shooter said, I actually asked my dad to take me to the doctor yesterday, but he just gave me some pills and told me to, quote, suck it up. And then what? He then says, like it's at the point that I'm asking to go to the doctor. Then he says, my mom laughed when I told her. So that's April 4th, 2021, 11.57 p.m. His words, my mom laughed when I told her. That's correct. April the 5th at 12.06 a.m. So we were looking at a conversation up right up until midnight on April the 4th, and now we're in the early morning hours of April the 5th. What did the shooter write? The shooter wrote, but I'm having a bad insomnia RN for right now and paranoia. And then what? He then says, I need help. Okay. And the next slide, or the next text? I was thinking, I call him 911. To so I could go to the hospital. And then there's a, a response from his friend on April the 5th. Correct. At 12, 12 a.m. And then what did the shooter write? The shooter writes, but then my parents would be really pissed. Now, April the 5th, 2021, at 12.38 a.m., what did the shooter write? The shooter writes, I'm going to ask my parents to go to the doctors tomorrow or Tuesday again. Then he says, but this time I'm going to tell them about the voices. Okay. Next text. He then says, like I am mentally and physically dying. Before we get to exhibit 102, in the course of your forensic examination of James's phone, Jennifer's phone, and the school shooter's phone, you're able to look at certain apps that are installed. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. And did you discover if an app called Life 360 was installed on Jennifer Crumley's phone? Yes, it was. Okay. And what is Life 360? Uh, Life 360, it's a it's a tracking app that friends and family can install on their phone so they can know where they're at. Um, I have it on my phone, and maybe there's a family group that my kids are on it, and, and I'm on it, my wife. 
Um, did you find that app on James Crumley's phone? Yes, it was. And through that app, you can see where someone's at and where they've been. Is that, is that right? That's correct. Okay. And you looked through the school shooter's phone as well, the defendant's son? Correct. Was that app installed on his phone? No, it wasn't. So it was just installed on James's phone and Jennifer's phone? Correct, it was. And that was on April the 5th of 2021? I believe that's when it was installed, yes. Okay. And it's the same day as these text messages, like I'm mentally and physically dying and asking to go to the doctor? Correct. Exhibits 102 and 103. I'm sorry, are these, this is 102 and 103? We have no objection, sorry. 102 and 103. I'm sorry, did you say that the date of the installation was April 5th? Is that what you said? Yes, ma'am. So on the screen here, we can see the timestamp purchase date, April 5th, 2021. That's on Jennifer Crumley's phone, correct? Correct, yes. Okay. And Exhibit 103 on James Crumley's phone, we have April 5th, 2021 as well. Correct. During the course of your evaluation of all the electronic information, digital evidence available to you, did you uncover evidence in the spring of 21 of Jennifer Crumley talking to a friend about her what she saw as depression in her son? Yes. And were you able to review a Facebook conversation between Jennifer Crumbly and actually the school shooter's only friend's mother? Yes. Okay. So I want to make sure that I'm clear with you. In April of 2021, which is the same month of these text messages, Jennifer Crumbly texted her son's only friend's mother, correct? Correct. Okay. And in that conversation is when you uncovered concerning text messages that messages as an investigator to this case? Correct. This is 104. Um, thank you, and let me just take a quick look, I'm sorry. <coughs> yeah, I have no objection to this, thank you. 104 is on that's just 104, right? Yes, thank you, Judge. Okay, this is April 29, 2021. <coughs> now this is from Jennifer Crumbly's Search warrant return, correct? That's correct. So she's agreeing to these. Correct. All right. So what does she write? She starts with, Ethan is in bowling tonight. Just want to let you know. Not sure if they need a partner or not. Okay. And then her her son's friend's mother, also named Jennifer, writes, is he feeling okay? Correct. And the defendant's response? She responds back with, yesterday he wasn't, and he's been acting kind of depressed, so I don't know what's going on. Okay. this conversation continue? Yes, it does. Um, what does the defendant write? The defendant says, I'm not sure if there's something bothering at school. He really doesn't feel good. I can't get anything out of him. Okay. And the person she's communicating with writes her son's name, too. He stayed home from school today. The only time he's happy is when he's with the school shooter. Correct. And then her son has two E's and two D's. I'm wondering if he's worried about that. That's... The other individual worried about her own son? Correct. Okay. That's 5.24 p.m. on April the 29th? That's correct. Okay. The conversation continues. What does the defendant write? The defendant says, yeah, this is all new to me. I'm not used to Ethan being moody. He's usually pretty happy, and we'll talk about anything. I do know Ethan's been stressed about school and his grades. We called the school, but she wasn't in. Social, do it tomorrow. I think his grades have a lot to do with it. He just got to a point where he got so far behind and we were out of town. He's having a difficult time making it up. And then the other individual writes, I'm sorry, her son's struggling too. To be honest, I'm sick of fighting with him about it. Stupid online school really messed him up. I'm thankful her son he has the shooter as a friend. They laugh and have a great time together. That's April 29th at 5.31 p.m. That's correct. Okay. And then what does Jennifer respond? Jennifer responds with, yeah, me too. I'm just glad they're still getting along. And it wasn't an issue with those two as to why he was being depressed. The online school is horrible. I've given up too. I just told him to do the best. Don't worry about it. Next year is a new year. Okay. And then what's the next text? She says, maybe if, is referring to uh, the shooter's friend, feeling better. If he wants to come over after work on Saturday, he can take him up to go bowling and make up their scores. He's more than welcome to stay the night and go to work in the morning. We set up a little shooting range in the backyard for Ethan's 
BB gun, they could do that. Okay. okay, and the response was her son's been excited to shoot. Correct. Okay, and that was April 29, 2021? Yes. Okay, now, around this time frame in the text message conversation and the videos on the school shooter's phone, did you discover extremely disturbing information? Yes, sir. Okay, and I don't ask, I'm not asking you to go into detail, but as an investigator, it was important to you. Yes, it was. Okay, and um, in fact, it was in the, the days around, the days after these, these messages were sent? Yes, it was. Okay. And the school shooter shared that with his friend, his only friend he had. That's correct. And you mentioned that his only friend was taken out of the state? Correct. And it seemed to be without notice to the school shooter? Correct. Okay. Did you uncover evidence that either James or Jennifer Crumbly commented on the fact that his only son was taken, or his only friend was taken out of the state? Yes. <coughs> this is Exhibit 105. Yes, I have no objection to 105. Thank you. 105 is and you said that was around uh, about a month before the shooting at Oxford High School? Yes, it was. Okay. So, this is from Jennifer Crumbly's Facebook, again, to the mother of her son's only friend. Correct. Okay. And this is April, I'm sorry, October 31st, 2021, 9 o'clock in the morning? Yes. Okay. And what does she write? Uh, Jennifer writes, James filled me in on Ethan's friends last night. I'm so sorry you guys are having to make such a hard decision. Please let me know if you need anything. Okay. And then November the 3rd, she wrote what? She says, how are you guys all doing? Been thinking of all of you, all of you a lot. Okay. And you know from your investigation, this is the time frame when the shooter's friend was taken out of the state. That is correct. Okay. In this conversation, November the 4th, that other individual writes what to Jennifer Crumbly? She writes, hi, Jen. We're doing okay. It was the hardest thing I've ever had to do. I worry about him constantly and miss him terribly. I know that he's where he needs to be to get better, though. Thanks so much for checking on us. I appreciate you and your family. She's referring to her son, uh, the shooter's friend, was only happy and relaxed with you guys. And in response? Jennifer responds with, please keep us updated. I know Ethan misses him. If you guys need anything at all, please don't hesitate to ask. And that was, again, in November of 2021 before the shooting. Correct, on the 4th, yes. Okay. Now I'm going to direct your attention to the days around the shooting and what you were able to obtain as far as the digital footprint of the Crumbly family. Okay. Right. Starting November 26, 2021, is that date significant to you? Yes, it is. Why is that? That was the day the gun was purchased. Okay. And we heard yesterday that the gun is in the murder weapon? Yes, sir. Okay. That was a 9mm Sig Sauer handgun? Yes, it was. Okay. That's been admitted in evidence, and we heard it was bought from a firearm store in Oxford. That's correct. Okay. I have no objection to this. Okay. This is just as an example of what information you can obtain from a search warrant on a Gmail account. That's correct. Okay. And so this is from James Crumbly's Gmail account, November 26, 2021, confirming that he was, in fact, at that firearm store uh, at 12.08 p.m. Correct. Okay. Now... We talked about uh, obtaining locations from somebody. This is uh, 107. We have no objection. 107 is Before we um, get into 107, <coughs> exhibit 417, it's a video. Uh, sir, in your analysis of the shooter's phone and Jennifer Crumbly's phone, social media accounts, you're up, you were able to obtain um, videos taken by the school shooter with that handgun, the murder weapon? That's correct. Okay. 
So 417, people move to admit, publish the jury. It's a video taken from November 26, 2021. And Your Honor, I, I'm sorry, I have to just take a look really quick. I, okay. We just jumped ahead with a, a couple. Yeah, it's 417. Yeah, let me just take a quick look, I'm sorry. No, it's already and actually, I don't have 417 um, in the exhibits that I was given. Can I see? Yeah. It wasn't on my hard drive, but I'm sorry. Okay, Your Honor, I have no way to play this, and I, didn't, I don't have this. Um, All these can I just have, it's, it's a very short video. It's not on our, I just need to see what the video is. Can we just unplug the computer and can you just show it to me really quick? Is, I, there, is there audio? No. Um, was it provided to the defense? Yes. It's. It was shown at the preliminary examination <coughs> as well. It, Your Honor, I'm sorry, it's not on the exhibits they gave me on the desk. So there's a million videos in this case and I have okay. no idea which one it is. Okay. Well, I probably have no objection. Can I just see what video it is? Sure. Uh, well, I guess I, I thought for a moment when he said it was played at the preliminary examination, it might it might refresh your recollection about what it was. But if you can um, take a quick look, that'd be great. I don't have a flash drive player on here, so can we just turn the screen off for one second and just take a quick look? Yeah. And I apologize. I, I no, it, no, it's okay. There's a, there's a lot of stuff. I I don't want to release the jury because their lunch is not made. I haven't made your lunch. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. <coughs> I'm having lobster. <laughs> okay, and so this is 417. 417. Okay. Can you just show me? We have no objection to this one. And I apologize. That's all right. I, sorry. Sorry. No, Thank I you. It. I get it. I'm not yeah, There's a lot of stuff. Okay, so 417 is admitted. Okay. May I judge? Sure. Thank you. Uh, this is what you obtained from the <coughs> shooter's phone, and it was captured 6.39 p.m. on November the 26, 2021? That's correct. Okay. So that video was taken the evening the firearm was purchased? Correct. And that is, in fact, the, the murder weapon, the six hour nine millimeter? Yes, sir. I have no objection to those. What number is it? 107 and 108, Judge. 107 was previously admitted, 108 is admitted. Thank you. Okay, now. Agent Brandon testified yesterday to, to much about the evidence regarding the firearm, so I'm going to move you ahead to November 27th, which is the next day, the day after the six hour was purchased. Okay. All right. So, all right, 107. Um, this is evidence obtained from um, James Crumbly's Gmail account, is that right? That's correct. Okay, so you were able to tell what James Crumbly was doing from 8 a.m. to 8.59 p.m. on November 27, 2021. Correct. Okay, and tell us what was he doing. Uh, he was delivering DoorDash. So these dots, these data points, are, are what? What are they signifying? Those are the GPS locations that were provided um, when the location services was turned on in, uh, from Google. So we know he was out of the house basically the whole day. Correct. Okay. Now, 108... We have uh, Jennifer Crumbly's um, Gmail data, data points, and from what time period? That's from 2.29 p.m. to 3.32 p.m. Okay, and this is exhibit 108. It shows she's out of the house from about 2.30 to 3.30. Is that right? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Now, the next day is Sunday, November the 28th, 2021. Did you get a feel for what um, Jennifer Crumbly was discussing 
based upon her, her Facebook messages, what your, her plan was doing on November the 28th, 2021? Yes. Okay. And in fact, you recovered um, chat history with an individual named Kira Pennick? That's correct. Okay. And did the course of this investigation, did you come to learn who that person was? Yes, I did. And who was that? She was the owner of the horse farm. Okay. That's the horse farm where Jennifer and James Crumley would board their horses? Correct. Okay. So she's going to testify later on in this trial, but you reviewed their Facebook chat history? Correct. Okay. So that's 109. People move from that 109. Um, Your Honor, can I just have one moment? This sure. is a... Um, it says it's a thread between your client and Kira Pinnock on November 28th. That's what the report says. Okay, and the exhibit that I received from the prosecution is 967 pages long. So I'm thinking that what I got is not... It's, not it's pages 930 to 933. We're not going to go through 1,000 pages. Well, no, I, I'm well, just... Let's do it. Okay, I'm sorry. So what, what pages are they admitting? As 930 page? to 933. Okay, 930 to... Okay, give me just a moment. I'm okay. sorry. I got the whole file. Like That's, It's on the exhibit list. With yeah, the, it, the exhibit list um, indicates this. This exhibit list is what I, what I got, got on Tuesday. I'm not sure when when it was um, shared with the defense if it was the same day or not. But I, the, it says pages 930 to 933 are the only ones they're seeking to highlight. I I know I'm just scrolling. Okay, it's, it's just taking me a little bit to scroll okay. through. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm trying to get to 900. It just takes a little bit to load because it's such a big file. Okay, so it's pages 901 to 930 to 933. Exactly sorry. what was written on the exhibit list. And I'm trying to get to the pages. The file they gave me is much larger than three pages. Okay. On every other exhibit, they have narrowed it down. And this one is much bigger. I just need a moment. Okay, you're good. You're good. The exhibit list says um, the pages. The third, the third. I, I know, but I can't pull it up fast enough because my computer is, I'm trying okay. to go as fast okay. as I can. Okay. Okay, I have no objection to this. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, 109 is in there. Thank you. And this is a portion of the exhibit list. Okay, so green is who? It's Jennifer. Okay, and what's she writing? Was his foot, his front swollen again? Okay, and then the response? That is from Kira Pennick. Right, I'm the same, I'm not sure, I'm not doing chores, but I'll ask my dad when I see him. Okay, so did you come to learn when Jennifer writes, was his foot swollen again? She's referring to one of her horses. Correct, yes. Okay. And Kira's response? If Billy keeps stocking up, I think you should have the vet out for him. Just want to make sure it isn't anything serious. And Billy's who? The horse. And Jennifer's response? He's got mid-fever. James is coming out in the morning to put some stuff on him and calling vet for antibiotics. And then she corrects with mud. Okay. Billy's one horse, and they have two horses at this point, right? Correct. Okay. And then what does Kira say? Kira, then, that's crazy. Never seen it react like that. Want me to just put stuff on it daily? I can. I didn't do chores this weekend, so don't know if it got down. Got done. So the last uh, message in this exhibit from Jennifer Crowley to the individual who boards those two horses is no November 28th, 2021. That's Sunday, 8.18 p.m., Sunday night. Correct. And she writes, yes, let's do Tuesday. I'll have James leave the mixture out there. I don't think he's sore from the ground. He's just fine lunging. Just need to keep moisture off his scratches and get him on antibiotics. Should be clear in a week. That's correct. And that's, again, in reference to one of our horses. That's correct. Okay. Now, did Jennifer go to the barn that day? Yes. When you say that day, when you were Yes, thank you, Judge. This is 110 and 11. No, Judge, you both. 110 and 111 are admitted. Thank you. 110, this is a, uh, from her Gmail search warrant return. We can tell that she's at the barn um, at noon on November 28th. 
That's correct. Okay, and she's back at home. This is Exhibit 111 at about 2 o'clock. Correct. All right. Now, moving on to Monday, November the 29th. That's the day before the shooting, right? That's correct. Okay. Now, what's the first thing that you see of importance to you as a forensic investigator from the day before the shooting that occurred on one of her devices? Uh, it was a web history search, or a web search. Okay. This is Exhibit 113. We have no objection. I just want to make sure, I'm sorry, 112 was admitted. No, 112 was, was not admitted. That's yeah, 112 was not admitted. Correct. Yes. Okay, or, okay, so 113, we have no objection. Thank no, you. Thank you. Okay, 113. Um, <coughs> this is a snippet from a Celebrate Extraction report of Jennifer Crumbly's web history. That's correct. Okay. So tell us, please, what was she researching November 29, 2021 at 3.05 in the morning? In the second column, you can see where it says research clinical depression treatment options. It was Yahoo search that was used. Okay. In the third column, you can see exactly that that's what was in the URL bar, the, the web address bar that you typed. And that's the day before the shooting in the early morning hours? At 3.05 a.m. Let's talk about the Facebook conversation between James and Jennifer from later that day, Monday the 29th. This is 114. I have no objection. 114 is admitted. Thank you. Okay. November the 29th, 2021, 8 a.m. Jennifer writes to James, are you at the barn? And then... About 40 minutes later, she sends a, a question mark. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. And then James responds to what? He responds with, starting with the question mark, working on Billy. Okay. So it appears, at least from this message thread, that he's at the barn with their horse, Billy. That's correct. And then he sent a picture? That's correct. Can you tell what that's up? It's uh, the horse's legs, it appears. Okay. And what does Jennifer respond to, to that picture? Do the fronts, too. Okay, and this is 9.21 a.m., what does Jennifer say? Jennifer asks, did you call the vet? And then what? Make sure you get back in between his heel balls. Okay, and James' response to that? He responds with, I did, and then fronts two. And that's at 9.34 a.m. on November the 29th. That's correct. At 9.35, what does James say? He texts, what exactly should I tell vet? Type out for me, leaving barn now. Okay. And then Jennifer responds, Billy looks to have scratches slash mud fever. He's starting to stock up on all fours and concerned about infection. He's not lame, sensitive to the touch, and they go down when he moves. Is there an antibiotic I can get him on? We just put desitin and antibacterial on his legs today. That's November 29th, 941 a.m., is that right? That's correct. Okay, and then she sends another a message to him? Correct. And what does she say? She says, was he stocked up this morning? And then James's response? James responds with, he was stocked up more in the back than in the front. In fact, the front didn't really look stocked up at all, so I launched them for a few minutes before I put the stuff on it. And it took the swelling down a little bit, but I got the cream all over, you know, in between his heel bulbs and stuff like that. I'll call the vet here in a minute. Okay. Now, sir, it's been a little tedious going through all of the messages regarding the horses. Give us an idea, because you're the one who actually extracted that information from Facebook and reviewed it. How often will they show concern over their horses? Quite often. Okay. Okay, and Jennifer's response, this is the same conversation, November 29th at 9.58 a.m.? She responds with, it made sense, LOL. Okay, and then James responds more about the horse, is that right? That's correct. Okay. And Jennifer responds to that message? Yes, she did. And that's at 10.15 a.m.? Correct. Okay. Now, this same day, same time period, did you uncover evidence that someone from Oxford High School left a uh, message for Jennifer Crumley? That Yes, correct. Okay. And in fact, that was um, at 
41 a.m. That's correct. Okay, so that was in the midst of the Facebook conversation between James and Jennifer about their horse. Correct. Okay. And were you able to obtain that voicemail from Jennifer Crumbly's phone records? Yes. Okay. People move to admit 115. No objection, Your Honor. 115. Thank you. Okay, that was the day before the shooting at 9.41 a.m. Correct. Okay. Did Jennifer Crumbly uh, access that voicemail? Eventually, yes. Okay, this is Exhibit 116. We have no, no objection. 116 Thank you, Judge. And according to your analysis, she accessed the voicemail at 11.49 a.m. That's correct. Okay. So that's still in the midst of the conversation she was having with James about their horse. Correct. Did you uncover evidence that um, Jennifer Crumbly texted her son about that voicemail? Yes. Okay. This is Exhibit 117. I have no objection. 117 is admitted. Okay. Now, owner, Green, this is Jennifer because it's from her phone. Is that right? Correct. Okay, and in fact, you were able to take the whole text message conversation that existed between James and... I'm sorry, between Jennifer Crumley and her son. Is that right. right? And if it were to be printed out, it would be over 200 pages or so. Is that right? Sounds about right, yes. Okay. So I'm going to show you portions from November 29th, and we'll refer back to this. So November 29th at 11.53 a.m., this is a few minutes after she listened to the voicemail, what did she write to her son? She said, seriously, two question marks, looking up bullets in school, question mark, question mark. And he writes back, what? And then, oh yeah? Correct. And then he wrote what? I already went to the office for that. It was in first hour. All I did was look up a certain caliber at the end of class because I was curious. It was on my phone. Okay, that's 11.53 a.m., November 29th? 11.54. 11.54, yes, And then what did he write? Completely harmless. Teachers just have no privacy. They said, I'm all good. Okay. And then the next message? The shooter continues, I understood why. I, they talked to me, and they said, they, that, is, I'm good. Okay, and then he wrote, this is nothing I should get in trouble. This is nothing I should get in trouble about. Correct. He wrote that to the defendant at 11.55 a.m. That's correct. And what was her response to that? You're not, they left me a voicemail with the hand over face emoji twice. Okay. And then, then what did she say? She then says, did you at least show them a pic of your new gun? So she wrote at 12.14 p.m., did you at least show them a pic of your new gun? Correct. And his response? No, I didn't show them the pic, my God. And then what? I only told them I went to the range with you on Saturday. It was, I only told them I went to the range with you on Saturday. Correct. Okay. And then what did he say? It was a harmless act. Go ahead. I have this bullet cartridge in my room that I didn't, what kind of bullet it was, and it said it was a 22. 
So at the end of first hour, I just looked up different types of 22 bullets. And I guess the teachers can't get their eyes off my screen, SMH. And then what did Jennifer respond to that? She responds with, LOL, I'm period, not mad. You're not, you have to learn, not period, to period, get caught, period. And his response to that? IK or I know, LOL. And then? Uh, two laughing emojis. And then he responds with, I just didn't want something this little to get me in trouble because, well, I didn't want to get in trouble, LOL. Okay, and then what do you write? The shooter says, I want to hear the voicemail when I get home, though. Also, I never try to hide me looking up the bullet. I just didn't think a teacher would be staring at my phone. And then what did she say to the defendant? She says, okay, I saved it. Sir, did you find evidence that Jennifer discussed this incident with her husband, James, that day? Yes. <coughs> Thank you. No objection to 118. 118 is uh, This is a uh, Facebook message between James and Jennifer Crumbly? Correct. Okay. And then Jennifer's now in blue? Correct, yes. Okay. And what did she write? She uh, writes, Ethan, tell you what happened today. And his response? James' response was, yeah. And correct me if I'm wrong, but there's no further discussion between the two of them on Facebook Messenger. No, there is not. Now, sir, I want to take you back to the day of the shooting, November the 30th, 2021. And what we'll do is go step by step with what you were able to discern from your available sources of information. Okay. All right. Um, Exhibit 119. Well, first of all, you were, we already talked about how you, you were the individual who went through all the surveillance video. Correct. And it was your, your responsibility to, to put together that timeline? Correct. Okay. And did you also put together the timeline when the school shooter was dropped off at school? Yes. Okay. And he was dropped off at 7.46 a.m. on November the 30th? That's correct. Okay. Any objection to this? No objection. 119. Is Do you see him being dropped off? Yes. It's him with the gray hoodie and had a black t-shirt on. Right there? Correct. Okay. Judge, I'm looking at the time. This might be a good time to break for lunch, given the fact that we're starting to go through the evidence from the day of the shooting. If your lunch is ready. Yeah. Hey, well, that's a good point. Just because this is now a whole, it's a transition. Oh, okay. Your lunch is here, so um, I want to let you know that because you're on the stand right now, you're not allowed to discuss your testimony with anyone until you're finished testifying, okay? Thanks. Oh, I'm sorry, ma'am. I apologize. I'm sorry. I apologize. I yes, ma'am. No, you're, you're, I'm okay. awake. I'm sorry. All right. I, I was thinking. We're in, the, we're in the middle. Don't do that. We're in the middle of your uh, testimony, so you can't discuss your testimony. Absolutely. With you. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Yes, ma Okay. Lunch. You can eat lunch. Okay. Okay. All right. So you can step down. All right. So uh, if we can get the third one further down, that's another time, right? Um, so the lunch is ready and then we go. Okay. I thought you were dismissed in the first one. I'm sorry. No, it's all right. It's all right. I, I'd like the jury to know what I'm telling you that, so yes. you understand that. Um, okay, we can take her down. There's the third there, right? Okay, she can go down. Um, so, quarter to one, right? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Thank you.
going to now direct your attention to Exhibit 119. We spent a lot of time. Oh, I'm sorry, Judge. Uh, just for the record, the jury knows we have paralegal Mary Nellett at table to help with the exhibits. Okay. Because once again, he does not trust me with the good. This is true. This is true. Um, Sir, we spent some time talking about the background of uh, the Crumbly House. So we're going to talk now about November the 30th, 2021. You stated that you were able to put together sort of a digital footprint from that day. Correct. Okay. So Exhibit 119, which, ha which has been admitted, this is the Sur Oxford High School surveillance video from when the defendant's son was dropped off. Is that right? Yes, sir. Determined that he was dropped off by James Crumbly at 7:46 a.m. That's correct. Okay. We will determine the time that Jennifer Crumbly got to her place of employment that day. Uh, a little after nine in the morning. It's exhibit 120. We have no objection to that. Thank you. Sir, this is a screenshot from surveillance footage of her employer from November the 30th, 2021. And that's Jennifer Crumbly on November 30th, 2021, entering that building at 9.04 a.m.? Correct. Okay. <clears throat> now, shortly after she arrived, did she receive a phone call from the school? Yes, she did. Exhibit 20, I'm sorry, 121. We have no objection. And this is a snippet from her phone log, would that be correct? That's correct. Okay, so November the 30th, 2021 at 9.24 a.m. was a missed phone call, and that's from Oxford High School. That's correct. Okay, and she called the school back at 9.27 a.m., is that right? That's correct. And they had a 5-minute and 43-second conversation? Correct. Okay. Now, did she receive a text shortly after that phone call? Yes. Right. This is Exhibit 122 and 123. Mm -hmm. I have no objection to 122 or 123. 122 and 123. So 122. This is the text message found on her phone from an individual. It ended up being her son's school counselor at Oxford. <coughs> Correct. Okay. And this is a picture of what we'll call an altered math worksheet at 9.31 a.m. Correct. All right. And if you were to, to click on that link, this would come. Correct. Okay. And then she also received an email with the original math worksheet. That's correct. All right. This is Exhibit 124. No objection. And this email. Thank you. That was shortly thereafter. And the image in the email was in fact Exhibit 74, which was the math worksheet that her son created on November the 30th. Correct. Okay. So she had this information about 9.30 in the morning on November the 30th. Correct. Okay. Did Jennifer contact James right after that? Yes, she did. Exhibit 125. No objection. 125 to two. So, this is the Facebook message chat, the one that was deleted from Jennifer's phone. Blue is Jennifer Crumbly, is that correct? That is correct. And green will be James Crumbly. That's correct. Okay. So, at 9.33 a.m., what did Jennifer write to James? Call now, with now in all caps, emergency. And then she texted again, less than two minutes later, emergency. Okay. And she sent these two pictures, both the original and the... Altered worksheet to James? That's correct. And this is at 9.38 a.m.? Correct. What was James' response at 9.44? James responded with, my God, WTF. What uh, is it? What WTF, what the fuck? Okay. Excuse me. Uh, then responds, vet not here yet. 
It's McElmurray for Kira's horse still waiting on vet. And we already talked about that, that they were concerned over one of their horse's um, medical issues. Correct. Okay. And what was Jennifer's response at 9.50? She responded, he said he was distraught about last night. And James's response to that? We talked about it this morning. And, and then? Then he was asked her, you talked to him? Okay. And that's 9.51. And what was Jennifer's response? Uh, six minutes later, she texted, can you call? Did Jennifer leave her work and head to the school? Yes, she did. Okay. Did she, did Jennifer Crumbly also text... This picture, Exhibit 74, to anybody else at that time? Yes, she did. Okay. So this is Exhibit 126. We have no objection. Now, she sent this picture, this text, to Andrew Smith at 10.05 a.m. Correct. Okay. Did you learn who Andrew Smith was? Yes, I did. And that was her boss? Yes, it was. Okay. And what did she text with the caption on this picture? She said, I have to go to my kid's school. Counselor just called, and this is what I'm dealing with. I'll be back 1130 to 12 at the latest. And did she leave her employment? Yes, she did. Okay. This is 127. Uh, no objection. Okay, this is her leaving at 10.06? Yes. You want to go back to Exhibit 125 briefly? Skip over it. She wrote, can you call at 9.57? And then what did she write? She wrote, heading to a school, I'm very concerned. Okay. So at 10.04, she wrote, heading to a school, and I'm very concerned. At 10.05, she sent that picture right here to Mr. Smith? Correct. At 10.06, she walked out the door to the building? Correct. Okay. Did James and Jennifer Crumbly have a phone conversation at this point? Yes, they did. Okay. This is 1.28. No objection. And sir, this is a, a snippet from the uh, call log found on Jennifer Crumbly's cell phone. Is that right? Yes, it is. Okay. So, well, first she got a phone call from the school. This is um, a phone call to the school counselor at 10.07 a.m.? That's correct. That's a 40-second call? That's correct. Okay. I'm sorry, that was Exhibit 121, not 128. I'm, I'm sorry, you said 121? It's 121. 121. Okay, and Your Honor, part of the call. I, <laughs> I would just ask that the witness answer questions instead of the prosecutor stating all the, essentially all the information as he goes along. Okay, okay so I guess it's the objections leading. Leading. Okay. I'll rephrase. All right. <laughs> No objection. Okay. Did James and Jennifer have a phone conversation after this? Yes, they did. Okay. Well, first, this is part of Exhibit 125. What time is this? This is at 10:12. Okay. And then what did she write? Headed to a school. Okay. And here's Exhibit 128 from James Crumley's call log. What is this? It's a call to Jennifer at 10:29 a.m. So at 1029 a.m., they have a seven minute and 16 second phone conversation. That's correct. Did both James and Jennifer Crumley arrive at the Oxford High School? Yes, they did. Okay. And um, approximately what time did they arrive? It was around 10 1020, somewhere around there, I believe. Okay. If, if I showed you a timeline that indicated 1037 arrival, would that sound right? Yes, I apologize. Yes. That's fine. Right. Yes. Now, we had discussed this portion of the case at a previous hearing, and you had indicated they had arrived in one car and left in one car. Did you find that to be accurate? No, I, it was inaccurate. 
Okay, so tell me what, what happened. It was so the video system that they have only starts recording when there's enough motion to save space on the system. So they're, they're, they were too far away from the camera to pick up. When, when I initially saw them, all of a sudden they just appeared in front of one of the cars. So I assumed that they had come together. Okay. And <clears throat> when did you come to find out? That they had drove separately. Okay. So Exhibit 129 is, is a portion of the Oxford High School surveillance video that depicts their arrival and the period of time they were inside for that meeting with the counselor. Is that right? Yes, correct. Okay. People moved them at 129. I have no objection, but I'm I'm just wondering if that if the actual video that's the correct that's the exhibit. Okay, no objection. Thank you. So there's a time stamp at the bottom. I want to make sure we see this. 10:36 a.m. and this is November 30th, 2021. That's correct. Let us know, please, when you see either the defendant or her husband. The one vehicle is already backed in, and then there they are walking up. He is the defendant and her husband? Yes. In the magnified area? Correct, yes. What's this portion of the video depicts? Uh, them coming into the school. Well, what area of the school? Uh, the front by where the offices are. Okay. This is 10.39 a.m.? Correct. And what portion of the school is this? Uh, looks like uh, the front office of the school. This time right here, that's um, a broken clock, correct? It is correct. It never okay. changes. So this is 10.40 a.m.? Correct. In the counseling office. I'm sorry? They're in the counseling office. Thank sorry. You. This person was you greeted them. Yes. Who's that? Sean Hopkins. Okay. He's the counselor at the Oxford High School. That's correct. Or one of the counselors. One say. of the counselors. Yes. The time skips a little bit. This is now 10:52 a.m. What do you see in this portion? That's the shooter coming out of the uh, Mr. Hopkins' with, office with the red backpack. Correct. So they walked in at 10:41, and the shooter walked out at 10:52. Correct. Ten fifty three. Who do you see? That's James and Jennifer Crumbly coming out of the Mr. Hopkins office. Now there was something in his hand here. What is that? If you can tell. I wasn't able to tell what that is. Okay. Jennifer Crumbly has a piece of paper in her hand? Yes, she does. Did she have that walking into the counselor's office? No, she did not. Okay. And then right there, she handed that piece of paper to James Crumbly? Correct.
is 10.54 and almost 10.55 a.m.? Correct. Okay. Do you see James and Jennifer Crumbly at the top of the screen? Yes, the yeah, they're at the top of the screen coming okay. from the school. Thank you. What are we seeing in this scene right here? Uh, the one, one of their vehicles is leaving right there, the black one. Third row on the far right, the other car should be leaving shortly now. Okay. One of the crumbly vehicles? Yes, it is. All right. And this is 1057, about 1058? Correct. Okay. So we saw them walk in at 1041 to the, the office. Their son left at 1052. Correct. Right? <coughs> and then we saw them leave the parking lot here at 1057, 1058. That's correct. How long toll, if you know, were they in the counselor's office? Uh, it was about 12 minutes. What's the first thing that Jennifer Crumley did on her phone or social media after that meeting? Uh, she sent a uh, message to uh, Kira Bennett. Okay. This is 1.30. We have no objection. So this is a screenshot. Correct. Is that right? Okay. And these were taken from Kira Penick's phone. That's correct. Okay. So the icon there, the picture on the horse, this is Jennifer Crumbly's words, correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And what does she write at 10.58 a.m.? Okay, I'll bring some out later. Just had to get my son's school, go to my son's school, and meet his counselor. Shit day. And then Kira's response? Oh, man, everything okay? Do you still want to do lesson tonight. And then what did Jennifer respond to that? Yeah, I still plan to do, I still plan on doing the lesson. Everything's okay. He's just having a hard time after losing Tank, his friend going away to a treatment facility, and who knows what else. But he was caught drawing his, this on his math assignment today. And then this is Exhibit 74, the math drawing that she was sent? Correct. And then what did uh, Jennifer write in this post, in this message? As long as I can get out there early enough because I had to leave work for an hour and I have a meeting in Southfield at 3, but I should be done with that by 4. I plan on being there, plus the vet said it's better for him to move around and keep it, cir to keep it circulation going while he's dealing with mud fever. Good times. She's talking about her horse, right? Correct. Okay. And when she said, I had to leave work for an hour, she's talking about when the school called her to, for that meeting. That's correct. And what was the response at 1.26 a.m.? She's... Oh, I'm sorry. If you can read that. It's, uh, Kira responded with, OMG, oh my God, he needs some horse therapy. I bet he... And it cuts off. Okay, that's fine. The rest of these will be in through Kira later on. Um, what's the first thing that James does when he leaves the meeting? Uh, starts door dashing. This is 131. No objection. 131. So what are we looking at right here? That was a response from uh, a search warrant served to DoorDash. Okay. So we have not just the 30th, but we also have the 29th. And I'm going to direct you to the first DoorDash. <coughs> November 30th, 21, at 11 a.m. Is that right? That Correct. That's when he checks in. Okay. So that was about four minutes or so, three minutes after he left the parking lot? That's correct. And Jennifer's text to Kira was about two minutes after she left the parking lot? That's correct. Did Jennifer go back to work? Yes, she did. All right. Here's 132. I'm sorry, I was just trying to write fast. No objection. 132. Thank you. 
and this is what? Her re-entering her uh, place of employment at 11.24 a.m. Okay. And that's November 30th? Correct. Going back to exhibit 130, first, what's the next thing she does either on her phone or social media accounts after 1124? I'm sorry. If you recall, what's the first thing that she does after 1124 on either her phone or social media account? I don't recall. Well, that's sorry. Fine. We have we have exhibit 130 already admitted. So 1126 a.m. Correct. Okay. So we read you read the very top line of of that OMG needs horse therapy. Correct. This is at 11.26 a.m., so she received this two minutes after she walked in the door at her employment? Correct, yes. Okay, thank you. Go ahead and read that. It says, OMG, he needs some horse therapy. I bet he would love Mo. Whatever works for you, just let me know. I only have Bella's lesson tonight at 5.30, so any time after her lesson is fine. And, and what did Jennifer Crumbly write back? Jennifer responds with, okay. Yeah, well, he'll be coming with me tonight. James is working. He cannot. He can't be left alone. From the context of this conversation, did you take it that he was referring to her son? Yes, correct. And what did Kira write in response? Does he want to ride? Okay. And her response? Uh, Jennifer responded, I don't know. Maybe brush a small horse so he's not intimidated, LOL. And then Kira? Kira responds with, Mo would be perfect. And then Jennifer responds with, okay. Okay. Here then goes on to say, make it a family event. Coming out to the barn, really though, I've seen some amazing things done with horses, with kids. Thank you. Now, did Jennifer Crumbly text her son after that school meeting? Yes, she did. Okay. This is 133. I'm sorry. Just, uh, sorry. I have no objection. I'm sorry. Thank you. Now, this is the same text thread that we referred to earlier, found on Jennifer Crumbly's phone between, uh, well, this is on, on uh, the shooter's phone. No, I'm sorry. Jennifer Crumbly's phone. Yes. The entire text thread. Correct, yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, green is Jennifer Crumbly, blue is her son. Correct. Okay. Um, tell us what she wrote to him at 12.21 p.m. on November the 30th. She said, she asked, you okay? And then he responds shortly after that, yeah, I just got back from lunch. Okay, and her, what did she say? About 60 minutes later, she says, you know you can talk to us and we won't judge. Okay. And his response to that at 12.42 p.m.? At 12.42 he says, I care, I know, thank you, I'm sorry for that, I love you. Now, we'll introduce the rest of the thread. Did she respond to that? Not immediately, no. When did she respond to it? After the shooting started. After the shooting was made public? Yes. How many minutes later, if you know? Over a half an hour. Now, you're the investigator who pulled the footage. You reviewed, you reviewed the footage, and you know the timeline of the shooting, the day of the event. Correct. Okay. And so at 12.42 p.m., you know that was a few minutes before the shooter went into the boys' bathroom outside of 258, classroom 258, and began to load his firearm. That's correct. And he emerged at 12, 12.51 p.m. That's correct. Now, what's the first relevant event in either James or Jennifer's phone or email or social media accounts after 12.42 p.m.? Uh, an alert was sent to, an email was sent to James's phone. From the high school. This is 134. No objection. Thank you. This is uh, an email from Oxford Community School sent to James Crumbly's email address at 1.09 p.m. Correct. And that's, to your knowledge, the active shooter alert that went out to all parents in the district? That's correct. Mm -hmm. Now, when James received this, he was still making DoorDash deliveries? Yes, he was. Okay. Were you able to pull uh, location history from his device? From, yes, correct. Okay. Yes. This is 113. Oh, sorry, 136. No objection. 
This is 135 or 136. 136, Judge. We, missed, we skipped 135. No, oh, wait. Judge. I, yeah, I have no objection to 136. 136. And then, yeah. are you going to do it? No, we're skipping 136. You're skipping. Okay. Right. Sorry, I'm just trying to keep my numbers straight. 136 is okay. Thank you, Judge. So this is location data from his email, the email that he received, the active, active shooter alert. Correct. November 30th, 2021. And this is at what time? This is at 1.13 p.m. Okay. Where is this? This is at the Meyer. It's in, uh, he's in the parking lot of the Meyer. Okay, and that's that's the Meyer off of Ray Road. Yeah, it's the one that I responded to. Yes. Okay, so that was the reunification location for all parents. Correct. Okay. Did he stay there? No, he did not. Okay. How long was he there? I think just a matter of minutes. But did he call Jennifer? Yes, he did. Exhibit 137. No objection. 137 This is a portion of the phone call. James Crumbly's cell phone download. November 30, 2021 at 1 15 p.m. He called Jennifer Crumbly. That's correct. Okay. And that was how long phone call? Uh, less, just less than a minute. Okay. And based upon your analysis of his GPS locations, where was he at when he made the phone call? He was still in the Meyer lot, I believe. Still in the Meyer. Did you find out that um, Jennifer Crumley left her work around that time? Yes, she did. Okay. Exhibit 138 is a surveillance video of Jennifer Crumley leaving work. Objection? No objection. So this is 1.18 p.m.? Yes, it is. Okay, so this is act after the active shooter alert went out at 1.09 and after she was on the phone with her husband. Correct. Did it appear from your analysis that Jennifer and James Crumley spoke on the phone after she left work? Yes, she did. 139. I, I apologize, just really quick. 138 is was the video we just saw. 139, we have no objection to. 139 is admitted. And, okay, and both were admitted, right? Yes. Okay, thank you. It's the call log off of James Crumley's phone. November 30th, 2021, 119 p.m. And how long did they speak for? They spoke for a little over 10 minutes. Okay, when I say that, I should be clear. James and Jennifer. Thank you. Okay. Could you tell that while she was on the phone with James Crumbly, did she send any messages? Yes, she did. Okay. Do you recall who she sent a message to? Uh, I believe it was Andy Smith she sent a message to. Do you know who else she sent a message to? I, I don't recall. I know did she message her son? Yes, she did. I apologize. Yes, yes. This is 140. This is location data. No objection. Thank you. 140. This is GPS location data for James Crumley. This is 1:20 p.m. Correct. Okay, November the 30th, and this is at their home, at 112 East in Oxford. On East Street, yes. Okay. So just just to back up, just to make sure we're clear, James Crumley received the active alert email at 1:09. Correct. He called. Jennifer Crumley at 115 while he was at the Meyer parking lot? Correct. And he leaves the Meyer parking lot and he's home at least 120 p.m.? Correct. Okay. And they had a 10-minute phone call that began at 119 p.m. that indicates to you that they're still on the phone? Yes. Okay. This is 141. No objection. Okay, so about this time of the day, could you tell if Jennifer um, was on the move? Yes, she was. Okay, so this is what time? This is at 1.20 p.m. Okay, and this is at her location of her employment, correct? Yeah, Telegraph at Square Lake, okay. south of here. No 
No objection. So you said that while she was on the phone with her husband, she texted her son? Yes, she did. This is 142. Okay, I'm sorry. Hang on. Let me just pull it up real quick. I'm so sorry. Okay, sorry. Thank you. Sorry, thank you. November 30, 2021, at 18 p.m., did she respond to the message that he sent her at 1242? Yes. What did she write? She said, I love you too. Okay. Then, then it says, uh, immediately after that, you okay? Then four minutes later, she says, Ethan, don't do it. That was at 1.22 p.m.? Yes, it was. That was after James Crumbly was at their home in 112 East in Oxford? That's correct. That's while she was on the phone with him? Correct. You said she sent a message to her boss, Mr. Smith? Yes, she did. We'll go back to exhibit 126. What did she write him at 123 p.m.? 123, she texts, the gun is gone, and so are the bullets. And then what did he respond? He responds with, I'm praying everything is okay. And Jennifer says, OMG, or oh my God, Andy, he's going to kill himself. He must be the shooter. So that's right. A minute after she wrote to her son, don't do it. Correct. And that's while she's on the phone with her husband. That's correct. Did you come to find out that James Crumley called 911 that day? Yes, he did. Was that at 122 or 120, or was it later? It was later. Okay. And was it before or after they had these, this text message conversation? It's after. It's a phone call. After. Okay. So, in fact, did you find that James Crumley called 911 at 134 p.m.? That's correct. Exhibit 143. It's the actual call. No, ah, no objection. Thank you. 143 is not it. So just so council knows, it's all listed in the exhibit list. It says 911 call. Mm -hmm. it, it does, but I'm like, there's one of me. I'm going as fast as I can. Okay. I'm trying. Yeah, that's right. Exhibit okay. 143. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 Sir, we saw the location data that James Crumley left the Meyer on Ray Road at 117, and he was home by at least 120. That's correct. Okay. What's the relative distance between the Crumley household and Oxford High School? 
less than a mile. Okay. Now, after this phone call was made, did, did you learn that James and Jennifer arrived at the Oakland County Sheriff's Office substation in Oxford? Yes, I did. No objection. Well, is this 144? 140, 144, yes. Okay, 144 is So this is a call log. James Crimley's phone call. Correct. Are you aware whose uh, number that is, number 17? Yeah, it, actually it's one of the sergeants in uh, Special Investigation, Sergeant Joe Bryan. Okay, so... So this is after the shooter is taken into custody? Correct. Okay, so you know that he was taken into custody right about 1 p.m. on November the 30th? Yes, he was. Okay, and this is 1.50 p.m.? Correct. Okay, so Sergeant Bryan learned who the shooter's parents are and he made a phone call to James Crumbly? Correct. And shortly after this, did James and Jennifer Crumbly both go to the substation to meet with police? Yes, they did. No objection. No objection to 145 or 146. 145 and 146 are Just quickly, this is the verify. They were, in fact, at the sheriff's office at 148, both James and Jennifer Crumlin. Is that right? Correct. I'm sorry, yes. So they're at the sheriff's office at 158. Did you come to learn when they went back home? Uh, it was about a half an hour after, or less. This is 148. Okay, no objection. So you're able to. Sorry, 147 and 148. Thank you. So on Jennifer's phone, you can tell that she's at home by 2:30. Correct. On November 30th. Okay. And same with James. That's correct. Okay. So this is after they were they went to the sheriff's office and their son was in custody and then they went back home. Correct. Okay. Now, sir, did you have the opportunity in the course of your investigation to review what we have referred to as the burner phones as well as the replacement phones? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, I'm going to move ahead to December the 4th, 2021. Are you aware that they were arrested in the early morning hours of December the 4th, 2021? Yes, I am. Okay. This is 149 and 150. We have no objections, so 149 or 150. 149 and 150. So I'm showing you 150. May I approach with 149? Sure. Sir, this is... Uh, why don't you tell me what that is? Uh, this is a, a report from uh, from Celebrate from a, from a phone. Okay. And that's from her, what we call burner phone? Correct. Okay. And up on the screen, 150 indicates that she had sent an alarm on her burner Governor, phone. I would just ask if the witness answer the questions. Leaving. That's fine. Just stay. That's fine. What is that, Sean? Uh, this is a, it's a th there's a thumbnail of what is seen on the right side of the screen there, um, of the alarms being set at 6:30 on Saturday morning and 6:45 Saturday morning. And that's December the 4th, 2021. Yes, correct. Okay. Now, did you find evidence on the replacement phone, which is the phone that was ported with their original numbers? that they had attempted a two-factor authentication for social media accounts? Yes, they did. Okay. Now, we had talked at the very beginning of your testimony about deleted content and your ability to recover deleted content. Do you remember right. that? Yep. Okay. Did you find, were you able to uncover some deleted content in this particular case? Yes. Okay. And we've talked about the Facebook message chat between James and Jennifer Crumley. Correct. And you've already indicated that that chat was deleted from Jennifer Crumley's phone. That's correct. Okay. Now, 
Were you able to obtain a Facebook thread between Jennifer Crumbly, Crumbly and someone named Brian Malash? Yes. Okay. And was that through a Facebook search warrant? Yes. And did you uncover any messages before December the 1st of 2021? No. So if you were to learn that they had communicated on a regular basis through the Facebook Messenger chat, but you couldn't recover it, what would that indicate to you? That it was deleted from the phone. Uh, but on both ends, if you couldn't yes, recover correct. it from the server. Correct. Okay. Now, going through the evidence that you were able to uncover from Facebook itself, could you tell that some messages were selectively deleted? Yes. Okay. Exhibit 151. This is yeah. Okay, no objection. So this is portion of what she recovered from the Jennifer Crumbly and Brian Malash Facebook chat. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. So what are we looking at here? Uh, the first message is uh, an automated one sent from Facebook to the device, you unsent the message. Okay, and what's the next? The next one says, from Jennifer, we're on the run again, helicopters, not sure where to, I'll message you. And when were these, when was this message sent? Uh, you can see it says plus zero for UTC, so you have to subtract five from the actual time that's displayed there, from there. Um, so that would have been 7.31 in the morning. And what day was that? That was on December 12th, or December 2nd, I'm sorry. So that was, the shooting was November 30th, that was a Tuesday, Wednesday was December the 1st, this was the morning of December the 2nd. Correct. And did this indicate to you that they were deleted by Jennifer Crumbly? Yes, correct. How can you tell that? The message, the automated response sent from uh, Facebook saying you want to send a message. Also 151, what time and day is this? This is... Uh, well, it's 7 p.m. Uh, UTC, which is minus five hours, so it's 2 p.m. on December 2nd. Okay, that's Thursday, December 2nd. And Correct. what did she delete from her phone? What message? She uh, had sent him, we're fucked. Did she delete that? Yes, she did. Go back to exhibit 126. Were you able to tell that Jennifer Crumbly deleted some messages she sent to Andrew Smith? That's correct, yes. And how are you be able to, to tell that? Because of um, the screenshots that were obtained from Andrew Smith don't match what was obtained from her okay. device. This is exhibit 151. No objection. Okay, so before we get to 151, which is the um, well, extraction. Um, that 151 is already here. Yes, thank you, Jeff. Before we, we show that on the screen, 126 here, these are the screenshots found from Andrew Smith's actual phone. That's correct. Okay. So at 10.05 a.m., this is Jennifer writing this and sending this picture, correct? Correct. Okay. And then we just gone through this. At 1.23, she wrote, the gun is gone and so are the bullets? Correct. Okay. And then what did she write after that? I'm praying everything is okay. That's what Andrew said. That's what Andrew said, yeah. Then she responds, uh, OMG. Oh my God, Andy is going to kill himself. He must be the shooter. And then what? I need a lawyer at the substation with police. Ethan did it. Okay. And then what did she write him at 3.39 p.m. the next day? Or later that day? Later that day. Um, I need my job. Please don't judge me for what my son did. And that was just a few hours after the shooting started, correct? Correct. Okay. And then what did he write in response and what time? At, at 5.47 p.m., he responded with, I can't even begin to understand what you're going through. I'm praying for you. I asked Carolyn to text you some attorney recommendations. And then she responds with, they're taking my cell phone. Taking my cell phone, okay. Here's 151, and the top message is what? The one uh, where she says, I need my job. Please don't judge me for what my son did. Okay, so that's on these screenshots, so we know that wasn't deleted. Correct. Okay. Now, what about this message here? I can't even begin to understand what you're going through. I'm praying for you. I asked Carolyn to text you some attorney recommendations. Okay. And then we also have this final message there, taking my cell phone. Correct. Okay. 
But in the entire cell bright extraction from the text message thread between James, I'm sorry, between Jennifer Crumbly and Andrew Smith on her phone, there were no other messages, correct? Correct. So that means anything before that message, she deleted. That's correct. Okay. So look, the only thing I need my job, please don't judge me for what my son did, that was 3.39 p.m. So the gun is gone and so are the bullets. It has been deleted. OMG, Andy is going to kill himself. He must be the shooter. That was deleted. I need a lawyer at a substation with police. That was deleted. The picture she sent at one at 10.05 a.m. was deleted, as was the gun is gone and so are the bullets at 1.23. That's correct. So I'm going to turn now to the Facebook messages between Kira Pennick and Jennifer Crumbly, specifically comparing what was found on Jennifer's phone with what was found from the Facebook search warrant uh, from that particular chat. Okay. All right. Okay, do we do something with 152? We have no objection to admitting. This was 152, Judge. We admitted this one. Okay, you don't have any objection. But 152 is in there. No objection, right. Okay. No, I'm sorry. What was it? 153, 153. No objection. Okay. Sorry. So, um, 153 and 154? Correct. 153 and 154. Thank you, Judge. Now, first, I'm going to show you 153, which was the messages left on Jennifer Crumbly's phone. And I'm just going to show you the top portion of what is the cell right extraction report. So tell us what we're looking at here. We're looking at the participants involved, one of them being Kira Pennick, the other one being Jennifer Crumbly. Um, at the very bottom of the screen, you see the conversation is the messages of 26. Okay. And that's not 26 messages that you selected. That's all that's remaining on her phone. That's correct. Okay. And 154 is what? That's the, you can see at the top extraction report, uh, Facebook, warrant, Facebook warrant return from both um, Kira and Jennifer. And it says instant messages 4,047. Okay, so that would indicate that, that everything other than those 26 messages remaining were deleted by Jennifer Crumley. Correct. And one moment, you're on. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I want to go back to, I want to just start, um, you've been obviously involved in this case since the 30th of November 2021, correct? Correct. And since that time, you have collected and looked at an abundance of evidence related to the Crumbleys, the shooter, the shooting, everything, correct? Correct. Um, and you, when you were testifying earlier, you testified that at a previous hearing, um, you had testified about the parents when they first went into Oxford High School, correct? Correct. And on that day, you had reviewed many, many materials prior to coming to court. Correct. And that hearing was a preliminary examination, which is a hearing that's before a trial, correct? Correct. And at that <coughs> hearing, you did the best job you could in terms of explaining, answering questions. Correct. You were truthful on that day. Absolutely. As you're being today. Yes. And we can agree that you made a mistake about Mr. and Mrs. Crumbly arriving in the vehicle together at the school. Because of the video, how it jumped, yes. Okay, an honest mistake. Correct. And it's fair to say that when you don't have 
when you didn't have more information, you made an assumption that they had been in the same vehicle together, correct? I, correct. I didn't know how many cars they had at the time. You see them walk into the school together, but you couldn't see before that. Correct. And that's why you testified, honestly, you thought they had arrived together, but it was incorrect. Correct. And so you would agree with me that the more information you have about any topic, and the less guessing, the more accurate the information will be that you give on this witness stand, correct? I wasn't guessing before. I didn't know how many cars they had. I just saw them appear in front of the car. Right. So when you testified and said they arrived in the same car, that was incorrect. Correct. And I'm saying that had you had more information about seeing the vehicles pull up or seeing each one get out of separate cars, your testimony would have been different, correct? It would have been included in the video, correct. And so my point is you do the best job you can with the information you have. Yes, ma'am. But you're certainly not someone who can who can go back in time and see and know every detail of every single thing that's happened, correct? Not, not every single thing. You could put together a good timeline with all the information that you gather, yes. And it's fair to say for this jury, you have put together as detailed of a timeline as you can about all of the events before November 30th through 1130th and beyond 1130th, correct? That's correct. And when you are doing that, you are taking data from cell phones and other investigators, from surveillance, from all these different materials that are a part of the investigation in this case. Correct. And it's possible that at times when you answer a question, you may not, you may not be accurate, but you're not sitting here intentionally trying to lie, correct? It's absolutely correct. Okay. I'm going to go back through the, um, the investigation, um, that you did. It's fair to say, and I think you testified, you started obviously on November 30th of 2021, correct? When the investigation started? Yes. Yes. Okay. And can you give the jury an idea of how much time it takes to get certain evidence or kind of what it looked like going forward from 1130 when you receive various pieces of information. So on 1130, let's talk about what you saw that day. You obviously saw the surveillance camera from the school, correct? Yes, correct. Okay. On that day, did you have the surveillance camera from Jennifer's office? That came afterwards. Okay. That came down the road. Yes. At that time, did you have the text messages between Jennifer Crumbly and James Crumbly? That came out. That, no, that would have been afterwards. Okay, when did that come? It would have been within within a week, two weeks of, of that. We would have had to like explain the process of dump, uh, getting the data from a phone. <coughs> Depending on how much data there is, it could take a while, and then to sift through all of it. So it could be anywhere from a couple of days to a couple of weeks to, to get everything that you're looking for. And in terms of the investigation, there were materials you had on the 30th, obviously. Correct. There were materials you received in the days following the 30th, correct? Correct, correct. And there were some materials that law enforcement didn't have for weeks and months that became a part of this investigation. Is that a fair statement? That's correct. And as more and more information became available, you would turn it over to the prosecutor's office? Correct. And and then you would assume that they would turn the evidence over, over to the defense for it to be used in, in court by all parties and the, and the judge? Yeah, I, 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 I knew my job. I don't know what they're, yeah. I, 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 they have to give that up. Yes, I understand that. Okay. So at the time on the 30th, it's fair to say all of the evidence that you have in this investigation, I'm sorry, not on the 30th. The 30th was the day of the shooting, and Mrs. Crumbly was arrested 
overnight between December 3rd and December 4th, correct? Correct. And it would be fair to say that between <coughs> November 30th and December 3rd, your office and team and all law enforcement were working as hard as they could to collect information um, and collect <coughs> evidence, correct? Correct. While you were working as fast as you could, there were a number of materials that you did not see until <coughs> after Jennifer Crumbly was arrested. Well, just because of the sheer volume of information that we were pulling together at the time, yeah, I mean, it took a while to go through it. And when you're looking at all of the information about Jennifer Crumbly in this investigation, much of what you're doing is looking back in time in hindsight. In hindsight, I wouldn't, I mean, we're trying to put a story together, uh, what, uh, a, a series of events or a digital footprint of what had happened. We're trying to put that together. And as you're trying to put that together, you're doing the best you can to make the timeline and the evidence make sense, correct? Correct. But in terms of what happened in the months before the shooting, the day of the shooting, and the days after the shooting, you obviously were not with the Crumblies 24-7, correct? No, I was not with, I, I, didn't, I didn't know them before this. And it's impossible to have, there, there isn't any way to have a videotape, for example, of all those months, that shooting day, and the days following, correct? Correct. So you take bits of information and try to put it together the best you can to make sense of it. Are you referring to this investigation or throughout life? Well, both. I mean, I guess we do that in both, right? Um, I guess... In my life, if my son had hallucinations, I would have taken serious pause with that. All right, let's stop for one second. When you say hallucinations, you're, you're saying that you would take serious pause, but in reality, you did not know the shooter before this, this shooting, correct? No. I did not. You do not have awareness if he was really having hallucinations, correct? I would have taken some time to look into it. You're aware that there's this text thread, and we're going to get into it later, where he's telling his parents he's seeing things, correct? Correct. But you weren't a part of any of the conversations or a part of that household in those days around that text message conversation, correct? No, I was not. You're not aware. Okay, you're not aware of what Jennifer and James and their son had been talking about in person before and after those text messages. Well, I, from the text messages, I know the son on a couple of occasions asked or spoke with his friend about seeing a doctor or wanted to go see his doctor. Tell his parents he was going to that he tell his parents tell his parents that he wanted to go see a doctor. And while there are texts between. The shooter and his friend, you have no evidence that Mrs. Crumbly has ever seen those texts, correct? I, I, that she has read them? No, right. I do not. You have, so there's texts that the shooter sent to his friend, and you have no way to know whether Jennifer Crumbly ever saw those text messages, correct? Other than his own words, say, I'm going to tell my parents tomorrow that I want to go see a doctor. That telling his friend, I want to go see a doctor, and I'm going to tell my parents tomorrow, you don't know if he really wanted to go see a doctor or was going to tell his parents, correct? Well, I understand that's counsel's argument, but it's improper questions. How do you answer the question? Okay, you, don't, you don't know whether uh, Mrs. Crumb saw the text between her son and his friend? No, I do not, ma'am. And I'm also making the point, Your Honor, and the, the question is, you also don't know if it's true that he really planned to tell his parents anything. He has a text to a friend saying that, but you don't know whether that's true or not, correct? Other than him saying on a, a couple occasions, no, I don't. Okay. And when you say a couple of occasions, um, there's text messages on certain days that we've talked, that you testified about, but there's many, many, many other days, we can agree, that 
that you have not testified about, correct? In reference to what? In reference to what he said to his friend or in reference to what he said to the Crumleys. I mean, did, did he have conversations? Are you asking, did he have conversations with them? I don't understand the question. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. My, my question is, you've given us bits of information about certain days, about March 9th, about a date in April, about a date in November, correct? Correct. Okay. There's a lot of other dates that you did not give us information about what exactly was texted to and from Ethan Crumbly and, and Mrs. Crumbly, correct? Correct. There wasn't much text in between them. Okay. You also, there's, there's certain messages that you testified about between the shooter and his friend. Correct. There's also a lot, lot of other text messages between them that you have not talked about. Well, because the stuff that was talked about was not allowed to be talked about. You talked about... Your Honor... Yeah. Okay. This, well, I think well, it's important, yeah. Judge. Yeah. 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 Counsel can't ask questions about evidence that she sought to exclude. Okay. I telling this jury that I sought to exclude evidence that was irrelevant is is very unfair and okay. that is improper. Okay. Well, there's there's a lot of improper things here. Um, no one's hiding any evidence from the jury. Okay. So I I, I don't want any implication that that. Uh, this a witness is um, hiding what evidence from someone. So, yeah. thank you, Judge. So, don't 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 ask about the messages if you don't want to know. So. Okay. In, when you're talking about the text messages, let's let's back up and do this differently. You went through text messages between the shooter and his friend to find evidence to support that the shooter was having um, issues, correct? To build, we went through the text message to try to get an idea of who he was and what he was going through and what he had talked about with his friends. And when you saw text friend, messages, sorry. like you testified about, involving uh, seeing things and dishes flying and demons and things along those lines, you you gathered those, and that was the sub. That was the evidence that you've presented to this jury um, to support that to support your your case, correct? Well, because those were things of importance that he was hallucinating and seeing stuff flying off his shelves, and uh, uh, there's no other evidence to, or that we could find on the phones or communication between them to say that that problem was remedied or that. A phone call was made to the shooter to what's going on or how can I help you son or anything like that. None of that was found. So it was important that that was what he was struggling with. Okay. You're guessing that that is what he's struggling with. You, you're doing the best you can, but you're, you're getting pieces of information out of text messages and, and really you don't know these people or what was going on other than what you see in these texts. He agrees with it. He didn't know any of them before this. Yeah. Okay. I, I apologize. Well, I, I keep ending up in a situation where we're trailing off and repeating, and I, I would just ask that yeah, that stop. Is when Mr. and Mrs. Crumbly were at their home and law enforcement came, came to their house, it's accurate that the cell phones from the parents were taken by law enforcement. The first time they came to the home? Not necessarily the first time. I'm asking, police took the cell phones that Jennifer and James Crumbly used. Police took those phones, correct? Yes, they did. Okay. And when police took those phones, Mr. and Mrs. Crumbly obviously went and bought burner phones or track phones. Correct. And you've testified that there is, inf there's, you can see that Mr. and Mrs. Crumbly, or at least Mrs. Crumbly, attempted to get into some accounts that required two-factor authentication. That's correct. Can you please explain very quickly what two-factor authentication means for the jury? It's 
And so someone can't get into your account, which is just simply your password. When you open up an email account or you open up a, a Facebook account, and it tells you, put your phone number in here. So when you try logging in from a phone or a device that Facebook doesn't recognize, it'll send a text message to the number that you said send a text message to. So then you enter that code into um, the app as you're trying to log into it. So it's two-factor authentication, your password, and then text message from the provider. And so for things like sometimes bank accounts or portals to get into doctors, things along those lines, sometimes two-factor authentication is required where you would need your original phone, correct? Correct. Or at least your phone number to be able to gain access to your own accounts. That's correct. There are accounts that will block you out if you're using a device it's not used to seeing when you log in. If, you, if the two-factor authentication is set up? Yes. Correct. And so in this case, you could see that Mrs. Crumbly attempted to do some two-factor authentication and was unable to do so, correct? I don't know if she was unable to do so. I know there's a text message that was received from Instagram with a two-factor. I don't know what happened with after that. Okay, so after buying the track phones, the burner phones, it's fair to say that Mrs. Crumbly and Mr. Crumbly went to their phone carrier and purchased new phones that have their regular phone numbers on them, correct? Was that after the burner phones, is that what you're saying? Yes. Yes, they did. Okay, so when we're talking about the Crumbleys having six cell phones between them, the six cell phones include their original phones that were given to police, correct? That's correct. It includes these two track phones that have different phone numbers where you can't do the two-factor authentication, correct? That's correct. And it includes the two phones that were purchased after that so that they could have their phone numbers back on devices and then access accounts. That's correct. And from the phones, when you seize them, there is evidence that Jennifer Crumbly attempted to deactivate and delete a number of social media uh, applications, correct? Uh, there is talk about it in text messages. You need to delete this account or whatever. I don't know if you have something in particular that you're a, a, a certain account that you're asking. You, there's, there, there are text messages within the exhibits the prosecution has admitted, and I can, I can put them up, that show Mrs. Crumbly and Mr. Crumbly were trying to deactivate Facebook accounts and Instagram, correct? I know there were text messages telling you, people texting them telling them to do that, yes. Okay, and people were, part of the reason people in those text messages were telling them to do that is because after the shooting, there were threats and, um, you know, there were, there were a lot of threats against Mr. and Mrs. Crumbly. Judge, respectfully, I don't believe this officer can testify as to the reason why people said that. He can testify that there was attempts to delete and things were deleted, but the reason for the motivation, he can't testify. Well, well he can't testify about the motivation, but did you, did you see anything? Did you see threatening messages to them? I don't, I don't recall seeing any person. Um, no, ma'am, I don't. Okay. Do you recall that when in the text messages that Jennifer Crumbly sent out, she told Ms. Brian Maloche, she told Kira Panic, she told multiple people that she was being threatened. Are you telling me that? Or I'm asking, asking me? you. I don't. I don't recall if you have something to show me. I don't. I don't recall that off the top of my head. Okay. I.
Okay. I'm going to put on the screen exhibit number 130, which was admitted um, in your prior testimony. Is it? Yeah, so, sorry. Okay. Now, it, within the text message thread between Jennifer Crumbly and Kira Penick, this is a screenshot that was in that text thread, correct? This is from Kira Penick's, a screenshot of hers? Is that what this is? This is in <laughs> Exhibit 130 that's been admitted. These are screenshots with Kira Penick. And I am asking you, this is a screenshot showing threats to Jennifer Crumbly that Jennifer Crumbly showed to Kira Penick. I don't know. I don't remember ever seeing. I don't. I don't know where the, it says Kira Penick in, in the title of the of the image, but I don't know. Okay. Is there a copy of the exhibit that you could? Did you see this is in one thirty? Your Honor, this is in one thirty, and and I apologize. I I am going to have to go in detail through each exhibit. I did not want to do that, but it's it's very clear I'm going to have to. Um, so I'm going to the top of this. This is a 28-page exhibit, okay? Well, this was he, a... He's having the same challenge you are, as if there's so much paper that... Right. He can't, he can't say... If, there, if there's a hard copy of the exhibit, that could help him. Can, is there, can, can I have... May I approach? Yeah, yeah can he take... Yeah, that's... Okay. Okay. <coughs> okay, so this was admitted... Um, these were admitted screenshots through your testimony. Do you recall that? Yes, I do. I see the... Okay. Does, it, that, does that document refresh your recollection? Well, this part at the, the word says um, met with his counselor. So, yeah, that part, I remember that. Okay. And in the thread, we, we see what you testified about in terms of Jennifer Crumbly sending over a copy of the math assignment. Correct. I see that, yes. Okay. We see the testimony you gave about... Ethan being upset, having lost his friend, and going away, and uh, his dog. Correct. Okay. Going further down, um, this is before before the shooting started. Okay, so I'm on page four of that exhibit. Going into page um, five, this is all before the shooting, correct? Correct. Okay, and in this part, they're talking, Jennifer has told Kira Penick, as you testified, about the math worksheet. Yes. She's told Kira Penick about, I had to go to the counselor's office to have a meeting with them. Correct. Kira's talking about what course uh, Ethan could possibly be with that day that might make him feel better. Correct. And as the text thread goes down further, Kira and Jennifer, it's fair to say, remained in contact through the time of the shooting and after the shooting. Correct. Okay. And on November 30th, um, Kira Penick is asking, she's, she says, I heard there was a shooting at Oxford High School. Is Ethan okay? Correct? Correct. Okay. Saying, if you need anything, let me know. Correct. And after the time of the shooting at 442, Jennifer Crumbly is texting with Kira Penick again. Correct. Talking about how she needs to sell her horses. Correct. This is when she knows that the shooting has happened and she's, well, she says, my head is spinning right now. Correct? That's what she, yes, correct. Okay, she's talking to Kira Pinnock about selling the house back and forth. Correct. Okay, and Kira is talking about how um, she'll take care of the horses for Jennifer. Correct. Okay, and Jennifer says, I don't have my cell phone right now. She tells her I'm on this track phone. Correct. Because the police have her real phone. Correct. Okay. And then Kira tells her um, about how there's stuff on Facebook. People are figuring out what's being what's going on, correct? Correct. 
And Jennifer indicates, I'm off Facebook, I'm still in shock. Correct. Okay. And Kira sends, offers to send Jennifer, can you receive pictures, I'll screenshot it, correct? Yes. And then Kira goes on to send Jennifer um, screenshots of something a mutual friend posted um, that was that was about the shooting, correct? That's correct. And their discussions are about, I can't, well, it's, it says right in the exhibit, I cannot believe people on Facebook, I'm so sorry you're having to deal with this stuff, correct? Correct. Okay. She asks a question about the medication, and Jennifer indicates we're at a hotel in Lapeer, and that the news is live at her house, correct? Correct. Kira's response, at least in the text messages, is please stay safe, correct? Correct. And Jennifer sends her over what appears to be a screenshot from a, a social media app, maybe Facebook or, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure, but you can see that Jennifer sent the screenshot where she has received nasty messages to her. So I'm just going to object to the form of the question. Count, or Mr. Rogowski can certainly read all of this, but calling it a threat or nasty, that's not for him to answer. That's for the jury to determine. Well, yeah, they, they can characterize it. They can read it. But, but definitely they're not nice. Okay, can you please tell the jury what what these messages say? Larry Barton. I'm sure you want to read them? The sure. What it says on it? It says, rotten jail next to him. Okay, Brandon Hegwood. What a shame on you. Kaylee Camacho. Uh, fuck your ugly ass kid, I hope. Adam Tank. What a fucking coward, Ethan. Jennifer Crumbly text to Kira, I can't go home. Correct. And Kira texts back that she's concerned for Jennifer's and when she says you guys, she, I'm concerned for you guys, um, and is expressing concern, correct? That, yes, to stay away from the horses, correct? Yes. Okay. She also says <coughs> she's worried about your horses or hurting you while you're here, correct? Correct. Okay. It's, it's fair to say that Jennifer and James are afraid of the public's reaction to what their son did. Again, Judge, form the question. Yeah, I don't understand that. Well, let me back up. Uh, I'm sorry, I can rephrase, but that's okay. Okay, so we know the news has been around the Crumley's home. Correct. Okay, so following the shooting, news, there was media all over their street, correct? I wasn't there. I, I don't know. I wasn't there. I can't tell you if there's media there or not. Okay. It, it would surprise you if there was? It wouldn't surprise me, no. Okay. There were some nasty messages coming into Mrs. Crumbly. From the street? Are you referring to? Yes, I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. And Jennifer is saying she doesn't want to put anyone else at risk. And that specifically is on page 15 of the exhibit you're looking at. Correct. <coughs> Kira is telling her about, or is commenting people are ridiculous, also talking about buying horses, other, other random comments in there. Um, is that a fair statement? There's some miscellaneous, I, I don't know. Just, she also said be honest about things too. Yep, she, Kira is saying to her the best thing you can do is be honest about things. Correct. Okay. Jennifer's not saying, I don't plan to be honest, right? She didn't, didn't respond with that, no. Okay, Jennifer's not saying, I've got a big plan to lie, help me put this together. I don't, it's not in here, no. Okay, we have no evidence to suggest that Jennifer's telling Kira to lie about anything for her. Correct. Okay, so when Kira's saying be honest, She's saying be honest, but you have no reason to believe that Jennifer's attempting to be dishonest at this point. 
Based on that message. At this point, no, yeah. but they but were taken into custody for a couple days after they were told to turn themselves in. I'm sorry? They were taken into custody a couple days after they were um, gonna, supposed to be taken into custody. Okay, we're going to get there. We'll get there. <clears throat> Jennifer Crumbly is representing um, that she's trying to work out lawyer fees, figuring out um, about being questioned, if she's going to be brought in, um, amounts she can pay, things like that, correct? Correct. Okay. And Jennifer is telling her, I am bawling right now. My son ruined so many lives today. That's correct. And he did ruin so many lives that day. Yes, he did. And Kira is, is writing back to her. She wishes she could help more. She's also in shock. Correct? Objection again in the form of question, Judge. Well, well, he doesn't know if she's in shock. She, she texts that. Okay, I'm sorry. She texted, I'm still, I'm, I am still in shock, too. That's what she texted, correct. And Kira encourages Jennifer, take it one day at a time, and again, just be honest about everything. It should help you through this. Correct. Um, and offers to take care of the boys, which we would guess is her horses. Do the two horses at, at her farm, correct? Jennifer is thanking um, her for not judging her, like, unlike the whole world, correct? That's what, yes, correct. Okay, meaning that we can assume Jennifer feels the whole world is judging her. Again, objection to the form of the question. Yeah, he, well, he doesn't know, he knows what the text says, he doesn't know how she feels, but that, that's what she said. Okay, that's what the text says. That's what the text says, correct. Kira says that she's not going to essentially judge Jennifer. It doesn't remotely make her think it's her, it's their fault, correct? Uh, that's what Kira texted, yes, correct. And then Kira says, it sounds like Ethan was a troubled kid. Correct. It's unfortunate this happened. That's correct. Okay. And Jennifer is texting her back, I wish we had some warnings. Something. That's what Jennifer texted back to her, correct? Yeah, the hallucinations, back to that, could have been warnings or seeing demons. Okay. And again, you, you didn't know these people. You don't know the context. You don't know what they discussed. We've already covered that earlier in your testimony, right? I do not know them before this prior. Okay. Right. So you've talked about the hallucinations many times. The jury gets it. There's a text about hallucinations. I, we all agree. Those are there. Okay. To you, those would... Those would have been alarming. You would have, you would have acted differently based on getting that text. Absolutely, I would have. Okay, Jennifer Crumbly is texting her friend Kira in this text thread. It, that's what we're going over right now. Okay. And her texts are saying, "I wish we had warnings." Correct. Correct. That's what she put. Yes. Okay, and. She, Jennifer Crumbly wrote, he's a good kid. They made a, a terrible decision. And I, there may be typos, but it, it, it says, he's a good kid. They made a terrible decision, correct? That's what she typed, yes. Okay. Kira responds back, there probably were warnings, but nobody saw them. Hindsight is always twenty twenty. I, I don't care if you agree with it or not. That's, that's what's that's typed what there. That's what Kira says. That's Hindsight is there. always twenty twenty. correct? That's what's typed there, yes. Then Kira goes on and says, people at the barn are concerned. I'm sorry, I'll, I'll go slower, okay? A lot of people have found out Ethan's all over Facebook. That's, that's the next thing she says, correct? Correct. And then she goes on to say, people at the barn are concerned. Correct. She tells Jennifer, I think it would be best <coughs> if you didn't go 
out to the barn, or if you do, you should be escorted by police, correct? Correct. When someone's escorted by police, that's usually for safety reasons, correct? Possibly, yes. Kira, Jennifer says, seriously, those horses are the only thing good in my life right now. And this is after the shooting, correct? Correct. And Kira responds, I understand that, but we all need to be careful. Correct. So it's fair to say there was a concern about safety regarding Jennifer after the shooting, and also other people around her were concerned for their own safety. Correct. And it's also fair to say, and if you don't know, please just let me know if you don't know, a lot of people in this state hated Mr. and Mrs. Crumbly when they heard about this shooting. Judge, he can't possibly I don't know. answer that question. I don't know how he can testify to that. Okay. There was, there was a widespread attention. There was widespread attention. Yes, there was, Def, of course. And there were many news articles. Correct, yes. And people on anything like this are naturally upset to see a school shooting. Absolutely. And people naturally are angry to hear that children have died. Absolutely. And this was the kind of event that sparked a lot of emotion in a lot of ways. That's fair to say. That's, that's fair to say for you personally. Absolutely. You would imagine that for other people, they were personally affected by this, very emotional. Yes. And it's fair to say that this was, this kind of a tragedy was on, it was just horrific. We can agree it was horrific. The shooting, yes it was, absolutely. Jennifer tells Kira to call her on Facebook. She's on a track phone, needs to figure some things out, correct? Correct. If they did um, have a phone call, you're not aware of it. Um, well, and I'll, I'll slow down. The next message says, sorry, I missed your call from Kira, correct? Correct. But we don't know what happened um, in between the text about calling at 11.23 and the text the following day at 2.34. We don't know if there ended up being conversations or not. Is that a fair statement? Correct. You can't tell from this. this not threat. from this, correct. So, they're going back and forth, talking more, um, more and more about letting her know later today um, things like that. There's talking forces in between all of this. Is that a fair statement? Correct. And on the bottom of page 22, Kira indicates, I don't want people to follow you or hurt you. Correct. And Jennifer says, we are out of the area for a few days in a safe place until we have a better grasp on everything, correct? That's correct. She doesn't say, we are trying to get out of state, we're trying to get out of the country. She doesn't say anything like that, correct? Not in this chat thread. Okay. In this, she says, we're trying to be in a safe place. Correct. Which would indicate safety is of course a concern to the crumbly parents. By saying they're in a safe place, yes, I would say that. Kira says, I'm glad you're safe. I care about you guys, correct? Correct. She assures her she'll take care of the horses. They'll talk about buying them, figuring out somebody to buy them, correct? That's correct. A few more text messages back and forth about meeting before then, um, and then 
on page 24 of that exhibit, Jennifer says, what's your number? I want to call and set up a safe place to meet, correct? That, correct. Okay, she mentions that her messenger is probably being monitored. She does say that, yes. Okay, and she's talking about she needs to get stuff, discuss the horses, correct? That's correct. And let's see, they're going through more about whether cash or checks are best. Uh, what page is that? I'm saying that, yes, I'm sorry. 25. Yes. Okay, and you're aware that after the night of the, sh or the night of the shooting, the Crumbleys went and stayed in a local hotel. Yeah, correct, they went to a hotel, yes. Okay, and the next day, they went to a different hotel. Correct. Okay, which was also, I mean, maybe an hour from here, a, lo a local hotel, not, not out of state, not out of the country, right? Within an hour, yes. Okay, and so in the days following the shooting, the Crumbleys did not return to their home in Oxford. They did not, know. And as far as you know, since the day of the shooting, the Crumbleys have never returned to their home in Oxford. No, they've never been back. of this is talking about possible charges being announced um, and and things. Jennifer is saying um, she's anticipating there may be charges announced, criminal charges. Yes, at the uh, night before, I believe. I mean, at page 26, yes. After the shooting. Yes. And when she's talking about charges, she's trying to figure out if they're charges. Well, I'm sorry, scratch that. She's talking about charges against herself, correct? I'm not entirely certain if she's, um, it doesn't say whether she's referring to herself or somebody else. Okay, so she's waiting to basically just figure out what's going on. So if, again, what? counsel can't narrate what she thinks her client was thinking. She can have him read the text message. I admitted it in, into evidence. They can have it all. Yeah, okay, so there's a text. Okay, so, so the text says, I'm not... Jennifer Cumbly wrote, I'm not sure what's happening. Yeah, the, yes, I'm sorry, yes. Okay. From the text message thread that the prosecution introduced, between Jennifer Crumbly and Brian Maloche, we also can conclude, and if you can't, let me know, that Jennifer Crumbly was trying to deactivate and delete social media accounts. I believe she was. Yes, I believe they discussed that, yes. And Jennifer Crumbly is asking Brian Maloche Things about, can you still see James's Facebook? Can you see my Facebook? Questions like that, correct? Correct. Okay. James and Jennifer Crumbly are, or I'm sorry, Jennifer Crumbly in her text messages is very clearly making it obvious. She, well, I'm sorry. She is telling Brian that she is shutting things down like that. I don't remember the language that she used. I know they talked about it. I don't remember the, if, if she used the phrase shutting things down. If, if a person has a Facebook account that they deactivate, okay, let's, let's, I'm going to go even slower. When someone has a Facebook account, other people in the world have the ability to see that account, correct? If it's public or your friends or whatever other security or settings, but yes. However you have it set up, yes, yes. you allow who can see the account and who can't, correct? That's correct. If you do have an account and you don't want the world to see it, there's, if you deactivate the account, the account doesn't appear when people look for you on Facebook, correct? That's correct. 
So if the Facebook account is deactivated, people cannot send you messages through Facebook, correct? That's correct. And they can't send you messages through Facebook Messenger. That, uh, I'm not entirely certain if you'd have to deactivate Messenger as well. I don't know, because they are two separate platforms. It's under one company, Meta or Facebook, but I don't know if you have to deactivate both of them. So with Messenger, if Jennifer Crumbly deactivated Messenger, we can agree that people wouldn't be able to send her messages. Correct. And in general, if a person is trying to avoid having people find them on social media, deactivating the account makes it so people don't find them, correct? <coughs> correct. So for example, Instagram. Jennifer Crumbly had an Instagram account and you testified about that to the jury, correct? I, there was a two-factor authentication test message that was found, yes. With Instagram, is that what you're referring to? I'm not referring to the two-factor authentication, but you testified that Jennifer Crumbly had an Instagram account. Well, we can agree. She had an Instagram account. Yeah, she account. did. There were, there were posts that were um, admitted the other day, I believe, right? Right. Yes. And, and in that, on Instagram, the whole point of Instagram is, is to post photos or videos, Correct. Correct. And we can see the Instagram account that Jennifer Crumbly had with videos and pictures she had posted over time. Correct. And when a person turns off or de deactivates their Instagram account, other people in the world don't have the ability to see those photos any longer, correct? That's correct. Other people in the world don't have the ability to send messages through Instagram to the person that's deactivated their account. Correct. So, as a computer expert, if a person is trying to avoid having people see them or find them or see posts of theirs, even old posts, deactivating the account will accomplish that task. Correct. Instagram account, you are able to tell from the data that you received other accounts that Jennifer Crumbly followed. Correct. So meaning that from her account, Jennifer Crumbly had certain people she was linked up with where she could see what they posted on their accounts, correct? Correct. And on the flip side, people she was friends with on Instagram or connected to could see what she posted. That's correct. And we know that Jennifer's son had an Instagram account, e.crumbly, correct? Correct. And we can tell that Jennifer's account was connected with her son's in a way that she could see what he posted on that account. Correct. And we can presume he could see what his mother posted. Correct. When you are looking through the Instagram records, you are not able to tell which posts Jennifer did in fact see or not see, correct? Correct. So if the shooter posted something and Jennifer Crumbly had not checked Instagram, it's possible she would not have seen it even though he posted it. It's possible. If he posted it and she looked at Instagram and looked at his account, she or looked at his you know, profile, is that what it's called? She would she would certainly see anything he posted. Looked at his account, you're saying, I'm sorry? Yes, yes correct. But in terms of all of the data you have you don't have any way to determine which Instagram pictures she did or did not see. Correct. Now, if she made a comment on a picture, you would know she obviously saw it because you couldn't comment unless you had seen the picture to put the comment on there.
correct? That's correct. And on the, on the Instagram photos, there are not comments from Jennifer Crumbly to her son about the posts, correct? And all the photos or, any, or a particular one? I, I suppose the ones that we've um, admitted as exhibits in this case, the photograph of the gun, for example. Correct. And there's no doubt um, the shooter licked guns. Correct. And there's no doubt Jennifer posted photos of the gun. Correct. And videos. Correct. And um, in the in all and in, in even with what she posted, we can't tell if the shooter could see her posts. Possibly, correct. He may have seen them. He may not have seen them. That's correct. In terms of people communicating, we know that people can communicate obviously by telephone, voice, uh, voice phone calls. I, I don't take many of these days because I hate them, but in the old days we could talk on the phone from one person to another, correct? Correct. And there's the ability obviously to text. People can send messages from one person to another. Correct. And in terms of people's habits, some people may delete texts when they get them, correct? Correct. Some people may keep every text they've ever had. It's correct. Some phones will delete texts after a certain period of time. Not unless the user tells it to, no. If someone gets a new phone, there are occasions where the old text from the old phone may not come up on the new phone. I mean, without, I, I can't say for certain. I don't know. I, I haven't tested something like that yet. I don't know. We can agree that everyone's personal habits in terms of how many texts they keep on their phone or don't um, are individual to each person. Correct. So when you're testifying and telling the jury about posts that you can tell or texts that you can tell are deleted or not deleted, you have never sat down and talked to Jennifer Crumbly about her habits with deleting posts or pictures or texts, correct? That's correct. The best you can do is look at what's deleted, what's not deleted, and tell this jury your findings. Correct. I want to go to March 9th of 2021. Um, you testified pretty extensively about that date. Do you recall the, the materials from that date? And if not, I can, I can certainly... If, yeah, if you have copies of it, I would prefer that. Yes, please. Okay. So on that date, I will approach with copies in just a moment. I just need okay. to pull it up on my... Computer. I'm going to go to exhibit number 78. Okay. So, Your Honor, may I approach the witness? Sure. I think he has the last screen. You said you wanted to hand hard copy. Either way, it doesn't matter to me. Okay. Oh, okay. Are you okay with this screen? Or do you want? I'll have that, please. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So, March 9th is one of the dates that you talked about. Correct. And the text messages that were introduced um, make it clear that James and Jennifer Crumbly made plans that day to go out to the barn, correct? Correct. And you have, um, you have photos confirming that they were in fact at the barn, um, photos of horses they took. Correct. Okay, the jury has seen that the data shows the times these photographs were taken, so we know they were taken on March 9th. Correct. Okay, we, you've brought in GPS locations to prove they were there on that date. Correct. Okay, and it's on that date 
that Ethan Crumbly, or I'm sorry, the shooter, is sending his parents some texts um, that were admitted through Exhibit 82. Do you recall those texts? I do, yes. Okay. Now, in these texts, <laughs> starting at, I'm going to put it up on the screen. This has been admitted as Exhibit 82. At 317, we can see that the shooter asks his mom, where are you? Correct. And I'm sorry, I have that one in my hand. Do you want me to trade with you? I should be fine with this. Okay. Thank you. I think council misspoke. Here I'm sorry, is. Jennifer, I'm so sorry. Jennifer Crumbly asked the shooter, are you home now? At 317. Where are you? Yes. Is that what I'm sorry, where are you? Yes. Okay. And the shooter responded, it, it looks like four hours later, saying, can you get home now? And then proceeded to send some other texts about, there is someone else in the house, I think. And it, it goes on <coughs> from there, correct? Correct. Now, in between the time of 317 and 750, Okay, we can agree there's a couple hours of a gap. That's correct. You don't know if Jennifer Crumbly and the shooter had phone conversations or discussions over those couple of hours. We, if we looked at the call logs on their phones, we could possibly find that out. Okay. If we looked at the call logs and the phone calls were to and from cell phones, we would be able to tell that, correct? If they, yes. Okay, right. but if, let's say Jennifer Crumbly called from her office phone, it would it would not show up the same as if she called from her own cell phone. Well, the number would be different, correct. Okay, and when you and law enforcement went through looking for phone calls, there are not, you provided over several call records, but not call records for, for example, Jennifer Crumbly's office with Ethan Crumbly. There are none entered as exhibits. I can't say for certain right now with all the information I looked at, if there were any off okay. the top of my head. You don't know if there were any? Right now, I don't know. Okay. And you also don't know that day on the 8th, you know that they're planning to be at the barn. James and Jennifer make plans to go to the barn. That Correct. day after work. Correct. Okay. Between the time they make these plans and the time the shooter texts, can you get home now, you don't know if Jennifer Crumbly or James Crumbly has physically been with the shooter. Right. No, no, I do not. From that chat thread right there, I do not know that. You don't know the discussions on that day that may have taken place in between the shooter and his parents. Cor right. With, from this, I can't tell you that. Is that what you're saying? Right. Sure. Correct. Right. You, the best you can do is piece together bits of information, but we can agree there's gaps of time where you don't know definitively what happened. Correct. Right now, yes. We can agree... There are any number of things that could have happened between 317 and 750 that you would, that you, there would not be evidence to show you what exactly happened, correct? If there is none there, you mean? Is that what you're saying? Right. Correct. And the only people who would know if they can even remember the day years ago would be the people who were present, so Mrs. Crumbly and the shooter, correct? Correct. They would be the only people who truly know what they spoke about or didn't speak about on that day. Correct. So when you see these texts, and I understand you find them alarming, I imagine that the texts, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that you find alarming, are the texts about there is someone in the house, I think, Someone walked into the bathroom and flushed the toilet and left the light on. I thought it was you, but when I came in, no one was home. There is no one in the house, though. 
Those are some of the texts that you found to be problematic, correct? In the fact that there's no response between any of those, yes. Okay. There, we can agree there's no response, but you, you don't know if... Okay. We can agree there's no response by text between Mrs. Crumbly and the shooter, correct? Correct. But you also have no way to tell when you see text messages like this at what time Mrs. Crumbly read those texts? Correct, you'd be able to tell it that it was read, but yes, not what time. Okay, so for example, when the shooter texts, can you get home now? And then there is someone else, in, there's someone in the house, I think, a few seconds later, and then about 30 seconds after that, another text, you have no idea if Jennifer Crumbly checked her phone to see the first text message, um, checked and saw the second. You don't know which ones she saw or when, correct? I don't know the time they were read, no. All you know is that you don't see any response to them. They're correct, there's no response. So there's a number of possible things that could have happened in between these texts. From 7.50 to the end of the last text? Yeah. She could have texted back, you mean, or called? She could have, well, she didn't text back. We agree with that, Correct. right? Yes. Okay. When I say there's a number of things that could have happened, I mean, she could have read the text and thought this is garbage or he's joking and just set the phone down. Correct? She could have. Okay. She could have not seen the texts because she was busy doing something. Correct. She could have been, you, we know she's at the horse ranch. Are you aware of how strong Jennifer Crumbly's cell signal is out at the farm, at the barn, where the horses are kept? I have no idea about that. No, I do not. Okay. If her cell signal doesn't work out where the barn is, it's possible these texts are not getting to her until she gets to a place where data uploads into the phone, correct? That's correct. So while we see these texts being sent, we cannot conclude that Jennifer Crumbly is reading these as they are coming to her. Fair to say? Um, I, I mean, they were, that's the time that they were sent, the 7.50 and 14 seconds, and then 17 seconds and 39 seconds. That's when they were actually sent, and they were received on the other end. That's marked at that time. It's Otherwise, it would have come in at a later time. Okay, but my point is you don't know when she saw them, when Mrs. Crumbly actually read them. No, but they would have been on the phone at that time. If the phone had a signal and was able to get text, they'd be on the phone at that time, correct? It would have been at a later time, at the time that they came in. <clears throat> Okay, but if the, if the signal wasn't working, she might not have been able to see those texts until she got to a point where the signal came in. Correct. Okay, there's times where you're in an area, people can be in an area with their cell phone, and the signal is bad, and texts are coming into them, but their phone shows nothing. That's a possibility, correct? That's correct. And then when the person gets to a spot with better cell phone signal, all of a sudden, all the texts they missed over whatever period of time the phone wasn't working will flood into the phone, correct? That's correct. And just because they come into the phone at that time, they were still sent possibly hours before. Not, without testing, I can't say for certain. You don't know? I can't say for certain without testing, correct. Okay. So, the text messages that were sent about someone being in the house, someone walking into the bathroom, you, you don't know any of the responses um, that, or even the thoughts Jennifer Crumbly had when she, when she did, in fact, read those messages? I don't know if, if she, she would have called back if that was alarming to her. Is that what you're saying? Or? I, I guess what I'm saying is 
So these, these messages are coming in, and even when she does see them, let's say if she sees them as they're coming in, you don't know what she's thinking about these. I don't know what she's thinking, no. Okay. And you also don't know, um, and, and obviously we've already talked about it, this has already been asked, but you, you obviously don't know when she's seen each message. There's no documentation like she saw this one at 8 o'clock, this one at 8.05, anything like that. Those are the times that they came into the phone, yes. Okay. The next message we see is a text message on the following day sent to Ethan by Jennifer Crumbly that says, where is your dad, correct? Can you just scroll down a little bit? Yeah. I just want to make sure I see Yeah, it. no, sorry. You know what, I'm sorry. You're not, you're not close, right? I'm not even close. I think the, I think the witness could probably be supposed to go. Okay. All right. So um, I'm going to let you step down. We can't discuss your testimony with anyone. Okay. Okay. So can you come back at about, about five after three? Okay. That's fine. All right. All right. So jury. Some of the questions are becoming repetitive, so um, that'll, that's going to make you lose them. Okay. All right, All right. so five and three. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
Yes, sir. Continue. Okay, thank you. All right, so we, we've been sitting here going over March 9th, 2021. Um, there was also some messages from March 8th, so the day before that you testified about. Do you recall those messages? I do. Okay. Do you, do you recall, um, do you need to see those messages, or are you, are you able to answer questions without... I'd like them? to see them, yes, please. Okay. So... These are going to be, let's see here, this is Exhibit 84. <coughs> okay, Exhibit 84, um, can you see it up on your screen? Yes, I can. Okay, these are texts that are between um, James and Jennifer Crumbly, correct? Correct. Now, these texts are confirming that Jennifer is saying she's swamped at work and is going to have to not go to the barn that night, correct? I'm sorry, do you have a copy I can I'll scroll? Into, I don't know what I did with my copy. Let me just, I'm sorry. Here it is. It's right here. You're scrolling too fast. Here. Okay. Sorry. No, it's fine. This is 84. Thank you. Do you want me to take these or do you want to keep those? Unless you're going to refer to them. I don't need them. I'm not sure if I will. So, we'll We'll find out. Okay. So on Exhibit 84, these are the texts from the day before. March 9th are the texts where Ethan is sending those things, saying there's somebody slamming the door, things like that, right? Correct. Okay. These are from the day before on March 8th, yes? Correct. And you testified about these texts from March 8th um, on direct, and those were admitted through the prosecution. Correct. Okay. On March 8th, um, the parents are talking about um, about Ethan at the beginning of the text messages. Is that a fair statement? Uh, at at 3.09, uh, she, um, Jennifer asks, is Ethan going bowling? Okay, so on page 386, she starts yes. off with, is Ethan going bowling? He says, IDK, which is I don't know. We can agree Correct. on that. Okay, what do you mean, I don't know? Um, okay, goes down further, and Jennifer Crumbly on the 8th is asking, at 3.12 in the afternoon, why isn't he home yet, correct? That's correct. At 3.12 and 51 seconds, she says he should be home by now, correct? That's correct. When she's saying he, we, can, uh, we know that she's talking about Ethan, correct? Correct. And then it goes on at... 3, 12, and 56 seconds, she says, freaking out, correct? Correct. And James responds to her at 3.13, so not even a minute later, he doesn't get home until 3.16, correct? Correct, that's what he says, yes. So 
These parents are communicating about when their son gets home down to the minute of when he can be expected. Yes? Correct. Jennifer's text back to him is, I told you to pick him up because he's upset, and I don't want him to do anything stupid, God damn it. Correct? Correct. That's Jennifer saying that to James. Correct. On this date in March of 2021, Jennifer is working at Princeton at her job that's out in West Bloomfield. Correct? Correct. And as far as you know, James at that time is a DoorDash driver working out in the Oxford area. Correct. And at that time, James was in between jobs. And if you don't know, please tell me. In between um, jobs uh, and door dashing on the side as he was waiting for another job to come along, correct? I, I do recall text message about trying to be an interviews or something like that on between them, yes. Okay, and in all fairness, if I ask you something you don't know, just, just let me know. Absolutely. Okay, I'm just trying to speed it up a little. Okay, so Jennifer's yelling at James, I don't want him to do anything stupid, goddammit. When she says that, it's fair to say you don't know what she means by I don't want him to do anything stupid, correct? I have no idea, correct. Okay, and James's response is, dude, chill, he is fine, and I'm trying to fucking work, correct? Correct. And Jennifer's texting back again, not even a, a minute later, does he have his phone, yes? Yes. And James texts back right away, he won't answer while he's walking. I'll let you know the minute he walks in, correct? Correct. And Jennifer, within a minute of that, is sending another text. I'm serious, freaking out. Is he home yet? Those are the next two texts in succession, correct? Correct. It would appear from these text messages that Jennifer is voicing concern over Ethan. In this one thread, yes. Okay. Correct. And, and again, we're guessing if she's concerned about him, correct? I, I, she's, the language makes her like she's excited. I would say yes. Okay. So the next day when she's not responding to Ethan's text, again, we've gone over this ad nauseum. We don't know why she's, why she's not responding or what's going on in her head or if she's getting the messages, correct? I don't know, yes. You would agree with me in the text messages between Jennifer and James, and I'm sorry, they communicate way more by face of Facebook Messenger, correct? Yes, they did. Okay, and if I were to say that this is the printed out stack of Facebook messengers, Messages between James and Jennifer, would that surprise you? I, I don't know. There were a lot of them. I could tell you that. I don't know what it would look like printed out yet. Yeah, if you say that, I believe you. Okay. Um, approximately how many messages do you recall reviewing between them? Thousands? Yes, thousands. Okay. And in the messages, it was, you read every one of these messages, correct? Correct. And when you were putting together information for the prosecution and for this investigation, you went through and found the evidence that's obviously brought into this trial. I'm sorry, I don't understand. Give me the the question, evidence right? that's been admitted, these texts are texts you found when you read the whole thing. Correct. Okay. And obviously, if there were texts between Jennifer and James that said something like, I think Ethan's psychotic, you would have brought that in to this court, correct? Just like the text we had where she said she was worried he was depressed, yes. Okay. So, and I'm going to get to the text about him being depressed later, but if you saw something in these text messages, like, I think our son is a serious threat, you would have brought that in here to show this jury. I, I don't understand the question. I mean, this, this chat was brought in because for an unknown reason, she's very excited or um, doesn't want to do anything stupid. I don't know what, what he would do that's stupid. Right, okay, so you don't know what he would do, that's stupid. Aside from that, though, my point is, we're not going to have this jury read all of the text and messages between James and Jennifer Crumbly, right? Correct. And in prepping for a trial, you bring in the ones that show the point you're trying to make, correct? Correct. 
So you, so to do that, you read through all of them. Correct. And you pick out the ones that you think are important. Correct. And the ones that you've shown the jury are the most important ones you found. Correct. And we can agree that the balance of the messages, there's a lot more information that this jury is not going to see because it's not important to, to, to proving this case. Um, I, I'm sorry. What was your, what, what, give me the question again. Let me ask, I'll, I'll ask a different question. It's fair to say throughout these texts, there are, there are numerous conversations between James Crumbly and Jennifer Crumbly about, the, about their son. Numerous? Yes. I wouldn't say numerous. Okay, there's, there's many conversations about, is he home yet from school? There's some, yes. Okay, there are conversations about um, him uh, having to go to take headache medication. I don't recall it. it. It might be that I recall headache medication. I remember him having a headache. Okay. There are texts in here um, about what they're going to eat for dinner with their son. Okay. Do you agree? Correct. Yes. Okay. There's texts about all kinds of things that a mom and a dad would talk about um, that are not important in terms of in terms of proving this case. Correct. Correct. Okay. And the most important information you found are the are the papers that have been admitted through the prosecutor. Correct. Okay. And in the rest of the text messages, my point is, if you saw something that was more serious, like, I think Ethan's going to shoot people, you would have brought that into court. Just like the one, yes. Okay. You would have. So... When we're looking at the evidence... Yeah, I just need to object to the form of the question. She's characterizing that he brings it into court. He doesn't bring it into court. He's, he's the, investor, the, the prosecutor decides um, uh, what they're asking to be admitted. So, right, she's, she's insinuating that he's taking certain things out and not telling anybody else. And everything's been turned over. I mean, it's... Okay, I'm not argument. insinuating that. I, I'm starting to think it might be shorter to ask the jury to read that whole stack. Right? Would that be shorter? Yeah. Okay. My point and my question is, James and Jennifer discuss Ethan in other text messages. Yes, they do. And if there were text messages that showed evidence that either one of them believed Ethan was sick, mentally ill, anything along those lines, you would have you would be pointing them out for this jury. More than what we have, correct, yes. Okay. What you have is the best evidence you you could find after going through all of them. That like was said that I turned over to the prosecution, yes. Okay. And that's true too of the messages between Ethan and his friend, correct? Uh, in terms of the evidence you brought in, <laughs> is the most important evidence you thought that was relevant to this case, correct? Not entirely, the no. same objection is the, the witness doesn't bring in evidence that he thinks is relevant. He's already testified. His job is to take the, the data, he, he extracts it from devices, and he passes along all the information. The, the, the prosecutor decides. Thank you. Okay. okay. It's... it's well, technically, they work together, but the prosecutor is the one who decides what might be relevant and what might be admissible. Okay. When you went through the cell phone reports, you read all of the messages between the shooter and his friend, the friend that the prosecution has um, not named, but the one friend that's been an issue in this trial, correct? Correct. You read through... There were over 25,000 messages exchanged between the shooter and his friend um, that came off of the phones. Correct. If I told you that this was the amount of text messages all printed out, would you disagree with that? I would not. Okay. And when you went through and pulled out, we can agree that there's lots of different topics discussed among these text messages. Correct. And the text messages that, that were 
brought in and entered as evidence were from this large stack of, of text as a whole. The, the, what was presented, I'm, I'm sorry. They're in these, they're in yes. these, they're from here. Yes, there, were, there was more information that you know, was turned over, but. Right, okay, so my point is though, the, the pieces, the materials that have been admitted and that you've been testifying about are, are a part of all of the messages between the shooter and his friend. Correct. Judge, if counsel wants to continue with this, that's admissible. And she yes, has yes. asked it for him to be. I need to be really careful, okay? See, you know, this this is the conversation we had when we were picking the jury, um, that we are, we are not trying the case of the shooter. So we've all endeavored to, to give you the things that are important to this case that are that are not specific to the shooter's case. So, uh, you know, I don't want the jury to think that they are not allowed to see something, all right? So I, I, I don't want th the jury to think that either side is hiding something because they're not. There have been evidentiary rulings made over the last year and a half in this case, and those are rulings that I've made after extensive research and briefing and all those different things with the prosecutor and defense counsel. So I don't want you to think anything's being hidden. That's that's not a fair, you know, characterization. So, Judge, I asked the court to instruct counsel that can't request certain things and then make this line of questioning without opening the door. Well, I, I, I do not want to try the shooter's case, okay? So let's not, let's not do that, right? Yeah, I, you know, yeah, yes. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so we've talked about March 8th and we've talked about texts from March 9th, yes? Correct, yes. Okay, and then we, you also testified about text messages that were sent on March 17th. Do you recall that? I recall the date, yes. And the, the overall point of those messages, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that on that date, the parents were at the barn together with their, with their horses. Those are the pictures, yeah. I don't remember really, if you have a copy of the text messages that were in that day. I can show you them. Can, yes. I, can I make a, re a request? Yes. Um, could you disassemble the Leaning Tower of Pisa? Oh, because sure. I, honestly, I, it, it looked like it was, I would hate you to have to reconstruct that. It okay. just looked like it was going to tip, and, and then you'd have to try to re-put it together, and that would take, I'm, 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 hoping, sorry, I'm hoping you're going to be, Drinking a glass of wine in your sweatpants this weekend instead of re I'm re re reassembling <laughs> that file. So Five bottles. I, I just, it looked like it was going to tip. Okay. So. No, thank you. All right. Um, all right. We talked about 3.8. We talked about 3.9. I'm going to 3.17. Um, you asked me what text messages I'm talking about. And these are the exhibits that are around exhibits 83 um, through 86. Would you like me to bring you the text messages so that you can see those? If you could, please, yes. Okay. okay. The March 17th um, starts with exhibit 85. Okay. Now, on 85, we amended it. So there are texts that I were... Yes, okay. And then I'm also going to hand you right now... Um, what's on 86, okay? Okay, thank you. Okay. Now, the overall point of these text messages was to show that both of the parents were at the barn on March 17th, correct? Correct. Okay, and on that day, while they were at the barn on March 17th, the shooter uh, was trying to get a hold of them. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, and on that date, we have cell phone evidence that was admitted in Exhibit 83 that shows, and tell me if I need to slow down, I'll, I can break this down more. An hour after the shooter was texting Jennifer Crumbly, 
She called him and had a phone conversation within an hour, correct? Correct. And that phone conversation lasted less than a minute? Correct. I and, that. and you have no idea what was said during that phone conversation? No, I do not. You have no idea what happened um, after Jennifer left the barn that day or James left the barn? No, I do not. You have no knowledge that the family, whether they were together that night or not, correct? Correct. You've done the best you can do to put together the information with materials you have. <coughs> correct. Okay, so we've talked about March 17th. Now I want to talk about March 20th. I'm sorry, the 19th and the 20th. On March 19th, there were text messages that were introduced, and tell me if you need them, they're exhibits 95 through 100, where there's a discussion about Ethan waking up and seeming hungover. Do you recall those? I do, yes. Would you like me to give you those? So I, I just like having a copy yeah, in my hand or on the screen either way. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so here's exhibit, this is 95. And I'm going to put 95 up on the screen. So now we're talking about March. Can you, Sean, can you fix it? Okay. All right. So we're looking at um, exhibit 95, okay, which is the exhibit. And this is from March, uh, March 18th. Correct? 19th, 95? Ah, okay. Exhibit 95 is from March 18th. It's you know, it, it goes over multiple days. Okay, I'm going to, may I please approach with 96 also? Sure. Okay, there's two that are in order and they both contain multiple days, correct? Correct. Okay, so I'm sorry, this is a little bit confusing because we've got two different dates on, on two different exhibits. Okay, so. I'm going to go to the to 96 first. These texts actually come before 95. Um, on this date, um, this is these are the texts where Ethan says, "I just finished picking up the room. I cleaned until shelves or clothes started flying off the shelf. This stuff only happens when I'm home alone. Correct." Correct. Okay, and I am totally off. I am so sorry. March 17th. I need to be on exhibit 85. 85. 85 is, it says is the thread from March 17th, 2020. Yes, and I, 85 is one that I cannot display because it's been redacted. So I'm asking if the prosecution can please put 85 up on the screen. Can you put redacted 85 on the screen? I can, I just need a minute, Doug. So on 85, this is on March 17th. This is the text where it started off, gonna get drunk and ride my horse. Jennifer probably said that at 1.30 p.m. Correct. Okay, and I'm sorry, Mr. Keese, can you please scroll down? Okay, Jennifer Crumbly's indicating that afternoon, I hate my job, um, can you bring out last please? And we I don't know what that means. You don't know what that means. Would you agree with that? I don't know what she's referring to. I don't either. Okay, can you go down, please? Okay, Jennifer Crumbly indicates at 402 that she's left work. Yes? Correct. I'm sorry, I'm maybe going too fast. Nope, you're good. 
Okay. And then if we can go down more, please. Um, this that jumped exhibits. Oh, I'm sorry. So 85. Can you go to the end of 85? Because it jumped to 86. Okay. So on 402, at 402, um, Jennifer Crumbly said that she left work. Correct. Okay. And the important thing about the 17th is showing that on that date, um, she was at the bar. Correct. And the next day is when is on the 18th when we have the text messages about. I'm sorry. March 19th, Exhibit 95. Do you have 95 in your hand? I guess I do not. I. Have it. I, it might. It would be easier probably to submit the whole thing and go page numbers, but I'm. Obviously, we're not going to do that. I'm just having a difficult time with these pages. Um, do you have Exhibit 95? I do not. I have 96. Okay. I am so sorry that this is a mess. I... Okay. On March 19th, I've got it up on the screen. Um, this is when this is when Jennifer Crumbly and James Crumbly are talking about um, Ethan acting like or seeming like he was way hungover that day. Correct. Correct. And it appears from the text that um, Jennifer is asking if he if he's okay. She says, how is he? Correct. Okay. Why is this doing this now? I am going to kill myself. Okay. Okay. So, he woke up acting like he had way too much to drink last night, complaining about a headache. That's what James said back to Jennifer, correct? Correct. And... Okay, Your Honor, I need like a minute, and I'm so sorry. Now I've got exhibits that are doubled on the page, and I'm having a really tough time with the exhibits. I apologize to the jury. Can I please have a minute? Okay, well, I'm, I'm trying to excuse them because... Can you help me get this Are you able to do it while they're here? Yeah, I'm trying to just get it Next time I excuse them, I'm going to send them home. I was, I was hoping to finish this witness. I, I, I need this task completion today. I like to... You know what, we can just leave it two pages on the screen. So right now it's got, on 440, page 441 is on the left, 442 is on the right. Okay, so starting with 441, um, this is where... The text says, well, he was really worked up and out of control, so I can see why. This is after they're talking about him waking up, correct? Correct. And Jennifer Crumbly texts, all I know is he needs to eat, go to work, work hard, not complain, and he can get his stuff back, correct? Correct. And James ends up saying that Ethan asked, why was I in your room last night? Correct. And Jennifer ultimately says she gave him a melatonin pill, or a melatonin tab, tablet. Correct. And James says to her, I thought you gave him a Xanax last night. Correct. And it's, it's evident from this that Ethan, or the shooter, the, their son, slept in their bed that night. Correct. And it appears that on March... Um, 19th, as the parents are talking, there was some kind of argument where something happened with their son the night before. Correct. And we don't know anything about what happened the night before on March 18th that preceded this whole conversation. Correct. It appears from the conversation 
on the 19th that something was taken away from him because it implies he can get his stuff back. And to direct on the form of the question, he can't testify what it implies or what it appears on well, what's on the phone. I'll, I'm sorry, I'll restate that. Okay. It, the text explicitly says if he does these things, he can get his stuff back. Correct. Okay. All right, now I'm going to skip ahead to the 20th of March in 2021. On the 20th, we admitted exhibits 97 through 100. The 96 are text messages dated March 20th. And the 97 starts with C pictures. Okay, so 96 are the um, are the text messages that are up on the screen. Do you do you see those? Yes, I do. Okay, I and it's on the 20th that that the shooter is saying things like, "I cleaned up and clothes started flying off the shelf." He's making other claims that something is happening that's not normal. Correct? I would say yes. Okay, he's making claims that. Things happen when he's home alone and trying to make his mother think things are flying off the shelf. That's what he said, yes. Okay. And you don't see any response from Jennifer Crumbly that day. Correct. And you showed the jury, we introduced and admitted all of the exhibits to show on that day she was at the barn again, correct? Correct. Now, you don't know what they talked about before or after she got home from the barn? Correct. All we know are that we have these couple of text messages um, making it sound like something is flying around in the house from, from Again, her Judge, I, I don't know how often I can say this. Objection in the form of the question. He can testify to what he found on the device. Yeah, he, doesn't, he doesn't know beyond that, right? Okay, I apologize. He wasn't there. Yeah. Okay, and so... So on the, the 20th, Mrs. Crumbly um, is obviously uh, at the barn. So we've talked now about March 8th, March 9th, the 17th, 19th, and 20th, correct? Correct. So we can agree that from the 8th through the 20th, we're talking about a period in time that's about 12 days long. Correct. And we're seeing, we've seen bits of the 8th, the 9th, 17th, 19th, and 20th. Correct. Okay. In April, <clears throat> April 4th are the dates of the texts between the shooter and his friend, correct? I, I would, there was a lot of text messages, I would assume, I believe they texted on that date. Okay. And I believe it is uh, Exhibit 101. Okay. I, I have 101 on the screen. Do you recall these? Correct. Yes, I do. Okay. Now, these texts on April 4th are between, we, we agree that they are between <clears throat> the shooter and his friend. That's correct. This is not a group chat where Mrs. Crumley is on it. That's correct. There is no evidence that these texts were ever forwarded to Jennifer Crumley. Correct. There is no evidence to show that Jennifer Crumley ever saw these text messages. Correct. For example, there isn't a text like, oh my gosh, you should see what our son sent to his friend today. There's nothing along those lines, correct? Well, not, not in this group. Are you talking about this chat still? I, I'm just saying in general, if you found evidence that Jennifer Crumbly saw these texts, that would be important. If she saw it, I would say yes. Okay. And we don't have anything to show she saw them? Not that was on the phone, no. So, on this text thread between the shooter and his friend, he talks about how he hears people talking and he sees someone in the distance, correct? That's correct. There's no response from his friend. Correct. We don't know if his friend saw those texts and didn't respond or if his friend didn't see those texts and the shooter just kept texting. 
right? They, they came in rapid order, so yeah, they were one after another, correct. Okay, so at, this is around, so 1156, and then we go down 1157, says it's at the point that I'm asking to go to the doctor, okay? That's one of the texts that you testified about, correct? Correct. There are not any texts where the shooter is saying anything to his mom and dad about, I want to go to the doctor. Correct. While he, while the shooter is saying this to his friend, we don't have any evidence that it's true whether the shooter really wanted to go to a doctor or not, correct? I mean, he said it multiple, a couple times. They well, talked about everything. In all the times that he talked about it, we, this jury is seen. You brought that in. Well, you haven't brought that in. I'm sorry. I keep misstating that. The evidence in this case um, is showing the jury what, what you gleaned from your investigation. Um, I don't understand. I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. In the investigation, there is not, you don't have any text messages where the shooter is saying to his mother anything about going to the doctor for hallucinations or anything along those lines. That's correct. Okay, if that did exist, the jury would be seeing that. That it would have been turned over to the prosecution, yes. Okay. So, in this case, when the shooter says, it's at the point I'm asking to go to the doctor, my mom left when I told her, Again, you have no idea if Mrs. Crumbly ever saw these texts between the shooter and his friend. Correct. And we can agree we don't have any more context than just this text thread um, that exists between these two. Judge, again, counsel is, is getting very close to running afoul of the motion that she filed to preclude evidence, Judge. There is a lot of context, but counsel requests Your, emotions. This is making it sound like there's evidence being hidden, and there's not. Okay, well, I've said there's no evidence being hidden. There's no evidence being hidden. But, okay, so, so I asked the next question. Okay. You're not aware of any communication between the shooter and his mother? No. Yes, he Correct. Okay, and when the shooter texts his friend, I was thinking of calling 911 so I could go to the hospital and text, I need help. There are no 911 calls, correct? Correct. There are no text messages to Mr. or Mrs. Crumbly saying those same types of things. Correct. And When he says, I am going to ask my parents to go to the doctor tomorrow or Tuesday again, we obviously don't know if that's true. Correct. And when he says, but this time I am going to tell them about the voices, okay, that's the next text, right? right. Yes. Okay. In his words, um, this is... He did not send that information to his mom and dad as far as you can see from his messages with them. Correct. So when we're talking about this whole text thread where at the end he says, like, I am mentally and physically dying, you also don't have any evidence that the friend who received these showed them to the shooter's mom, correct? Correct. There's no evidence that his friend did anything with these text messages beyond the fact that they exist. Correct. We don't know if... Judge, I, we just need to clarify. There are thousands and thousands, thousands of text messages. She needs to be more specific. Is she asking to comment on the 20,000 page text thread? Is she asking to comment comment on certain days. It isn't, it isn't fair to witness who reviewed all this information. Okay, well, is there any evidence that the friend shared anything with the parents? Not that I know of. 
Okay, thank you. Now, on April 29th, okay, so we've talked now about April 4th and 5th, the text between the shooter and his friend. Okay, we just finished that, correct? Correct. Okay, now I want to go to April 29th, and this is exhibit number 104. <coughs> you testified about a text thread that went between Jennifer Crumbly and the shooter's friend's mother, correct? Yes, ma'am. Now, in this text thread, the moms are, you would agree with me, talking about the difficulties of online school and how it's wreaked havoc, essentially, on their kids. Correct. Okay, and they start off by talking because Jennifer is telling the friend's mother that Ethan is not going to bowling, correct? Correct. And she says he's been acting kind of depressed. I don't know what's going on, correct? Correct. And she says, I'm not sure if there's something bothering him at school. He doesn't really feel good. I can't get anything out of him, correct? Correct. She doesn't say anything in here like he's seeing things, he's hallucinating, I'm noticing that he's paranoid, correct? Correct. She uses the word, he appears to be somewhat depressed. Depressed is the word she uses. Correct. In terms of the word depressed, that could have meanings. Objection, speculation. He's not going to explain what being depressed is. Well, that was, that was actually my exact question, was just, you can't explain what it means. That was my question. It means different things to different people in different professions. Right? You answered my question. That was my question. Thank you. Okay. I'm sorry, may I continue? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, then they're talking about how the shooter and his friend are happy when they're together, and Mrs. Crumbly was concerned, based on these text messages, that there had been something going on between the shooter and his friend, but it's clear that's not an issue, correct? Correct. So these text messages, Mrs. Crumbly is, is, you would agree with me that overall, she is indicating an interest in figuring out what's wrong with her son. She's, she's pointing out things that she's aware of. Okay. And... This text thread, there are more texts between Jennifer Crumbly and the friend's mother, correct? Correct. And there's one other set that um, we're going to talk about, but this evidence about, there's not any further explanation of what the word depressed means in the messages or not, correct? Correct. All we have is what's in these, these text messages. Um, I'm sorry, scratch that. Okay, so this is on um, 429. We can agree that obviously on that date, Mrs. Crumbly made representation representations using the word depressed. Correct. The next set of text messages with the shooter's friend's mother were admitted as Exhibit 105, and we can agree these are months and months later in October of 2021, correct? That's correct. So this jury is seeing texts from April 29th and then October 31st. That's correct. On October 31st, 
there is discussion between Jennifer and the shooter's friend's mother about the decision they had to make to send the, to send the friend away, correct? I, there wasn't discussion. It, they, she didn't reply back to the 4th of November, but Jennifer met, texted her or sent a message to her. Okay, send a message to her asking how they're doing, saying they're thinking about them. Correct. Okay, and the friend's mom writes back, talking about how hard it is. I appreciate you checking in our family, those kind of things, correct? Correct. And in these texts, Jennifer mentions, I know Ethan misses him, meaning his friend, correct? Correct. And she's asking just, how how things are going for for the friend who's away? Correct. Okay. Now, at the end of these text messages, there's a few texts from December of 2021. Correct. Correct. Now, those text messages are not about anything related to. Um, the shooter being sad or depressed, correct? Those text messages are, are after the shooting has taken place, correct? Correct. And those text messages, um, there's not many. We're, we're only talking about a couple. The friend's mother asks if Ethan is safe on November 30th, correct? Correct. So on the day of the shooting, when the friend's mother asks at 347, is Ethan home safe? It would be fair, and if you don't know the answer, you can tell me, it would be fair to assume she's asking, is he safe from the shooting? He can't answer that question, and these are Facebook messages, not, not text. Yeah, he doesn't know. Okay. So Jennifer Crumbly says, I'm sure you've seen the news and ultimately says, I'm sick, sick to my stomach, correct? Correct. And she mentions to the friend's mother that they're getting threats all over social media, which is something we talked about earlier, correct? Correct. And she also says that they're staying in a hotel because the news is camped out at their house. Correct. Yes. yes. Testimony, we admitted some, you admitted some GPS location um, information. Mm -hmm. Yes. And if you need to see the exhibits, let me know, but I think these will be simple questions. When you provided the jury evidence that James was at the gun store on the 26th, we can agree Jennifer was not at the store when the gun was purchased, correct? Correct. And when that day there was a video on the 26th that the shooter made of him holding the gun. It's a short video that was admitted as Exhibit 417. Do you recall that little video? Yes, I do. And in that little video, we can't see who else is around while the shooter is, is filming himself with holding the Sig Sauer gun. In the video, correct. And we don't know, <coughs> obviously, who was present in the home or in the room even with him. Correct. That was the day the gun was bought. Correct. And the shooter took that video himself as far as we can tell. It was on his phone, yes. It was and, on his phone. And he, um, and it was a video that he sent to, to, it was a, I'm sorry, let me back up. There were also photographs taken that day of the gun. Correct. The day they purchased it. Correct. Jennifer Crumley actually posted a photo that was taken of the gun. 
After they went to the gun range? No, the, the day before. On Friday, the day the gun was bought, do you, and if you don't recall, you can just, I believe it came in through the witness before you, and if it, so if you don't know, you can just let me know. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, thank you. So the gun was purchased on the 26th, and the next day is Saturday the 27th, correct? Correct. On the 27th, we know that James Crumbly was door dashing that day. Correct. That's the day that the shooter and his mother went to the gun range. Correct. That is the day where there was posts about a mother son experience at the range, at the, uh, at the, in terms of shooting the gun, going to shoot the gun. I remember those, yes. Okay. Now, there is not any information about where the gun was stored or placed in the Crumbly's home overnight between the 26th and the 27th. Judge, I'm going to object. These exhibits weren't introduced to this witness. It's, it's inappropriate to ask this witness of those questions. Agent Brandon testified yesterday the same questions that she asked to him at cross-examination. He doesn't have the foundation to, to give that sort of testimony. Well, I guess I don't understand the question. Are you asking, is there any communication on a, on a text or a Facebook or a picture about whether the guns were stored, where they were stored or where they were Yeah. Left? Okay, so did, did you... The, on the phones, no, I did not find. Also, on the, the, very, the very minimum, he should be given the opportunity to review the exhibit before he's asked that. <laughs> I don't know if she specifically asked him about exhibit. She was asking about Instagram posts. Oh, the Instagram post. Okay. All right. There's no Instagram posts about storage or being locked up or anything like that. Not that I saw, no, ma'am. Okay. You so didn't see any locked guns on Instagram. Locked guns, no. And the evidence that you showed us from the 27, there's not any information about who um, put the gun in the vehicle that drove the gun to the to the target, uh, to the shooting range, correct? I don't know anything about that. We don't know anything about who did anything aside from the fact that we know when Mrs. Crumbly and her son went over to the shooting range. I don't know anything about the transportation of the gun, no. Okay. We know when they got to the range that Mrs. Crumbly and her son went in and they shot some targets, correct? Correct. We, well, the ATF guy testified to that. Do you know that? What, what, uh, video? I do know the video, yes. Oh, okay. The gun range video? All right. I have seen it. Okay. Okay. And... In terms of the text messages and all the evidence that you have reviewed, from the night of the 27th to the 28th, there is not, there are not any text messages or Facebook messages about where the gun was that night, where it was in the home, where, where it was in general, correct? Correct. I don't know anything okay. about that. In these same days that the Crumbleys, that Mr. Crumbly bought the gun, and Mom and Ethan, I'm sorry, Mom and the shooter went to the shooting range. From the evidence that you've talked about in front of the jury, it's clear one of their horses has some kind of an issue, um, a health issue going on. Correct. Correct. So as the evidence is unfolding. Um, about what's happening on those days in terms of what the parents were doing, there's also talk about medication for the horse and, and things along those lines. Correct. When you testified about the search on Mrs. Crumbly's phone about clinical depression, you don't know anything other than what was... Uh, typed in when she searched for for information about clinical depression, correct? Correct. You don't know if that was her looking up information for herself? 
Correct. You don't know if that's looking for information mm -hmm. about the shooter? Correct. Or if it's looking up information about some other person? That's correct. Does that sound right? Yes, ma'am. Of November. Yes. I'm sorry, of November. Yes. Okay. And that was the day that the voicemail was left that was played as evidence as Exhibit 115 from Ms. Fine. Do you know what voicemail I'm talking about? Yes, I recall it. Okay. So going a little bit backwards, um, that day, on that Monday, the voicemail indicates that Ethan was caught looking at bullets during on his phone, correct? That's correct. The voicemail we know, we saw lots of evidence, was left on Jennifer's cell phone. Correct. We know Jennifer Crumbly listened to the voicemail. That's correct. We all heard the voicemail. Correct. And the voicemail did not ask Jennifer Crumbly to call back, to return the phone call, correct? I don't believe so. That message indicated that Ethan was not in any trouble, but this, the teacher wanted, or Ms. Fine wanted to make Mrs. Crumbly aware that Judge, they had the a discussion. the exhibit speaks for itself. He can't interpret the exhibit. Yeah, that, that's the best evidence of what was said, right? Okay. They can all, you can have all the exhibits, so you can listen to it again. Thank you. The conversation, um, in that conversation, there is talk about, I, I can play the exhibit, it's, I'm just going to ask about one quote, and if I need to play the exhibit, then I'll, I'll play it. Okay, let's hear the question. At the end of the at the end of the um, voicemail, Miss Fine says that it's perfectly normal and healthy. I can't remember what she was referring to when she said that, but I do remember those words. Okay, the tone of that conversation was was not one that. Well, I'm sorry. The content of that conversation did not ask Mrs. Crumbly to come over to the school or anything along those lines, correct? Correct. And then we did see evidence um, that you testified about showing that Mrs. Crumbly asked her son about that voicemail, correct? Correct. And her text to him was evidence we saw as Exhibit 117, where she writes to her son, seriously? Bullets, correct? Correct. And he, we saw the exchange in Exhibit 117. The shooter writes back to her, um, I'm in no trouble. Correct. Judge, counsel the has to show the witness the exhibits. I can do that. I'm sorry. In the entire exhibit. Okay, we'll do the whole thing. All right, so this is Exhibit 117. And as I asked, and I think you already answered, it starts off seriously looking up bullets in school. Correct. Um, and the, the Jennifer's son responds, I already went to the office for that. He admits he was. We can agree that's the content of this conversation, correct? Was that, that he went to the office for that? That's the last thing you said. He says that he went, I already went to the office for that. Yes, correct. Okay, so I'm moving down, and he's explaining, or at least texting, um, what he was looking up and saying it's because he was curious. Correct. In his words, on page 199, he says, completely harmless. Correct. And based on the voicemail that we heard from Ms. Fine, 
it sounded like objection sounded like okay I, I, I apologize I'll move on Jennifer told her son the school left me a voicemail correct correct and asked them asked her son did you show them your new gun correct and obviously he says no he did not and says I did not show them the pick my god correct okay um again says it was a harmless act correct gives more explanation to her correct and ultimately at the end of the conversation he asks if he can hear the voicemail later and she says she saved it correct After that, there's conversation that was admitted in Exhibit 118. I've put it on the screen. <coughs> Judge, if counsel is just going to read exhibits, it's not a cross-examination. And I, I want to get to my reader. I want to finish this witness today. Finish this witness. Your Honor, I find that when I'm asking questions, if I don't go step by step, I, I have to go backwards and go step by you, step you by step by step. You have to follow the step. rules of evidence. You can't ask the witness to guess. Yeah, there are some questions that could just simply be answered, and they're not being answered. So I have to go step by step by step okay, when it's not it. happening. Let's do it. Well, yeah, but they're sort of hearing the same. <coughs> the evidence that was admitted as Exhibit 118 shows... There was a conversation between James and Jennifer Crumbly about the issue with the bullets at school. Correct. timeline from November 30th, 2021, um, in great detail earlier. You would agree with that? Correct. And obviously, um, you've collected all of the information you could from the 30th off the cell phones of James Crumbly, Jennifer Crumbly, and the shooter um, to look at in your investigation. Correct. It's fair to say that you did not seek a search warrant for people at the school who dealt with the shooter that day. Hold on. To clarify the form of the question, seek a search warrant for the people at the school. I don't. That's not even an who, investigative who, who? method. Okay. A search warrant for who? For the people, right, exactly. Yeah, there's a lot All right, sorry. I'll back up. And for what? Okay, you're aware that Jennifer and James Crumbly went to the school. We saw the video of them walking in for the appointment, correct? Correct. You're aware they met with Sean Hopkins? Correct. You're aware there was conversation in a meeting? Correct. You did not at any time seek the messages off of the devices of Mr. Hopkins, correct? That's not for me to decide. That's the officer in charge of the case to decide what to collect and bring to me to uh, get data for them. Okay, so that's not something you did. That's my only question. It's not something that we would do in computer crimes, correct? Now, when the text was sent at 931, the first thing that Mrs. Crumbly, that we can tell she received that morning, that was of alarm was the the altered math sheet but that the shooter had written on correct and the could you pull it pull it up real quick just so i could see sure so that was exhibit 123 
Correct. Okay. Okay. So exhibit 123. Now, when we say altered math sheet, the shooter initially wrote things on a math paper that was introduced um, as a different exhibit. It was introduced as exhibit 74. And I'll, I'll open that up. So I've got exhibit 74 on the right. And we can agree that was initially what the shooter wrote on his map paper. Correct. And after making writing all the writings on Exhibit 74, he added to the map paper and added the things that we see on Exhibit 123. Correct. Now, the first thing that, that Mrs. Crumley receives is Exhibit 123, which is the altered drawing, correct? Correct. And in terms of what's on the drawing, it speaks for itself, but it has things like, I love my life so much, harmless act, we're all friends here. It, it has a bunch of, of writings like that on there. It, the jury can see what's on there. It speaks for itself, fair to say? It does, yes. Okay. And when Mrs. Crumbly got that, we know that she immediately, because we have the timestamps, sent Mr. Crumbly a message to let him know um, what, that something was going on. Correct. And in the text messages, or Facebook messages, which were admitted as Exhibit 125, and I'll put it up. It's specifically, she, um, Mrs. Crumbly specifically sent uh, photos over to, I'm sorry, scratch that. Jennifer's first message at 9.33, says, call now, now being in capital letters, correct? Correct. And emergency. Correct. And her next text right after says emergency again. Correct. And then we know that Mr. Crumbly texts back. Correct. And that's in another, a separate, um, it's further down in the thread. And his response is, my God, WTF, which stands for what the fuck, correct? Correct. So the parents, we can agree that as soon as the map paper is received by Jennifer Crumbly, there's, there's conversation between the parents. Correct. In addition to the messages, there's also phone conversation. Correct. And at 10.04, we know that Jennifer Crumbly is heading to the school, physically going to the school, correct? Correct. And at 10.05, we can see She's sending texts saying, I'm very concerned. Correct. We know, obviously, they get to the school and have a meeting with the counselor. Correct. And we know that that meeting only lasted 12 minutes, 12 minutes long. That was your testimony. Correct. We don't have any kind of record or recording of that meeting in the counselor's office. Not that I've made aware of, no. Correct. After leaving the counselor's office, we have the text messages that Jennifer Crumbly sent Kira Pennick. Correct. Okay. We have text messages um, that Jennifer Crumbly sent Andy Smith, which were introduced and admitted. Correct. And it's fair to say that Jennifer Crumbly is telling at least those, those people 
about what's going on with her son or that she's dealing with something. Correct. Now, we know Jennifer Crumley goes back to work. We saw the exhibit showing her re-entering back at her office. Correct. Okay. And we know that at some point there's obviously a notice out um, that was admitted. The Oxford High School has a, sh um, there's an alarm of a, an active shooter, correct? Yes, correct. Upon hearing that, we saw all of the evidence about um, Mr. and Mrs. Crumbly heading back to the school, correct? Correct. And all of that evidence speaks for itself in terms of the timeline of events that happened. And you went through those times on the record already, so we don't need to do that again. Correct. In those messages, there was not anything from Jennifer Crumbly saying anything along the lines of, I think Ethan might shoot people today. It's actually the form of the question, anything along the lines. Okay, I'll, I'll rephrase. Jennifer Crumbly the text messages that we have are the extent of the text messages. Um, you've provided everything from November 30th. Um, everything we've gone through, there's not more text messages that this jury is not seeing. Is that a fair statement? Uh, on, on, this, on, on, November on, 30th. on November 30th. Correct. Okay. And... We can see the messages that Jennifer sent over to her son at the time. We, you introduced those when you testified. Correct. And there's various exchanges, um, obviously, between them that speak for themselves, and the jury can read those. There were exchanges, yes. Okay. And... There is a message that says, ultimately, from Mrs. Crumbly, and if you need to see it, you can let me know, Ethan, don't do it. After he was in custody, yes. She sent, that message was sent. And at the time that message was sent, we don't know what Jennifer Crumbly knew in her head. Correct. All we can do is look at the evidence um, and and read what's what's before us and what's been admitted in the testimony. In the text messages? Yes. Correct. You testified about um, alarm images in Exhibits 149 and 150. Do you recall that? I do, yes. Okay, so I'm going to go, I'm going to just put up 149 um, and 150. Okay, and I just want to make sure I understand this correctly. This was an alarm clock on the track phone. Is that right? Correct. So this is an alarm clock set for 6.30 in the morning and 6.45 in the morning for, that would have been for Saturday, November, I'm sorry, December 4th. Correct. Is that accurate? Yes. Okay, so this, these alarms, from what you can tell, um, were set on the day before on the 3rd. Correct. Okay, and then again, we, 
there was some testimony, and I, I believe we've mostly covered this. I Ultimately, when you looked at the cell phone, between Jennifer Crumbly and Kira Pennick, you testified, I believe, that there were 26 messages still on the phone. Correct. And from the data, you could see there was actually 4,047 that existed at one time between them. Correct. So, obviously, many messages had been deleted between Kira and Jennifer Crumbly by Jennifer Crumbly on her phone. That's correct. And again, um, there's not any texts or anything that say that have explanations about deleting things. All we know is that they were deleted. Correct, you said yes. May I have one moment, please? So there's also, I just have one point of clarification and then I'm done, I promise. There are some messages that say that they are unsent. What's the difference between unsent or deleted? Deleted would tell me that it's just not there anymore. You would delete the message that says it was unsent even. Okay, so is so the unsent messages, it's possible for someone to send a message to someone else, but before it's received to unsend it and recall it back. Is that a fair statement? I believe also if it was received that you can unsend it, you can pull it back, yes. Okay. And throughout some of the evidence we've seen, there it appears that messages were unsent at times. Correct. Okay. I have nothing further. Um, tell me how long you need for redirection. I'll finish today. Okay. Just give me a few minutes. All right. Okay. Now... Let's talk first about the deleted messages on the message between Jennifer and Brian Maloche. So when you looked at the return, it didn't just say unsent, it had the red X insignia next to it. What does that signify to you? That it is deleted. Okay, so clearly Jennifer Crumley knew how to delete those messages. Correct. Okay, and in fact she deleted ones that said we're on the run again. That's correct. And we're fucked. Correct. Okay, and I want to talk to you just really quickly about this word right here. It was a harmless act. Does that signify anything to you? Yes, it does. It How so? It was also written on the modified um, math paperwork. Harmless act, right there. Okay, that's Exhibit 123. And Jennifer was sent that. Correct. And she was sent that on November the 30th before the shooting. That's correct. She was also sent this, People 74. And people 74, the shooter wrote, help me. Correct. She was sent that, and she saw that. Yes, sir. Okay. And then she communicated about that with her husband. Correct. Okay. Now, you were asked lots and lots and lots of questions about, is there any evidence of, did you find any evidence of certain topics? So, specifically with deleted content, you can't tell if there's something that was deleted but unable to be recovered by search warrant. That's correct. And we've already established that Jennifer Crumbly knew how to delete. In fact, she did delete certain messages. Correct. All right. And one message in particular she deleted from to Kira Pennock was that picture of this drawing. Correct. Okay. And speaking of that, that exhibit between Jennifer Crumbly and Kira Pennock, that's, that's People's 130. In those exhibits, they're in front of you if you want to look at them, there's about 28 pictures. They're screenshots. So there are many communications regarding her horses. Yes, sir. Okay. So one of the first things she does after the, the meeting or is say, I can't, or after the shooting rather, is I won't be able to make it there tonight. Is that correct? Uh, I believe that's correct. I can look it up. Take a look. And tell us the time that came in, too. Thank you. 
don't see it real, real quick. That's right. I'll pull it for you. Two thirty-six p.m. Kira, I won't be there tonight. Okay, it's on the screen. Okay, that's part of Exhibit One Thirty. And that is the shooting ended at one p.m. So that's an hour and thirty-six minutes after he was taken into custody. Correct. I see it now. Yes. That's six minutes after she arrived home from the substation, after she was brought there. Correct. And that's the last time she saw her son. Correct. Six minutes after. Okay. So you were asked about a lot of questions about this this uh, Facebook chat here, including a particular message where Jennifer says, "I wish there had been some kind of warnings." Correct. Okay. I remember that. But she sent this to Kira, and this is the picture where he said, help me, with the picture of, or he wrote, help me, with the picture of the firearm. Correct. Okay. And she deleted that, though. She later on deleted that particular text that she sent to Kira. Correct. Now, you were asked a lot of questions about this big stack of these messages between James and Jennifer Crumley. Do you remember those questions from counsel? Yes, sir. Okay. And um, you were asked if there were certain messages about um, any other, any message that Jennifer had about my son's going to shoot the school, things like that. I remember that, yes. Okay. You have had a chance to review some of those messages, or, or all of those messages? Yes. Okay. And uh, was there anything in the messages indicating they were going to take him to see a therapist? No, there was not. Anything in there indicating they were worried and they wanted to take him to see a psychiatrist? No, there was not. Was there any time they tried to set up any mental health counseling? No. In the phone logs or text messages from the period after the school meeting to the shooting, were there any indications that they researched any mental health professionals? No, there was not. Did they call any counseling offices? No, they were. No, did they, they did call not. any psychiatrists? No. I'd like you just referring to that message and, and judge for the record again. I'd like to omit the entire thread that is Exhibit Four Twenty Three. That's the entire Facebook thread between James and Jennifer Crumbly. I'd like to have that available for the jury if they want to look at that. Your Honor, I would have no objection to that as long as we redact the things that this court's already deemed inadmissible. Okay. I, that would be fine. Okay, I don't recall specifically what those are, but if there's already been a ruling and things have been redacted, then I would like those taken, taken out. Certainly. Okay. Certainly. <clears throat> um, sir, if you could, referring to that, what would be Exhibit 423, contrast for the jury, please, the amount of time in messages between James and Jennifer Crumley regarding their horses with their messages regarding their son. Your Honor, I would object. I, there needs to be a foundation that he can even determine this or has okay. data to sure. support this. Sure. Did you look at the messages? I looked at the messages, yes. Okay. Are you able to contrast the amount of time in messages between James and Jennifer Crumley regarding their horses versus Your Honor, their son? I would object. This is misleading and speculative, and it's there's <laughs> there's been... Lots of talk about things that have been deleted, that we don't have all the messages. So I would object, Your Honor. Judge, the, for the record, the point is that counsel asked, is there any evidence of? When okay. this witness has already testified to so things are deleted, and he's going to testify what's actually on threat. Okay. okay, I'm eating your dust a little bit here. Okay, first of all, you want 423 text messages between... Um, Facebook messages. Facebook, Facebook messages between Mr. and Mrs. Crumley admitted in a redacted form. I'm going to ask that um, the redacted form be verified by Ms. Smith, and then I'll uh, admit 423 because you do, do not object. Thank you. Okay, you, want, you want him to ask him. Um, um, he, he's going to be estimating, obviously. It's, I'm asking for an estimation. And, Your Honor, I was not allowed to ask his interpretation of topics or words that were in there. And so for the prosecutor to ask this question, that's asking him to interpret how often they're talking about various topics. That's the same kind of question I was asking and I was prohibited from asking. Well, so you asked him to interpret something that someone said or what they thought, I, they can't do. I also asked questions about, in those text messages, there was nothing about, our, I believe our son could be a shooter. And that was objected to and he wasn't able no, he, to he answer. There were other questions along the same lines where I was not able to talk about. No, the he answered that there were no that there were no communications like that. He, he answered that. If you had another example, I, I, he re, he reviewed all of these te the text messages. He also said some were deleted. 
uh, he looked up the Facebook, right? 423 Correct. is going to be admitted, so it can be argued later. I, I will withdraw okay. my objection. Okay. Could you contrast for us the amount of messages between James and Jennifer Crumley regarding their horses with the messages regarding their son? I would say there was a vast majority of just discussing their horses and putting ointments on their legs and getting the vest to see them. If I had to put a number on it, it would be upwards of it. 75, 80% of the conversation. Over what period of time do we know? With, the, with that volume right there. Oh, okay. When does that start and when does it end? It's early in 2021. Early 2021. Okay. All right. Thank you. Now, what about the percentage of time expressing concern over their sons? Up you until. Know, I, I object. I, this is speculation, and there is no way for He doesn't have data on this. Uh, there's, I mean, just the one, the conversation after the pictures were sent, the, the, the that he drew in the, um, on the math paper, and there's a couple other conversations about him having a headache and that, but other than that, I don't, can't remember any more conversations. So I, I have some data. You're going to make us listen to data? No, well, this is just, just the one question. Um, does this sound right to you that... Your Honor, I object to leading this witness into this. If he has data, he can testify about it. If he doesn't have data, this Does is inappropriate. people are entitled to lead into the question. Okay. Um, if you were to put a name search, because it's, it's a PDF, right? So you can do a name search. Correct. And if you were to do a name search of their son, you could find how many times their son was mentioned. That's correct. Okay. And if you were to do a name search of either their horses' names or horses, you could find how many times that was mentioned. That's correct. Okay. Your Honor, this is going so far beyond the scope of... No, it, it's not. This is, this is, you, asked, you asked about this. You asked about this. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Would it surprise you that it's thousands and thousands and thousands different? It would not at all. Thank you. Now... <clears throat> You, sir, um, were asked a lot of questions about March 9th, March 8th, March 17th, March 19th, and March 20th. It's that area of spring of 2021 that we talked about where the defendant's <coughs> son was text messaging his mother and, and where James and Jennifer were at. Correct. Okay. Yeah, I remember, yes. So you were asked specifically, are you able to tell if Jennifer Crumbly saw those messages coming? Do you remember those questions? Yes, I remember those questions. Okay. I want to make clear that all of that information, all that evidence that was admitted on those days came from Jennifer Crumbly's original phone. Correct. Okay. So, if she wouldn't have received it because either her phone was off or no service, it wouldn't have had the same timestamps that we see in here. Correct. Okay. So, the timestamp of 603 on her phone, the exhibit, that means that's the time it actually got to her phone. Correct. Okay. And let me ask you something, sir. I don't think you need to be an expert to, to identify this. But when you get when you take a picture, do you have to open your phone? I mean, you have to you have to access the app to take the picture. Yes. Right. Do you have to look at your phone? Not necessarily. You just push the button on the side. You have side. to hold it up and push a button. Correct. Okay. And so when we have pictures on Jennifer's phone from the exact same time that her son is sending your text messages, what does that tell you? That she would have seen them. Right. Now we asked. You were asked about the alarm sent on December the 4th of 2021 and there was a it was up on the screen it's an exhibit I remember um, it was set for 6 30 a.m. and 6 45 a.m. on December the 4th 2021 correct okay and it said when it was set it said from seven hours and, and 30 minutes from now. correct so then we can tell that she actually set that alarm at around 11 p.m. on Friday December the 3rd that's correct were you aware that Detroit police were actually on scene at that date and time, at that specific time, at the location where she was found? Your Honor, I object in terms of, if he knows, if he knows. If I would, at, at the, I, oh, yeah, I, what is the objection? Well, the objection is the lack of foundation about whether he knows. Well, you can tell us. Well, he can tell us if he knows. I don't know. <coughs> I was not aware when Detroit police was... Okay. You were aware that they were on scene that evening? Yes, I was. Okay. Yes, I am. You were also asked about um, what counsel referred to as threats and her, Jennifer Crumlin, receiving threats. Do you remember those questions? Yes. Okay. 
And you didn't just review the Facebook message between Jennifer Crumbling and Kira Penick. You also reviewed other Facebook messages, other tr uh, chats. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. And um, including the chat where she's communicating with a neighbor of hers on East Street. And James and Jennifer Crumbling met her at the Red Naps in Oxford the night of the shooting to exchange pet food. <coughs> I remember that. Okay. Now, how close is the Red Naps to her home? It's just down the road. It's right in downtown Oxford, yep, right? Correct. Like a block away. Correct. You were asked specifically about Exhibit 130 here. If Jennifer Crumbly expressed some sort of concern over what her son did. Right here. It's, I'm bawling right now, Kira. My son so ruined so many lives today. Yes, correct. Okay. Now, that was substantially after... She was asking to sell her horses for cash. Correct. Asking cash stats. I think we Correct. Have stats. Yes. Okay. And there is there any any text messages at all in this exhibit expressing any sort of sympathy over the victims after this? Not that I recall. And in fact, the conversation continues about liquidating her assets. Correct. Okay. And it continues about her not being able to see her horses. That's correct. And expressing how upset she is that she can't see her horses. That's correct. Nothing further, good. Courtney, next up to you. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, during this trial, do not read, listen to, or watch any news reports about the case. Under the law, the evidence you consider to decide the case must meet certain standards. For example, witnesses must swear to tell the truth and the lawyers must be able to cross-examine them. Because if news reports do not have to meet these standards, they could be incorrect or misleading information that might unfairly favor one side or the other. So to be fair to both sides, you must follow this instruction. You must not go on social media, you must not post, you must not do research, you must not discuss the case with anyone. Um, we're moving quickly. Please follow my instruction. It's it's so important. I don't want to have to put you in the local holiday in. All right? I can still do it. Okay? So follow my instructions so that we don't have to do that. Okay? I'm going to have you um, return at 8.30 on Monday. Um, don't look at anything over the weekend. I should have served you some vitamins with your lunch. Uh, please stay healthy and go on. <laughs> All right for the jury? Objections to many of his exhibits that are proposed. Who is it? Uh, off, uh, Stoyak, Stoyak. I'm not sure I'm saying Stoyak. I'm Stoyak. Not, Stoyak. Okay. And your honor, I I just want to make the record clear. I received all of the materials in this case in over 30 discovery um, sets of discovery given to me. Okay. okay. I went through all the discovery obviously as it came in. I did not get the exhibits that were being used in this trial. Um, I, they weren't identified. I didn't get them until after day one of jury selection. So I have done my best. Wait a minute, there's a, there's a scheduling order in this case. Judge, all of the exhibits come from the discovery. This digital evidence was turned over 
two years ago. Well, she doesn't say she didn't have the evidence. I, I'm not saying I didn't have the evidence. I'm okay. saying that it wasn't identified until after day one of jury selection. So I just want the court to know I'm doing my best to object and to handle the I, evidence. I don't envy your job, Ms. Smith, at all. I don't. It's, it's a lot. I don't envy their job either. It, it, the, it, it's sad. It's voluminous. I, I, I know it's very difficult. I know it's very difficult. But so, t so, t so, so tell me what you're asking. Okay, so the, so the issue is I have numerous objections to exhibits they intend to admit. I know the court does not like to have objections, but... The no, that's not true. I didn't, I didn't want to rule on... on uh, uh, I didn't want a surprise ruling on, uh, on a motion this morning. I would have been more prepared and also would have told the jury about it. I don't like the jury waiting for us. Judge, There's nothing wrong with objecting to an exhibit as um, someone attempts to introduce it. Judge, well, we handed over the exhibit list with very precise pages, and we did that. There wasn't, we weren't required to at a certain time, but we did right. that, I, I think, the first day we were here. Ms. Smith told Mr. Keese she would be providing her exhibit list to us that night. We did not receive it. So I'm not sure what the purpose of providing an exhibit list is if she's not going to actually go through it and say, these are the ones I want to object to, these are the ones I have an issue with, and we can talk about it, and then the court, the court knows that there's something to argue about before we bring the jury in. Your Honor. Okay, well, I think that's what she's trying to tell me now. I'm trying to tell you that now, and also, every time we've been off the record, I've had conversations with Mr. Keyes during this next witness. I'm not objecting to any of these exhibits. Mr. Keyes, I plan to object to a lot of the photos okay. with Stoic. I haven't talked to Ms. McDonald, but that doesn't mean I haven't communicated to them when I have objections. Okay. That is just misleading, and okay. I'm, I'm tired of it. Okay. okay. I, I'm not... I'm just, okay, I'm not, I'm not making, I'm saying, I just want to know what the objections are so we don't have it. It'd be um, great if we could know that before. Can, um, can they, how long are we going to be here? Because the jury, I got to release, the jury's waiting for her to be brought down. So I, I'm, I'm pushing them up with the deputies here. We have so, a few, a few more things. We're just asking, let's, let's hear what the jury. objections are about the exhibits. The jury. I'm going to release the jury. Okay. For one thing, these walls are not, are great with that. Uh, and, I'm, the deputies are, I'm going to owe the deputies during that segregate for the rest of my career. Yes. Yeah, let, let's let the jury go, okay? Can we let the jury go? Your Honor, I, I have just a, a suggestion. I, I think there's going to be evidentiary issues with some of these exhibits. Okay. So I'm wondering if maybe the jury should come back at 9.30 on Monday or something. Actually, can you tell the jury to come back at 9? Uh, tell the jury to come back at 9. Okay. okay. Just right, so we have time. Say. I know the court okay. doesn't want to waste their time. Well, I, you know, I... You do uh, handle one exhibit at a time. There's nothing wrong with that. People do that in trials all the time. But obviously, if we can uh, streamline in any way and not do it while the jury's here and have not, them not moving in and out since they're 17 and up, um, that would be good. I guess I don't know who the first witness is going to be on Monday. There is an officer, Stoyak, who is with what department? Sheriff's Office, Judge. We don't know if it'll be first witness. No, and she, she's let us know she has some issues with some of those pictures. Okay. And we'll figure if she tells us which ones, then we'll decide if we want to stipulate. If not, then we'll, we can handle it before the, the jury's. Oh, I can already it. tell you they're not going to stipulate. I, I can tell you we're no, going to need time I, on the record. Think, like, okay, well, I think I, the I'm not sure how to respond to that. Well, no, wait. I think, that, I think that the prosecutor was asking, saying that you might stipulate to the admission of some of them, right? And you have a right to object to something being, being admitted, right? Right. These, right. Okay, so I'm looking at the list. There's, there's many photos from inside the home okay. that I believe are contrary to the orders this court has already given. Like the messiness, there are irrelevant photos. There are photos of the stairway to the basement, completely irrelevant to this case. Why do we care about the stairway to the basement? Judge, we counsel my, she indicated she was going to create a list of which exhibit numbers, they're numbered already, they're numbered, right. and just tell us which ones she's object to. We'll review that. If we agree, then we won't. We'll strike them from our exhibit list. Okay, we and talk about this. to talk about it at at, at um, eight thirty on Monday morning because maybe we can. can we, we could can, get a list before that, then we yeah. might not have to argue about it. Your Honor, part of the problem is I. They won't tell me who they're calling. They gave me the exhibits after the trial. The list of exhibits after the trial started. <coughs> There's one of me. I have co-counsel that has not been with me this whole ride. And so I'm doing the best I can, and I have to sleep at night, 
And okay, I've been here for eight hours a day this so whole we've week. All been here. I've, I've spent many, 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 many hours on this case. Many. And so, as I know. a prosecution, I know there's only one of you, but you're also retained counsel. I, I understand that, yeah. but I, I need, and this weekend, thankfully, I'll have time. Okay. I will get them the list of objections, okay. but right, when yes, I when I don't even know which witnesses are being called the next day. Okay, I don't, I, I, I don't know of a rule that obligates them to do that. Well, and judge, have, judge, you asked we, us to communicate, and we did. We did. We did. We did. Okay. She, she knew Lance uh, Lugarowski no, was good. I mean, we did tell okay. her. All right. So over the weekend, hopefully they're going to do the same. Over the weekend, will you tell them your your the witnesses you're going to call Monday? Will you do that? We, we tell her every single day when she no, has to be our list. But we do. Not if, I can, at night. if I can just finish. Okay, I'm I can sure just finish. Oh yeah, exactly. We have we already changed that today. I mean, okay. that does change. But but we. I, I, if, what are you going to tell her about? When we can confirm child care for our witnesses okay. and confirm, we have one person with COVID right now. We have one person out of the state. We're rearranging witnesses in real time. Okay. What objection, non-responsive? Um, can you tell her Sunday by noon? I, I hope to have those answers by then. And sure. I'll communicate as soon as I have okay. the answers. It's, I, it, I don't think they're obligated to do that. On the other hand, it is a courtesy, and it, it is something that helps the uh, trial move quicker. I, I think it should just be fair. It For instance, also, we oh don't no, have we don't want this we, to be fair. we don't have a we don't have an exhibit list from the defense. She said she provided um, the same time we did that <coughs> night. We don't have it. We just, I didn't we just say want to be treated. I provided that night, and okay. I uh, didn't know what exhibits I would need until I saw your list. And I haven't had time this week because we've been in court. Okay. Or okay, all right, all right. Yeah, I I'm obligated to be fair to both sides, right? I, I the, this exhibit list, regardless of when you got it, to me has been very helpful. It's descriptive of thank you where and when and because you know some of the you can some of them all yeah, like that. some I, of them all like that. Your Honor, I I don't disagree, but also okay. some of mine don't match what's been put up on the screen. Like it's it, it's not as simple and as clear cut. I have this weekend, which is going to give me time. Okay, okay good, good. Yeah. Okay. They're they're going to communicate with you, and if you tell them which ones you object to, um, I don't know if I've seen some of these. Some of these are in the house. Some of them might be relevant. Some of them might not be. I don't think you've seen any of them. What's that? I don't think you've seen any of them. They, no. Judge, think. listen. If she just make a list, we'll be happy to review it with her. So you don't have to. Please. Okay. So you're going to be here at eight thirty on Monday morning. We'll, we'll talk. We'll talk about as many exhibits as possible. In general, they they, they can go question and answer and all that, but if, if we can agree on some beforehand, I'm just going to pray that by Monday morning there are no issues. Can I do that? Can I go to the river in Egypt? Judge, regarding Exhibit 423, counsel, yeah. counsel indicated that there are certain messages she wants redacted. Counsel can indicate those, what messages they are. We'll be happy to redact them before the actual exhibit is turned over to the, um, the jury. Thank you. I think that um, it was uh, based on uh, messages that were already excluded via previous motions. And and I don't recall any specific me messages previously was, excluded by this court from Exhibit 423. Hey, it would be hard for me to compare this right now to my to my orders. Right, because that's why if counsel is requesting for it to be redacted, I just ask counsel to tell us what to be redacted so we can do it. Okay. I, Your Honor, then I just I need them to send me this proposed exhibit. You have it. You already have it. 423. Yep. You had it in January of 22. Okay. Wait a second. Wait, do you guys want to? You, someone said they want all the. It's you, the Facebook you said messages. They want all the Instagram messages between the defendants and there. That's what Facebook. You said. Facebook. And that's Facebook. Your Honor, that's totally fine. All we have to do is make them compliant with the other orders of the court that have already excluded evidence. Okay, that, that's fine. You yeah, I'll redact it. But I, I, yeah. I'm asking them to give me the original file. Of 423, because I don't have 423, and I will go through and reject it. I'll do it tonight. Judge. Okay, but they you have it. Just, you can't just reject it. They have to. They have to know. Well, what I. The, 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 the truth. The truth should matter. She has 423. It's the entire Facebook message string between Jennifer Crumbly and James Crumbly. It's the thing that she piles up. She has that string. So, I. The core would like we can produce the proof of service first thing Monday morning. No, and I'm I'm not saying I okay, I do have it in the in the evidence. I don't have it. They're talking about it as if they've given me a four twenty three. They 
They haven't. It's, it's buried in the stacks of evidence. Okay. That's fine. I'll dig it out. I will go through it tonight. I will let them know what I want redacted. Okay. All I want is yet. redaction. We provided a digital copy. It's a thumb drive. I don't understand. There's a thumb drive that has 420. Yeah. Yes, they handed it to me today while we've been in court for eight hours. Okay. So, okay. Okay. But you're the one who asked for it to be admitted, right? You're the one who asked for it to be admitted, So, which I'm happy to do if everybody agrees. So, all right. Wait, we have just a couple more things here. Uh-oh, here comes the cavalry. What else? Just one one thing I think is important. I asked this court to instruct counsel to show the appropriate decorum in this particular case. The jokes indicating I'm going to kill myself in a joking manner. I'm drinking the, five the bottles, bottles of wine. wine. It's just we there have, are parents who had point. their children that's murdered in this in this courtroom, and we are the people who I, communicate I, with them after we leave I here. I said something about wine because I was looking at her exhibit and it was teetering, and I was trying to nicely suggest that I would like you But making a joke about killing yourself in this courtroom at this time, I understand I'm I sure didn't it mean it like that. I'm sorry. Okay. I am so sorry. I did she not mean it like that. Stop that. that I, I, don't I did want not be mean it like that. And they know I didn't mean it like that. Okay. We, we're, we're responding to literally just sitting here, the amount of messages we get from victims in the community. And I just think just to be at a, a abundance of of respect and caution, if we could just not say things like that, I'm you not are, I'm not accusing anyone of any malice or any bad intent. I'm just asking that we just not engage in that because this is hard enough for the people who are sitting here now and who will be sitting here next week. I understand. It's very hard. Your Honor, I am not joking around about anything. Okay, I think it was a slip of the tongue. It was a slip of the tongue. All right. Um, emotions are, are running high. Um, I, but we also, a lot of people are, are, are saying you can be sort of a shooter. But, but Your Honor, I do want to make a point. I, I'm not making an objection because I, I'm, my emotions are running high. In fact, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not having an emotional response here. I am simply asking that we be respectful to victims. That's it. Your Honor, I am being respectful. So to be that is implying I'm being disrespectful. Me saying I'm going, I'm going to kill myself. I didn't mean in any way to offend. I know you didn't. These families. I know you didn't. It was a slip on the tongue. She's just, she's just. It was absolutely not related to them. I know. This shooting is awful. It's the prosecution that's parading all of this up here and putting the parading. The this. shooting is the result of the defendant's gross negligence. That is the case. Okay. They are the ones putting the okay. everybody re seeing all of this over and over and over. Oh, over, and over. Whoa. So, Everybody needs to go home. Everybody needs to go home. That, All right? I understand, right. but we're, we're not putting victims through anything. That, and I, I'm sorry, but that just because everybody's disagreeing doesn't mean everyone is inappropriate. We, we aren't putting victims through everything. We're prosecuting our case, okay. and we're trying to do it in and the most she, efficient way possible. she's defending her case, I, I, I think that was a slip of the tongue. Everybody needs to take a deep breath and go home. Everybody go home. I'm going home. All right. Thank you.